The Ambulance Made Two Trips by Murray Leinster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ambulance Made Two Trips by Murray Leinster. Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald found a package before his door that morning, along with the milk. He took it inside and opened it. It was a remarkably fine meerschaum pipe, such as the sergeant had longed irrationally to own for many years. There was no message with it, nor any card. He swore bitterly. On his way to headquarters, he stopped in at the orphanage where he usually left such gifts. On other occasions, he had left scotch, a fly rod, sets of very expensive dry flies, and dozens of pairs of silk socks. The female head of the orphanage accepted the gift with gratitude. I don't suppose, said Fitzgerald morbidly, that any of your kids will smoke this pipe, but I want to be rid of it for somebody to know. He paused. Are you getting many other gifts on this order? From other cops, like you used to? The head of the orphanage admitted that the total had dropped off. Fitzgerald went on his way, brooding. He'd been getting anonymous gifts like this ever since Big Jake Connors moved into town with bright ideas. Big Jake denied that he was the generous party. He expressed complete ignorance. But Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald knew better. The gifts were having their effect upon the force. There was a police lieutenant whose wife had received a mink stole out of thin air and didn't speak to her husband for ten days when he gave it to the community drive. He wouldn't do a thing like that again. There was another sergeant, not Fitzgerald, who'd found a set of four new white wild tires on his doorstep and was ostracized by his teenage offspring when he turned them into the police lost and found. Fitzgerald gave his gifts to an orphanage with a fine disregard for their inappropriateness, but he gloomily suspected that a great many of his friends were weakening. The presents were bribes. Big Jake not only didn't ask acknowledgments of them, he denied that he was a giver, but inevitably the recipients of bounty with the morning milk felt less indignation about what Big Jake was doing and wasn't getting caught at. At headquarters, Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald found a memo. A memo was routine, but the contents of this one were remarkable. He scowled at it. He made phone calls, checking up on the more unlikely parts of it. Then he went to make the regular investigation. When he reached his destination, he found it an unpretentious frame building with a sign outside, Elite Cleaners and Dyers. There were no plate glass windows. There was nothing show-off about it. It was just a medium-sized, modestly up-to-date establishment to which leather tailoring shops would send work for wholesale treatment. From some place in the back, puffs of steam shot out at irregular intervals. Somebody worked a steam presser on garments of one sort or another. There was a rumbling hum as of an oversized washing machine in operation. All seemed tranquil. The detective went in the door. Inside, there was that peculiar professional cleaning fluid Which is not smell. as alarming as gasoline or carbon tetrachloride, but nevertheless discourages the idea of striking a match. In the outer office, a man wrote placidly on one blue paper strip after another. He had an air of pleasant self-confidence. He glanced up briefly, nodded, wrote on three more blue paper strips, and then gathered them all up and put them in a particular place. He turned to Fitzgerald. Well? Fitzgerald showed his shield. The man behind the counter nodded again. My name's Fitzgerald, grunted the detective, the boss. Me, said the man behind the counter. He was cordial. My name's Brink. You got something to talk to me about? That's the idea, said Fitzgerald. A couple of questions. Brink jerked a thumb toward the door. Come in the other office. Chair's there and we can sit down. What's the trouble? A complaint of some kind? He ushered Fitzgerald in before him. The detective found himself scowling. He'd have felt better with a different kind of man to ask questions of. This Brink looked untroubled and confident. It didn't fit the situation. The inner office looked equally matter-of-fact. No. There was the shelf with the usual books of reference on textiles and such items as a cleaner and dyer might need to have on hand, but there were some others. Basic principles of psi, modern psychokinetic theories. There was a small, mostly plastic machine on another shelf. It had no obvious function. It looked as if it had some unguessable but rarely used purpose. There was dust on it. What's the complaint? repeated Brink. Hmm. A cigar? No, said Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald. I'll light my pipe. He did, extracting tobacco on a pipe that was by no means a meerschaum from his pocket. He puffed and said, A guy who worked for you caught himself on fire this morning. It happened on a bus. Very peculiar. The guy's name was Jacaro. Brink did not look surprised. 
What happened? It's a strange kind of thing, said Fitzgerald. According to the report, he was riding the bus, reading his paper, when all of a sudden he yells and jumps up. His pants are on fire. He gets them off fast and chucks them out the bus window. He's blistered some, but not serious, and he clams up, but good, when the ambulance doc puts salve on him. He won't say a word about what happened or how. They had to call an ambulance because he couldn't go hunting a dock with no pants on. But he's not burned badly, asked Brink. No. Blisters, yes. Scared, yes. And mad as hell. But he'll get along. It's too bad. We pinched him three times on suspicion of arson, but we couldn't make it stick. Something ought to happen to make that guy stop playing with matches. Only this wasn't matches. I'm glad he's only a little bit scorched, said Brink, he considered. Did he say anything about his eyelids twitching this morning? I don't suppose he would. The detective stared. He didn't. Say, aren't you curious about how he came to catch on fire, or what his pants smelled of that burned so urgent, or where he expected burning to start instead of his pants? Brink thought it over, then he shook his head. No, I don't think I'm curious. The detective looked at him long and hard. Okay, he said dourly. But there's something else. Day before yesterday, there was a car accident opposite here, remember? I wasn't here at the time, said Brink. There's a car rolling along the street outside, said the detective. There's some hoods in it, guys who do dirty work for Big J Connors. I can't prove a thing, but it looks like they had ideas about this place. About 30 yards up the street, a sawed-off shotgun goes off, very peculiar. It sends a load of buckshot through a side window of your place. Brink said with an air of surprise, Oh, that must have been what broke the window. Yeah, said Fitzgerald. But the interesting thing is that the flash of the shotgun burned all the hair off the head of the guy that was doing the driving. It didn't scratch him, just scorched his hair off. It scared him silly. Brink grinned faintly, but he said pleasantly, <coughs> He jams down the accelerator and rams a telephone pole, pursued Fitzgerald. There's four hoods in that car, remember, and every one of them's got a police record you could paper a house with, and they've got four sawed-off shotguns and a tommy gun in the back seat. They're all laid out cold when the cops arrive. I was wondering about the window, said Brink pensively. It puzzles you, eh? demanded the detective ironically. Could you have figured it out that they were going to shoot up your plant to scare the people who work for you so they'll quit? Did you make a guess that they intended to drive you out of business like they did the guy that had this place before you? That's an interesting theory, said Brink encouragingly. Detective Fitzgerald nodded. There's one thing more, he said formidably. You got a delivery truck. You keep it in a garage back yonder. Yesterday, you sent it to a garage for inspection of brakes and lights and such. Yes, said Brink. I did. It's not back yet. They were busy. They'll call me when it's ready. Fitzgerald snorted. They'll call you when the bomb squad gets through checking it. When the guys at the garage lifted the hood, they started running. They hollered copper. There was a bomb in there. Brink seemed to try to look surprised. He only looked interested. Two sticks of dynamite, the detective told him grimly. Wired up to go off when your driver turned on the ignition. He did, but it didn't. But we got a police force in this town. We know there's racketeering being practiced. We know there's crooked stuff going on. We even got mighty good ideas who's doing it. But we ain't been able to get anything on anybody. Not yet. Nobody's been willing to talk so far. But you? The telephone rang stridently. Brink looked at the instrument and shrugged. He answered, Hello? No, Mr. Jacaro isn't in today. He didn't come to work. On the way downtown, his pants caught on fire. Fitzgerald guessed that the voice at the other end of the line said, What? in an explosive manner. Brink said matter-of-factly, I said his pants caught on fire. It was probably something he was bringing here to burn down the plant with. A firebomb. I don't think he's to blame that it went off early. He probably started out with the worst possible intentions, but something happened. He listened and said, But he didn't check it. He couldn't come to work and plant a firebomb to set fire to the place. I know it must be upsetting to have things like that automobile accident and my truck not blowing up, and now Jakaro's pants instead of my business going up in flames, but I told you. He stopped and listened. Once he grinned. Wait, he said after a moment. He covered the transmitter and turned to Fitzgerald. What hospital is Jakaro in? Fitzgerald said sourly. He wasn't burned bad, just blistered. They lent him some pants and he went home cussing. Thanks, said Brink. He uncovered the transmitter. He went home, he told the instrument. You can ask him about it. In a way, I'm sure it wasn't his fault. I'm quite sure his eyelids twitched when he started out. I think the men who drove the car the other day had twitching eyelids, too. 
You should ask... The detective heard muted noises, as if a man shouted into a transmitter somewhere. Brink said briskly, No, I don't see any reason to change my mind. No. I know it was luck, if you want to put it that way, but no. I wouldn't advise that. Please take my advice about when your eyelid twitches. Fitzgerald heard the crash of the receiver hung up at some distant place. Brink rubbed his ear. He turned back. Hmm, he said. Your pipe's gone out. It was. Sergeant Fitzgerald puffed ineffectually. Brink reached out his finger and tapped the bowl of the detective's pipe. Instantly, fragrant smoke filled the detective's mouth. He sputtered. Now, where were we? asked Brink. Who was that? demanded Fitzgerald ferociously. That was Big Jake Connors. You may be right, Brink told him. He's never exactly given me his name. He just calls up every so often and talks nonsense. What sort of nonsense? He wants to be a partner in this business, said Brink without emotion. He's been saying that things will happen to it otherwise. I don't believe it. Anyhow, nothing's happened so far. Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald tried at one and the same time to roar and to swallow. He accomplished neither. He put his finger in the bowl of his pipe. He jerked it out, scorched. Look, he said almost hoarsely. I was telling you when the phone rang. We got a police force here in town. This is what we've been trying to get. You come along with me to headquarters and swear to a complaint. Brink said interestedly. Why? That guy, Big J. Connors, raged the detective. That's why. Trying to threaten you into giving him a share in your business. Trying to burn it down or blow it up when you won't. He was just a small town crook once. He went to the big town and came back with ideas. He's using them. Brink looked at him expectantly. He started a beer business, said the detective bitterly. Simultaneous other beer dealers started having trouble. Empty kegs smashed, trucks broke down, drivers in fights. They had to go out of business. What did the cops do? asked Brink. They listened to their wives, snarled Fitzgerald. They began to find little grab bag packages in the mail and with the milk. Fancy perfume, tricky stockings, fancy underwear they should have been ashamed for anybody to know they had it on underneath. The cops weren't bribed, but their wives liked opening the door of a morning and finding charming little surprises. Ah, said Brink. Then there were jukeboxes, went on the detective. He went in that business, and trouble started. People drive up to a beer joint, go in, get in a stuffle, and bingo, the jukebox smashed. Always the jukebox. Always an out-of-town customer. Half the jukeboxes in town weren't working on an average, but the ones that were working were always big jakes. Presently, he had the jukebox business to himself. Brink nodded, somehow appreciatively. Then it was cab, said Fitzgerald. A lot of cops felt bad about that, but their wives wouldn't be happy if anything happened to dear Mr. Big Jake, who denied that he gave anybody anything, so it was all right to use that lovely perfume. Cabs got holes in their radiators. They got sand in their oil systems. They had blowouts and leaks and brake fluid lines. Cops' wives were afraid Big Jake would get caught, but he didn't. He started insuring cabs against that kind of incident. Now every cab driver pays protection money for what they call insurance, or else and cops' wives get up early, bright-eyed, to see what Santa Claus left with the milk. You seem, said Brink with a grin, to hint that this Big Jake is, well, dishonest. Dishonest? Fitzgerald's face was purplish from many memories of wrongs. There was a guy named Burdock who owned this business before you. You know what happened to him? Yes, said Brink. He's my brother-in-law. Connors or somebody insisted on having a share of the business and threatened dreadful things if he didn't. He didn't. So acid got spilled on clothes. Machinery got smashed. Once a whole delivery truck load of clothes disappeared, and my brother-in-law had to pay for any number of suits and dresses. It got him down. He's recovering from the nervous strain now, and my sister uh, asked me to help out. So I offered to take over. He warned me I'd have the same trouble. And you've got it, fumed the detective. But anyhow, you'll make a complaint. We'll get out some warrants and we'll have something to go on. But nothing's happened to complain about, said Brink, quite reasonably. One broken window's not worth a fuss. But something's going to happen, insisted the detective. That guy Big Jake is poison. He's taken over the whole town, bit by bit. You've been lucky so far, but your luck could run out. Brink shook his head. No, he said matter-of-factly. I'm grateful to you, Mr. Fitzgerald, but I have a special kind of luck. I won't tell you about it because you wouldn't believe, but... But I can give you some of it. If you don't mind, I will. He went to the slightly dusty, partly plastic machine. 
On its shelf were some parts of metal, and some of transparent plastic, and some grayish granular substance it was hard to identify. There was an elaborate diagram of something like an electronic circuit inside, but it might have been a molecular diagram from organic chemistry. Brink made an adjustment and pressed firmly on a special part of the machine, which did not yield at all. Then he took a slip of plastic out of a slot in the bottom. You can call this a good luck charm, he said pleasantly, or a talisman. Actually, it's a psionic unit. One like it works very well for me. Anyhow, there's no harm in it. Just one thing. If your eyelids start to twitch, you'll be headed for danger or trouble or something unpleasant. So if they do twitch, stop and be very, very careful, please. He handed the bit of plastic to Fitzgerald, who took it without conscious volition. Then Brink said briskly, If there isn't anything else... You won't swear out a warrant against Big Jake? demanded Fitzgerald bitterly. I haven't any reason to, said Brink amiably. I'm doing all right. He hasn't harmed me. I don't think he will. Okay, said the detective bitterly. Have it your way. But he's got it in for you, and he's going to keep trying until he gets you. And whether you like it or not, you're going to have some police protection as soon as I can set it up. He stamped out of the cleaning and drying plant. Automatically, he put the bit of plastic in his pocket. He didn't know why. He got into his car and drove downtown. As he drove, he looked suspiciously at his pipe. He fumed. As he fumed, he swore. He did not like mysteries. But there was no mystery about his dislike for Big Jake Connors. He turned aside from the direct route to headquarters to indulge it. He drove to a hospital where four out-of-town hoods had been carried two days before. He marched inside and up to a second-floor corridor door with a uniformed policeman seated outside it. Hmm. Donnelly, he growled. How about those guys? Not so good, said the patrolman. They're getting better. They would, growled Fitzgerald. Lawyer's been to see him twice, said the patrolman. He's coming back after lunch. He would, grunted the detective. They went out, said the cop. I'm not surprised, said Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald. He went into the sick room. There were four patients in it, none of them looking exactly like gentle invalids. There were two broken noses of long-ago dates, three cauliflower ears, and one scar of a kind that is not the result of playing lawn tennis. Two were visibly bandaged, and the others adhesive-taped. All of them looked at Fitzgerald without cordiality. Well, 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 he said. You fellows still here? There was silence. In union, there is strength, said Fitzgerald. As long as you stay in one room, everybody's sure the others haven't started ratting, right? One of the four snarled silently at him. It was just an accident, pursued the detective. You four guys were riding along peaceful, merrily taking the air, when quite inadvertently, one of you almost blows the head off of another, and he's so astonished at there being a gun in the car that he wrecks it. And when they get you guys in the hospital, there ain't one of you who knows anything about four sawed-off shotguns and a Tommy gun in the car with you. Strange, strange, strange. Four faces regarded him with impassive dislike. The bandaged ones were prettier than the ones that weren't. That Tommy gun business, explained Fitzgerald, is a federal affair. It's against fed law to carry him around loaded, and your friend Big Jake hasn't been leaving presents on the White House steps. You know, you guys could be in trouble. Three pairs of eyes and an odd one, the other was hidden under a bandage, stared at him stonily. You see, explained Fitzgerald again, Big Jake slipped up. He hasn't realized it yet. It's my little secret. A week ago I thought he had me licked, but something's happened, and today I felt like I had to come around and congratulate you fellas. You got a break. You're going to have free board and lodging for years to come. I wanted to be the first to tell you. He beamed at them and went out. Outside his expression changed. He said bitterly to the cop at the door, I bet they beat this rap. He went downstairs and out of the hospital. He started around the building to his car. His eyelid twitched. It twitched again. It began to quiver and flutter continuously. Fitzgerald stopped short to rub the offending eye. There was a crash. A heavy glass water pitcher hit the cement walk immediately before him. It broke into a million pieces. He glared up. The pitcher would have hit him if it hadn't been for a twitching eyelid that had brought him to a stop. The window of the room he'd just left was open, but there was no way to prove that a patient had gotten out of bed to heave the pitcher, and it had broken into too many pieces to offer fingerprint evidence. Ha! <sighs> said Fitzgerald morosely. They're plenty confident. He went to headquarters. There were more memos for his attention. One was just in. A cab had crossed a sidewalk and crashed into a plate glass window. Its hydraulic brakes had failed. 
The trouble was a clean saw cut in a pressure line. Fitzgerald went to find out about it. The cab driver bitterly refused to answer any questions. He wouldn't even admit that he was not insured by Big Jake against such accidents. Fitzgerald stormed. The owner-driver firmly, and gloomily, refused to answer a question about whether he'd been threatened if he didn't pay protection money. Fitzgerald reached on the sidewalk beside the cab in the act of being extracted from the plate glass window. An open-mouthed bystander listened admiringly to his language. Then the detective's eyelid twitched. It twitched again violently. Something made him look up. An employee of the plate glass company, there were rumors that Big Jake was interesting himself in plate glass insurance besides cabs, wrenched loose a certain spot. Fitzgerald grabbed the bystander and leaped. There was a musical crash behind him. A tall section of the shattered glass fell exactly where he had been standing. It could have been pure accident. On the other hand, he couldn't prove anything, but he had a queer feeling as he left the scene of the crash. Back in his own car, he felt chilly. Driving away, presently, he felt his eyelid tentatively. He wasn't a nervous man. Ordinarily, his eyelids didn't twitch. He went to investigate a second memo. It was a restaurant, and he edged the police car gingerly into a lane beside the building. In the rear, the odor of spilled beer filled the air. It would have been attractive but for an admixture of gasoline fumes and the fact that it was mud. Mud, whose moisture content is spilled beer, has a peculiar smell all its own. He got out of his car and gloomily asked the questions the memo called for. He didn't need to. He could have written down all the answers in advance. The restaurant now reporting vandalism had found Big Jake's brand of beer unpopular. It had 20 cases of superior brew brought in by motor truck. It was stacked in a small building behind the cafe. For one happy evening, the customers chose their own beer. Now, next day, there were 18 cases of smashed beer bottles. The crime had been committed in the small hours. There were no clues. The restaurant proprietor unconvincingly declared that he had no idea who caused it. He'd only notified the police so he could collect insurance, not from Big Jake. With a sort of morbid, frustrated gloom, Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald made the necessary notes. He put his notebook in his pocket and backed his car out of the alley. Oddly enough, he thought of a beautifully carved meerschaum pipe he'd found with the milk that morning. He presented it to an orphanage mainly because, irrationally, he'd have liked to keep it. There had been other expensive gifts he'd have liked to keep. Bourbon, a set of expensive dry flies, an 8mm movie camera, scotch, shiny, smooth silk socks that would have soothed his weary feet. He denied himself these gifts because he believed, he knew, that they came from Big Jake, who tactfully won friends and influenced people by making presents and denying it. In business matters he was stern, because that was the way to collect protection money, but he was subtle with cops. He had their wives on his side. Sergeant Fitzgerald growled in his throat. He'd always wanted a really fine meerschaum pipe. He'd had one this morning, and he had to get rid of it because it came from Big Jake. He felt that Big Jake had robbed him of it. He turned the police car and drove back toward the elite cleaners and dyers establishment. As he drove, he growled. His eyelid had twitched twice, and each time he'd been heading into danger or trouble. The fact was dauntingly coincidental with Brink's comment after giving him a scrap of plastic from the bottom of that crazy machine. These things were on his mind. He couldn't bring himself to plan to mention them, but he needed to talk to Brink again. Brink could testify to threats. He could justify arrests. Sergeant Fitzgerald had a fine conviction that with a chance to apply pressure, he could make some of Big Jake's hoods and collectors talk, and so bust things wide open. He only needed Brink's cooperation. He drove toward the elite cleaners and dyers to put pressure on Brink toward that happy end. But he brooded over his own eyebrow twitchings. When the cleaning establishment came into view, there was a car parked before it. Two men from that car were in the act of entering the elite plant through the same door the detective had used earlier. He parked his car behind the other. Fuming, he crossed the sidewalk and entered the building. As he entered, he heard a scream from the back. He heard a crashing sound and more screams. He bolted ahead, through the outer office and into the working area he had not visited before. He burst through swinging doors into a two-story, machinery-filled cleaning and dyeing plant. Tables and garment racks and five separate people appeared as proper occupants of the place, but something had happened. There was a flood of liquid, detergent solution, flowing toward the open back doors of the big room. It obviously came from a large carboy, which had been smashed as if to draw attention to some urgent matter. The people in the room seemed to have frozen at their work, except that Brink had apparently been interrupted in some supervisory task. He was not working in any machine to clean, dry, or press clothing. He looked at the two individuals whom Fitzgerald had seen enter only fractions of a minute earlier. 
His jaw clenched, and Fitzgerald was close enough behind the bottle breakers to see him take an angry, purposeful step toward them. Then he checked himself very deliberately, and put his hands in his pockets, and watched. After an instant, he even grinned at the two figures who had preceded the detective. They were an impressive pair. They were dressed in well-pressed garments of extravagantly fashionable cut. They wore expensive soft hats, tilted to jaunty angles. Even from the rear, Fitzgerald knew that handkerchiefs would show tastefully in the breast pockets of their coats. Their shoes had been polished until they not only shone, but glittered. But by professional instinct, Fitzgerald noted one cauliflower ear, and the barest fraction of a second later, he saw a squat revolver being waved negligently at the screaming women. He reached for his service revolver, and things happened. The situation was crystal clear. Big Jake Connors was displeased with Brink. In all the cities whose rackets he was developing and consolidating, Brink was the only man who resisted Big Jake's civic enterprise and got away with it. And nobody who runs rackets can permit resistance. It is contagious. So Big Jake had ordered that Brink be brought into line, or else. The or else alternative had run into snags before, but it was being given a big, new try. There was the shrill, high clamor of two women screaming at the tops of their voices because revolvers were waved at them. One elite employee at the pressing machine took his foot off the treadle and steam billowed wildly. Another man at a giant sheet iron box which rumbled stared with his mouth open and blood draining from his cheeks. Brink alone looked, quite impossibly, amused and satisfied. Get outside! snarled a voice as Fitzgerald revolver came out ready for action. This joint's finished! The companion of the snarling man rubbed suddenly at his eye. He rubbed it again as if it twitched violently. But it was, after all, only a twitching eyelid. He reached negligently down and picked up a wooden box. By its markings, it was a dozen bottle box of spot remover, the stuff used to get out spots the standard cleaning fluid in the dry cleaning machine did not remove. The man heaved the box with the hand with which he had rubbed his twitching eye. The other man raised a hand, the one not holding a revolver, to rub at his own eye, which also seemed to twitch agitatedly. Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald had his revolver out. He drew in his breath for a stentorian command for them to drop their weapons, but he didn't have time to shout. The hurling small box of spot remover struck the large sheet iron case from which loud rumblings came. It was a dryer, a device for spinning clothes which were wet with liquid from the dry cleaning washer. A perforated drum revolved at high speed within it. The box of spot remover hit the door. The door, dented in, hit the high speed drum inside and flew frantically out again, free from its hinges and turning end for end as it flew. It slammed into the thrower's companion, spraining three fingers as it knocked his revolver to the floor. The weapon slid merrily away to the outer office between Detective Fitzgerald's feet, but this was not all. The dryer door, having disposed of one threatening revolver, slammed violently against the wall. The wall was merely a thin partition, neatly paneled on the office side, but with shelves containing cleaning and dyeing supplies on the other. The impact shook the partition. Dust fell from the shelves and supplies. The hood, who hadn't lost his gun, sneezed so violently that his hat came off. He bent nearly double, and in the act he jarred the partition again. Things fell from it. Many things. A two-gallon jar of extra special detergent used only for laces conked him and smashed on the floor before him. It added to the stream of fluid already flowing with singular directness for the open, double back door of the workroom. The hood staggered, sneezed again, and convulsively pulled the trigger of his gun. The bullet hit something which was solid heavy metal, ricocheted, ricocheted again, and the second hood howled and leaped wildly into the air. He came down in the flowing flood of spilled detergent, flat on his stomach, and with marked forward momentum. He slid. The floor of the plant had recently been oiled to keep down dust. The coefficient of friction of a really good detergent on top of floor oil is remarkably low, somewhere around the point .009. Hood number two slid magnificently on his belly on the superb lubrication afforded by a detergent on top of floor oil. The first hood staggered. Something else fell from the shelf. It was a carton of electric light bulbs. Despite the protecting carton, they went off with cracklings like gunfire. Technically, they did not explode, but implode. But the hood with the revolver did not notice the difference. He leaped and also landed in the middle of the wide streak of detergent over oil, which might have been arranged to receive him. He remained erect, but he slid slowly along the shining path. His relatively low speed was not his fault because he went through all the motions of frenzied flight. His legs twinkled as he ran, but his feet slid backward. He moved with a sort of dignified celerity, running fast enough for ten times the speed upon a surface which had a frictional coefficient far below that of the smoothest possible ice. D. 
Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald gaped. His mouth dropped open and his gun held laxly in a practically nerveless hand. The thing developed splendidly. The prone gunman slid out of the wide double door, pushing a bow wave of detergent before him. He slid across the cement just outside into the open garage whose delivery truck was absent and slammed with a sort of deliberate violence into a stack of four cardboard drums of that bone black which is used to filter cleaning fluid so that it can be used over again in the dry cleaning machine. The garage was used for storage as well as shelter for the establishment's truck. The four drums were not accurately piled. They were three and a half feet high and two feet in diameter. They toppled sedately, falling with a fine precision upon the now hatless, running, sliding hood. One of them burst upon him. A second burst upon the prone man, who had butted through the cardboard at the bottom one on his arrival. There was a dense black cloud which filled all the interior of the garage. It was bone black, which cannot be told from lint black or soot by the uninitiated. From the cloud came a despairing revolver shot. It was a pure reflex action by a man who had been whammed over the head by a 150-pound drum of yielding, in fact, bursting material. There was a metallic clang, then silence. In a very little while, the dust cloud cleared. One figure struggled insanely. Upon him descended, from an oil drum of cylinder oil stored above the rafters, a tranquil, glistening rod of opalescent cylinder oil. His last bullet had punctured the drum. Oil turned the bone black upon him into a thick, sticky goo, which instantly gathered more bone black to become thicker, stickier, and gooier. He fought it, while his unconscious companion lay with his head in a crumpled cardboard container of more black stuff. The despairing, struggling hood managed to get off one more shot, as if defying even fate and chance. This bullet likewise found a target. It burst a container of powdered dye stuff, also stored overhead. The container practically exploded, and its contents descended in a widespread shower which coated all the interior of the garage with a lovely layer of bright heliotrope. Maybe the struggling hood saw it. If so, it broke him utterly. What had happened was starkly impossible. The only sane explanation was that he had died and was in hell. He accepted that explanation and broke into sobs. Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald had witnessed every instant of the happening, but he did not believe it. Nevertheless, he said in a strange voice, I'll phone for the paddy wagon. It'll do for ambulance in case of need. He put away his unused service revolver, thinking strange dizzy thoughts of twitching eyelids and plastic scraps and starkly incredible happenings, he managed to call for the police patrol. When he hung up, he gazed blankly at the wall. He gazed, in fact, at a spot where a peculiar small machine with no visible function reposed, somewhat dusty, on a shelf. Brink stepped over briskly and closed the door between the scene of catastrophe and the immaculate shop. Somehow, none of the mess had spilled back through the doorway. Then he came in, frowning a little. The fight's out of them, he said cheerfully. One got a bad cut on his head, the other completely unnerved. I hate to have such things happen. Sergeant Fitzgerald shook himself as if trying to come back to a normal and reasonable world. Look, he said in a hoarse voice, I saw it, and I still don't believe it. Things like this don't happen. I thought you might be lucky. It, it ain't that. I thought I might be crazy. It ain't that. What's been going on? Brink sat down. His air was one of wry contemplation. I told you I had a special kind of luck you couldn't believe. Did your eyelids twitch any time today? Fitzgerald swallowed. They did. And I stopped short and something that should have knocked my cranium down my windpipe missed me by inches. And again, but no matter. Yes. Maybe you can believe it, then, said Brink. Did you ever hear of a man named Hieronymus? No, said Fitzgerald in a numb voice. Who's he? He got a patent once, said Brink, matter-of-factly, on a machine he believed detected something he called eloptic radiation. He thought it was a kind of radiation nobody had noticed before. He was wrong. It worked by something called psi. Sergeant Fitzgerald shook his head. It still needed clearing. Psi isn't fully understood, explained Brink, but it will do a lot of things. For instance, it can change a probability as magnetism can change temperature. You can establish a psi field in a suitable material, just as you can establish a magnetic field in steel or alnico. Now, if you spin a copper disk in a magnetic field, you get eddy currents. Keep it up, and the disk gets hot. If you're obstinate about it, you can melt the copper. It isn't the magnet as such that does the melting. It's the energy of the spinning disk that is changed into heat. The magnetic field simply sets up the conditions for the change of motion into heat. In the same way, am I boring you? Confusing me, 
said Fitzgerald. Maybe, but keep on. Maybe I'll catch a glimmer presently. In the same way, said Brink, you can try to perform violent actions in a strong psi field, a field made especially to act on violence. When you first try it, you get something like eddy currents, warnings. It can be arranged that such psi eddy currents make your eyelids twitch. Keep it up and probability changes to shift the most likely consequences of the violence. This is like a spinning copper disc getting hot. Then, if you're obstinate about it, you get the equivalent of the copper disc melting. Probability gets so drastically changed that the violent thing you're trying to do becomes something that can't happen. Hmm. You can't spin a copper disc in a magnetic field when it melts. You can't commit murder in a certain kind of psi field when probability goes hog wild. Any other thing can happen to anybody else, to you for example, but no violence can happen to the thing or person you're trying to do something violent to. The psi field has melted down ordinary probabilities. The violence you intend has become the most improbable of all conceivable things. You see? I'm beginning, said Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald dizzily, I'm beginning to get a toehold on what you mean. I'd hate to have to testify about it in court, but I'm receptive. So my special kind of luck, said Brink, comes from anti-violence psi fields, set up in psi units of suitable material. They don't use up energy any more than a magnet does, but they transfer it like a magnet does. My brother-in-law thought he had to lose his business because Big Jake threatened violent things. I offered to take it over and protect it, with psi units. So far I have. When four hoods intended to shoot up the place and moved to do it, they were warned. Psi eddy currents made their eyelids twitched. They went ahead. Probability changed. Quite unlikely things became more likely than not. They were obstinate about it, and what they intended became perhaps the only thing in the world that simply couldn't happen. So they crashed into a telephone pole. That wasn't violence. That was accident. The detective blinked, then nodded, somehow painfully. I see, he said uncertainly. Somebody set a bomb in my delivery truck, added Brink. I'm sure his eyelids twitched, but he didn't stop, so probability changed. The explosion of that bomb in my truck became the most unlikely of all possible things. In fact, it became impossible. So some electric connection went bad, and it didn't go off. Again, when Jakaro intended to plant a time fire bomb to set the plant on fire, why, his eyelids must have twitched, but he didn't give up the intention, so the psi unit naturally made the burning of the plant impossible. For it to be impossible, the fire bomb had to go off where it would do next to no harm. Jakaro lost his pants. He stopped. Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald swallowed carefully. I don't question it, he said dizzily, even if I don't believe it. Will you now tell me what just happened was a psi something keeping violent things from happening? That's it, agreed Brink. The psi you didn't made the dryer door fly off and knock a pistol out of a man's hand. If they dropped the idea of violence, that would have ended the matter. They didn't. I accept it said Fitzgerald, he gulped, because I saw it. A court wouldn't believe it, though, Mr. Brink. Well, I've been trying for months, said Fitzgerald in sudden desperation, to find a way to stop what Big Jake's doing. But he's tricky. He's organized. He's got smart lawyers. Mr. Brink, if the cops could use what you've got, then he stopped. It'd never be authorized, he said bitterly. They'd never let a cop try it. Now, agreed Brink, until it's believed in, it can only be used privately for private purposes, like I've used it. Or, hmm, do you fish or bowl or play golf, Sergeant? I could give you a psi unit that'd help you quite a bit in such a private purpose. Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald shook his head. Dry fly fishing's my specialty, he said bitterly, but no thank you. When I'm pitting myself against a trout, it's my private purpose to be a better fisherman than he's a fish. Using what you've got would be like dynamite in a stream. No sport in that. No. This big Jake, he doesn't act sporting with the public. I'd give a lot to stop him. You get no credit for it, said Brink. No credit at all. I'd get the job done, said Fitzgerald indignantly. A man likes credit, but he likes a lot better to get a good job done. Brink grinned suddenly. Good man, he said approvingly. I'll buy your idea, Sergeant. If you'll play fair with a trout, you'll play fair with a crook, and an Irishman, anyhow, has a sort of inheritance. I'll give you what help I can, and you'll do things your grandfather would swear was the work of the little people. And for a first lesson, what? Big Jake discourages me, said Brink, so I'll call him up and say I'm coming to see him. I'll say if he wants this business, I'll sell it to him at a fair price. But I'll say otherwise I'll tell the newspapers about his threats and the four of his hoods in the hospital and the two others on the way there. Want to come along? Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald reached his hand to where his service revolver reposed in its holster. Then he drew it away. He's a very violent man, he said hopefully. 
I wouldn't wonder he tried to get pretty rough, him and the characters he has on his payroll. If they have to be stopped from being violent by, what is it, psi units? Sure, I'll come along. It ought to be most edifying to watch. There was a clanging outside. Brink and Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald delayed while two unnerved, helpless, and formerly immaculate gunmen were loaded into the paddy wagon and carried away, to the hospital that already held four of their ilk. Then Brink called Big Jake on the telephone. Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald listened with increasing appreciation as Brink made his proposition and explained matter-of-factly what had happened to Big Jake's minions who should have wrecked the elite cleaners and dyers. When Brink hung up, Fitzgerald had a look of zestful anticipation on his face. He said to come right over, said Brink but he was grinding his teeth. Ah, said Fitzgerald pleasurably. I'm thinking of the cab drivers and truck drivers that have been beat up. I'm thinking of the property smashed and honest people scared. Do you know, I'm terrible afraid Big Jake's too much in the habit of violence to stop, even if his eyelids twitch. It's deplorable. But on strictly personal basis, I think I'll enjoy seeing Big Jake and his hoods discouraged by, what is it, psi units? Yes. And he did. Big Jake's eyelids undoubtedly did twitch while he was preparing a reception for Brink and Detective Sergeant Fitzgerald, but he did not heed the warning. He did not even think of the legal aspect of violent things attempted against his visitors, so he tried violence, he and his associates. They started out with fists and clubs, regardless of discretion. They tried to beat up Brink and Fitzgerald. From that they went on to sawed off shotguns. Their efforts were still unsuccessful. Then they went to extremes. Fitzgerald wore an expression of pious joy as Big Jake Connors and his aides, obstinately attempting violent actions, were prevented by psi units. When it was all over, the ambulance had to make two trips. End of The Ambulance Made Two Trips by Murray Leinster The Blind Man's World by Edward Bellamy 1898 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Sames The Blind Man's World by Edward Bellamy The narrative to which this note is introductory was found among the papers of the late Professor S. Erastus Larrabee, and, as an acquaintance of the gentleman to whom they were bequeathed, I was requested to prepare it for publication. This turned out a very easy task, for the document proved of so extraordinary a character that if published at all it should obviously be without change. It appears that the Professor did really at one time in his life have an attack of vertigo, or something of the sort, under circumstances similar to those described by him, and to that extent his narrative may be founded on fact. How soon it shifts from that foundation, or whether it does at all, the reader must conclude for himself. It appears certain that the professor never related to anyone while living the stranger features of the experience here narrated but this might have been merely from fear that his standing as a man of science would be thereby injured. THE PROFESSOR'S NARRATIVE At the time of the experience of which I am about to write, I was Professor of Astronomy and Higher Mathematics at Abercrombie College. Most astronomers have a speciality, and mine was the study of the planet Mars, our nearest neighbour but one in the Sun's little family. When no important celestial phenomena in other quarters demanded attention, it was on the ruddy disk of Mars that my telescope was oftenest focused. I was never weary of tracing the outlines of its continents and seas, its capes and islands, its bays and straits, its lakes and mountains. With intense interest I watched from week to week of the martial winter, the advance of the polar ice cap toward the equator, and its corresponding retreat in the summer testifying across the gulf of space as plainly as written words to the existence on that orb of a climate like our own. A speciality is always in danger of becoming an infatuation, and my interest in Mars at the time of which I write had grown to be more than strictly scientific. The impression of the nearness of this planet, 
heightened by the wonderful distinctness of its geography as seen through a powerful telescope, appeals strongly to the imagination of the astronomer. On fine evenings I used to spend hours not so much critically observing as brooding over its radiant surface, till I could almost persuade myself that I saw the breakers dashing on the bold shore of Kepler land, and heard the muffled thunder of avalanches descending the snow-clad mountains of Mitchell. No earthly landscape had the charm to hold my gaze of that far-off planet, whose oceans to the unpractised eye seemed but darker, and its continents lighter, spots and bands. Astronomers have agreed in declaring that Mars is undoubtedly habitable by beings like ourselves. But, as may be supposed, I was not in a mood to be satisfied with considering it merely habitable. I allowed no sort of question that it was inhabited. What manner of beings these inhabitants might be, I found a fascinating speculation. The variety of types appearing in mankind, even on this small earth, makes it most presumptuous to assume that the denizens of different planets may not be characterized by diversities far profounder. Wherein such diversities, coupled with a general resemblance to man, might consist, whether in the mere physical differences or in different mental laws, in the lack of certain of the great passional motors of men or the possession of quite others, were weird themes of never-failing attractions for my mind. The El Dorado visions with which the virgin mystery of the New World inspired the early Spanish explorers were tame and prosaic compared with the speculations which it was perfectly legitimate to indulge when the problem was the conditions of life on another planet. It was the time of year when Mars is most favorably situated for observation, and, anxious not to lose an hour of the precious season, I had spent the greater part of several successive nights in the observatory. I believed that I had made some original observations as to the trend of the coast of Kepler land between Lagrange Peninsula and Christie Bay, and it was to this spot that my observations were particularly directed. On the fourth night, other work detained me from the observing chair till after midnight. When I had adjusted the instrument and took my first look at Mars, I remember being unable to restrain a cry of admiration. The planet was fairly dazzling. It seemed nearer and larger than I had ever seen it before, and its peculiar ruddiness more striking. In thirty years of observations I recall, in fact, no occasion when the absence of exaltations in our atmosphere has coincided with such cloudlessness in that of Mars as on that night. I could plainly make out the white masses of vapour at the opposite edges of the lighted disk, which are the mists of its dawn and evening. The snowy mass of Mount Hall over against Keplerland stood out with wonderful clearness, and I could unmistakably detect the blue tint of the ocean of De La Rue, which washes its base. A feat of vision often, indeed, accomplished by stargazers, though I had never done it to my complete satisfaction before. I was impressed with the idea that, if I ever made an original discovery in regard to Mars, it would be on that evening, and I believed that I should do it. I trembled with mingled exultation and anxiety, and was obliged to pause to recover my self-control. Finally I placed my eye to the eyepiece and directed my gaze upon the portion of the planet in which I was especially interested. My attention soon became fixed and absorbed much beyond my wont when observing, and that itself implied no ordinary degree of abstraction. To all mental intents and purposes I was on Mars. Every faculty, every susceptibility of sense and intellect, seemed gradually to pass into the eye and become concentrated in the act of gazing. Every atom of nerve and will-power combined in the strain to see a little, and yet a little, and yet a little, clearer, farther, deeper. The next thing I knew I was on the bed that stood in the corner of the observing room, half raised on an elbow and gazing intently at the door. It was broad daylight. Half a dozen men, including several of the professors and a doctor from the village, were around me. Some were trying to make me lie down, others were asking me what I wanted, while the doctor was urging me to drink some whiskey. Mechanically repelling their offices, I pointed to the door and ejaculated, "'President Bixby, coming!' giving expression to the one idea which my dazed mind at that moment contained. And, sure enough, even as I spoke, the door opened, and the venerable head of the college, somewhat blown with climbing the steep stairway, stood on the threshold. 
With a sensation of prodigious relief, I fell back on my pillow. It appeared that I had swooned while in the observing chair the night before, and had been found by the janitor in the morning, my head fallen forward on the telescope as if still observing, but my body cold, rigid, pulseless, and apparently dead. In a couple of days I was all right again, and should have forgotten the episode, but for a very interesting conjecture which suggested itself in connection with it. This was nothing less than that, while I lay in that swoon, I was in a conscious state outside and independent of the body, and in that state received impressions and exercised perceptive powers. For this extraordinary theory I had no other evidence than the fact of my knowledge in the moment of awakening that President Bixby was coming up the stairs. But, slight as this clue was, it seemed to me unmistakable in its significance. That knowledge was certainly in my mind on the instant of arousing from the swoon. It certainly could not have been there before I fell into the swoon. I must, therefore, have gained it in the meantime. That is to say, I must have been in a conscious, percipient state, while my body was insensible. If such had been the case, I reasoned that it was altogether unlikely that the trivial impression as to President Bixby had been the only one which I had received in that state. It was far more probable that it had remained over in my mind on waking from the swoon, merely because it was the latest of a series of impressions received while outside the body. That these impressions were of a kind most strange and startling, seeing that they were those of a disembodied soul exercising faculties more spiritual than those of the body, I could not doubt. The desire to know what they had been grew upon me, till it became a longing which left me no repose. It seemed intolerable that I should have secrets for myself, that my soul should withhold its experiences from my intellect. I would gladly have consented that the acquisitions of half my waking lifetime should be blotted out, if so be in exchange I might be shown the record of what I had seen and known during those hours of which my waking memory showed no trace. None the less for the conviction of its hopelessness, but rather all the more as the perversity of our human nature will have it, the longing for this forbidden law grew on me till the hunger of Eve in the garden was mine. Constantly brooding over a desire that I felt to be in vain, tantalized by the possession of a clue which only mocked me, my personal condition became at length affected. My health was disturbed, and my rest at night was broken. A habit of walking in my sleep from which I had not suffered since childhood recurred, and caused me frequent inconvenience. Such had been, in general, my condition for some time, when I awoke one morning, with the strangely weary sensation by which my body usually betrayed the secret of the impositions put upon it in sleep, of which otherwise I should often have suspected nothing. In going to the study connected with my chamber, I found a number of freshly written sheets on the desk. Astonished that any one should have been in my rooms while I slept, I was astounded, on looking more closely, to observe that the handwriting was my own. How much more than astounded I was, on reading the matter that had been set down, the reader may judge if he shall pursue it. For these written sheets apparently contained the longed-for but despaired of record of those hours when I was absent from the body. They were the last chapter of my life, or rather not lost at all, for it had been no part of my waking life, but a stolen chapter, stolen from that sleep memory on whose mysterious tablets may well be inscribed tales as much more marvellous than this, as this is stranger than most stories. It will be remembered that my last recollection before awaking in my bed on the morning after the swoon was of contemplating the coast of Keplerland with an unusual concentration of attention. As well as I can judge, and that is no better than anyone else, it is with the moment that my bodily powers succumbed and I became unconscious that the narrative which I found on my desk begins. Even had I not come as straight and swift as the beam of light that made my path a glance about me would have told me to what part of the universe I had fared. No earthly landscape could have been more familiar. I stood on the high coast of Keplerland, where it trends southwards. A brisk westerly wind was blowing, and the waves of the ocean of De La Rue were thundering at my feet, 
while the broad blue waters of Christy Bay stretched away to the southwest. Against the northern horizon, rising out of the ocean like a summer thunderhead, for which at first I mistook it, towered the far distant snowy summit of Mount Hall. Even had the configuration of land and sea been less familiar, I should, none the less, have known that I stood on the planet whose ruddy hue is at once the admiration and puzzle of astronomers. Its explanation I now recognize in the tint of the atmosphere, a color incomparable to the haze of Indian summer, except that its hue was a faint rose instead of purple. Like the Indian summer haze, it was impalpable, and without impeding the view bathed all objects near and far in a glamour not to be described. As the gaze turned upward, however, the deep blue of space so far overcame the roseate tint that one might fancy he was still on earth. As I looked about me, I saw many men, women, and children. They were in no respect dissimilar, so far as I could see, to the men, women, and children of the earth, save for something almost childlike in the untroubled serenity of their faces, unfurrowed as they were by any trace of care, of fear, or of anxiety. This extraordinary youthfulness of aspect made it difficult indeed, save by careful scrutiny, to distinguish the young from the middle-aged, maturity from advanced years. Time seemed to have no tooth on Mars. I was gazing about me, admiring this crimson-lighted world, and these people who appeared to hold happiness by a tenure so much firmer than men's, when I heard the words, You are welcome and turning, saw that I had been accosted by a man with the stature and bearing of middle age, though his countenance, like the other faces which I had noted, wonderfully combined the strength of a man's with the serenity of a child's. I thanked him and said, You do not seem surprised to see me, though I certainly am to find myself here. Assuredly not, he answered. I knew, of course, that I was to meet you today, and not only that, but I may say that I am already in a sense acquainted with you, through a mutual friend, Professor Edgeley. He was here last month, and I met him at that time. We talked of you and your interest in our planet. I told him I expected you. Edgeley, I exclaimed. It is strange that he has said nothing of this to me. I meet him every day. But I was reminded that it was in a dream that Edgerly, like myself, had visited Mars, and on awakening had recalled nothing of his experience, just as I should recall nothing of mine. When will man learn to interrogate the dream-soul of the marvels it sees in its wanderings? Then he will no longer need to improve his telescopes to find out the secrets of the universe. Do your people visit the Earth in the same manner? I asked my companion. Certainly, he replied, but there we find no one able to recognize us and converse with us, as I am conversing with you, although myself in the waking state. You as yet lack the knowledge we possess of the spiritual side of the human nature, which we share with you. That knowledge must have enabled you to learn much more of the earth than we know of you, I said. Indeed it has, he replied. From visitors such as you, of whom we entertain a concourse constantly, we have acquired familiarity with your civilization, your history, your manners, and even your literature and languages. Have you not noticed that I am talking with you in English, which is certainly not a tongue indigenous to this planet? Among so many wonders, I scarcely observed that, I answered. For ages, pursued my companion. We have been waiting for you to improve your telescopes so as to approximate the power of ours, after which communication between the planets would be easily established. The progress which you make is, however, so slow that we expect to wait ages yet. Indeed, I fear you will have to, I replied. Our opticians already talk of having reached the limits of their art. Do not imagine that I spoke in any spirit of petulance my companion resumed. The slowness of your progress is not so remarkable to us as that you make any at all. Burdened as you are with a disability so crushing, that if we were in your place, I fear we should sit down in utter despair. To what disability do you refer? I asked. You seem to be men like us. And so we are, was the reply. 
save in one particular, but there the difference is tremendous. Endowed otherwise like us, you are destitute of the faculty of foresight, without which we should think our other faculties well-nigh valueless. Foresight? I repeated. Certainly you cannot mean that it is given to you to know the future. It is given not only to us, was the answer, but so far as we know, to all other intelligent beings of the universe except yourselves. Our positive knowledge extends only to our system of moons and planets, and some of the nearer foreign systems, and it is conceivable that the remoter parts of the universe may harbour other blind races like your own, but it certainly seems unlikely that so strange and lamentable a spectacle should be duplicated. One such illustration of extraordinary deprivations under which a rational existence may still be possible ought to suffice for the universe. But no one can know the future except by inspiration of God, I said. All our faculties are by inspiration of God, was the reply. But there is surely nothing in foresight to cause it to be so regarded more than any other. Think a moment of the physical analogy of the case. Your eyes are placed in the front of your heads. You would deem it an odd mistake if they were placed behind. That would appear to you an arrangement calculated to defeat their purpose. Does it not seem equally rational that the mental vision should range forward, as it does with us, illuminating the path one is to take rather than backward, as with you revealing only the course you have already trodden, and therefore have no more concern with? But it is no doubt a merciful provision of providence that renders you unable to realize the grotesqueness of your predicament as it appears to us. But the future is eternal, I exclaimed. How can a finite mind grasp it? Our foreknowledge implies only human faculties, was the reply. It is limited to our individual careers on this planet. Each of us foresees the course of his own life, but not that of other lives, except so far as they are involved with his. That such a power as you describe could be combined with merely human faculties is more than our philosophers have ever dared to dream, I said. And yet, who shall say, after all, that it is not in mercy that God has denied it to us? If it is a happiness, as it must be, to foresee one's happiness, it must be most depressing to foresee one's sorrows, failures, yes, and even one's death. For if you foresee your lives to the end, you must anticipate the hour and manner of your death. Is it not so? Most assuredly, was the reply. Living would be a very precarious business, were we uninformed of its limit. Your ignorance of the time of your death impresses us as one of the saddest features of your condition. And by us, I answered, it is held to be one of the most merciful. Foreknowledge of your death would not indeed prevent your dying once, continued my companion, but it would deliver you from the thousand deaths you suffer through uncertainty whether you can safely count on the passing day. It is not the death you die, but these many deaths you do not die which shadow your existence. Poor blindfolded creatures that you are, cringing at every step in apprehension of the stroke that perhaps is not to fall till old age never raising a cup to your lips with the knowledge that you will live to quaff it, never sure that you will meet again the friend you part with for an hour, from whose hearts no happiness suffices to banish the chill of an ever-present dread. What idea can you form of the godlike security with which we enjoy our lives and the lives of those we love? You have a saying on earth, Tomorrow belongs to God, but here tomorrow belongs to us, even as today. To you, for some inscrutable purpose, he sees fit to dole out life moment by moment, with no assurance that each is not to be the last. To us he gives a lifetime at once, fifty, sixty, seventy years, a divine gift indeed. A life such as yours would, I fear, seem of little value to us, for such a life, however long, is but a moment long, since that is all you can count on. And yet, I answered, though knowledge of the duration of your lives may give you an enviable feeling of confidence while the end is far off, is that not more than offset by the daily growing weight with which the expectation of the end as it draws near must press upon your minds? 
On the contrary, was the response. Death, never an object of fear as it draws nearer, becomes more and more a matter of indifference to the moribund. It is because you live in the past that death is grievous to you. All your knowledge, all your affections, all your interests are rooted in the past, and on that account, as life lengthens, it strengthens its hold on you, and memory becomes a more precious possession. We, on the contrary, despise the past, and never dwell upon it. Memory with us, far from being the morbid and monstrous growth it is with you, is scarcely more than a rudimentary faculty. We live wholly in the future and the present. What with foretaste and actual taste, our experiences, whether pleasant or painful, are exhausted of interest by the time they are past. The accumulated treasures of memory which you relinquish so painfully in death, we count no loss at all. Our minds being fed wholly from the future, we think and feel only as we anticipate, and so as the dying man's future contracts there is less and less about which he can occupy his thoughts. His interest in life diminishes as the ideas which it suggests grow fewer, till at the last death finds him with his mind a tabula rasa, as with you at birth. In a word, his concern with life is reduced to a vanishing point before he is called upon to give it up. In dying, he leaves nothing behind. And the after-death? I asked. Is there no fear of that? Surely, was the reply, it is not necessary for me to say that a fear which affects only the more ignorant on earth is not known at all to us, and would be counted blasphemous. Moreover, as I have said, our foresight is limited to our lives on this planet. Any speculation beyond them would be purely conjectural, and our minds are repelled by the slightest taint of uncertainty. To us the conjectural and the unthinkable may be called almost the same. But even if you do not fear death for itself, I said, you have hearts to break. Is there no pain when the ties of love are sundered? Love and death are not foes on our planet, was the reply. There are no tears by the bedside of our dying. The same beneficent law which makes it so easy for us to give up life forbids us to mourn the friends we leave, or them to mourn us. With you, it is the intercourse you have had with friends that is the source of your tenderness for them. With us it is the anticipation of the intercourse we shall enjoy which is the foundation of fondness. As our friends vanish from our future with the approach of their death, the effect on our thoughts and affections is as it would be with you if you forgot them by lapse of time. As dying friends grow more and more indifferent to us, we, by operation of the same law of our nature, become indifferent to them, till at the last we are scarcely more than kindly and sympathetic watchers about the beds of those who regard us equally without keen emotions. So at last God gently unwinds instead of breaking the bands that bind our hearts together, and makes death as painless to the surviving as to the dying. Relations meant to produce our happiness are not the means also of torturing us as with you. Love means joy, and that alone, to us, instead of blessing our lives for a while only to desolate them later on, compelling us to pay with a distinct and separate pang for every thrill of tenderness, exacting a tear for every smile. There are other partings than those of death. Are these two without sorrow for you? I asked. Assuredly, was the reply. Can you not see that so it must needs be with beings freed by foresight from the disease of memory? All sorrow of parting as of dying comes with you from the backward vision which precludes you from beholding your happiness till it is past. Suppose your life destined to be blessed by a happy friendship. If you could know it beforehand, it would be a joyous expectation, brightening the intervening years, and cheering you as you traverse desolate periods. But no, not till you meet the one who is to be your friend do you know of him, nor do you guess even then what he is to be to you, that you may embrace him at first sight. Your meeting is cold and indifferent. It is long before the fire is fairly kindled between you, and then it is already time for parting. Now indeed the fire burns well, but henceforth it must consume your heart. Not till they are dead or gone do you fully realize how dear your friends were, and how sweet was their companionship. 
But we, we see our friends afar off coming to meet us, smiling already in our eyes, years before our ways meet. We greet them at first meeting, not coldly, not uncertainly, but with exultant kisses, in an ecstasy of joy. They enter at once into the full possession of our hearts long warmed and lighted for them. We meet them with that delirium of tenderness with which you part. And when to us at last the time of parting comes, it only means that we are to contribute to each other's happiness no longer. We are not doomed like you in parting to take away with us the delight we brought our friends, leaving the ache of bereavement in its place, so that their last state is worse than their first. Parting here is like meeting with you, calm and unimpassioned. The joys of anticipation and possession are the only food of love with us, and therefore love always wears a smiling face. With you he feeds on dead joys past happiness, which are likewise the sustenance of sorrow. No wonder love and sorrow are so much alike on earth. It is a common saying among us that were it not for the spectacle of earth, the rest of the worlds would be unable to appreciate the goodness of God to them. And who can say that this is not the reason the piteous sight is set before us? You have told me marvellous things, I said, after I had reflected. It is indeed but reasonable that such a race as yours should look down with wondering pity on the earth. And yet, before I grant so much, I want to ask you one question. There is known in our world a certain sweet madness, under the influence of which we forget all that is untoward in our lot, and would not change it for gods. So far is this sweet madness regarded by men as a compensation, and more than a compensation, for all their miseries, that if you know not love as we know it, if this loss be the price you have paid for your divine foresight, we think ourselves more favoured of God than you. Confess that love, with its reserves, its surprises, its mysteries, its revelations, is necessarily incompatible with a foresight which weighs and measures every experience in advance. Of love's surprises we certainly know nothing, was the reply. It is believed by our philosophers that the slightest surprise would kill beings of our constitution like lightning. Though, of course, this is merely a theory, for it is only by the study of earthly conditions that we are able to form an idea of what surprise is like. Your power to endure the constant buffetings of the unexpected is a matter of supreme amazement to us, nor, according to our ideas, is there any difference between what you call pleasant and painful surprises. You see then that we cannot envy you these surprises of love which you find so sweet, for to us they would be fatal. For the rest, there is no form of happiness which foresight is so well calculated to enhance as that of love. Let me explain to you how this befalls. As the growing boy begins to be sensible of the charms of a woman, he finds himself as I dare say it is with you, preferring some type of face and form to others. He dreams oftenest of fair hair, or it may be of dark, of blue eyes or brown. As the years go on, his fancy brooding over what seems to it the best and loveliest of every type, is constantly adding to this dream face, this shadowy form, traits and lineaments, hues and contours, till at last the picture is complete and he becomes aware that on his heart thus subtly has been depicted the likeness of the maiden destined for his arms. It may be years before he is to see her, but now begins with him one of the sweetest offices of love, one to you unknown. Youth on earth is but a stormy period of passion, chafing in restraint or rioting in excess, but the very passion whose awakening makes this time so critical with you is here a reforming and educating influence, to whose gentle and potent sway we gladly confide our children. The temptations which lead your young men astray have no hold on a youth of our happy planet. He hoards the treasures of his heart for its coming mistress. Of her alone he thinks, and to her all his vows are made. The thought of license would be treason to his sovereign lady, whose right to all the revenues of his being he joyfully owns. 
To rob her, to abate her, her high prerogatives, would be to impoverish, to insult himself. For she is to be his, and her honour, her glory, are his own. Through all this time that he dreams of her by night and day, the exquisite reward of his devotion is the knowledge that she is aware of him as he of her and that in the inmost shrine of a maiden heart his image is set up to receive the incense of a tenderness that needs not to restrain itself through fear of possible cross or separation. In due time their converging lives come together. The lovers meet, gaze a moment into each other's eyes, then throw themselves on each other's breast. The maiden has all the charms that ever stirred the blood of an earthly lover, but there is another glamour over her that the eyes of earthly lovers are shut to, the glamour of the future. In the blushing girl her lover sees the fond and faithful wife, in the blithe maiden the patient, pain-consecrated mother. On the virgin's breast he beholds his children. He is prescient, even as his lips take the first fruits of hers, of the future years during which she is to be his companion, his ever-present solace his chief portion of God's goodness. We have read some of your romances describing love as you know it on earth, and I must confess, my friend, we find them very dull. I hope, he added, as I did not speak at once, that I shall not offend you by saying we find them also objectionable. Your literature possesses in general an interest for us in the picture it presents of curiously inverted life which the lack of foresight compels you to lead. It is a study especially prized for the development of the imagination, on account of the difficulty of conceiving conditions so opposed to those of intelligent beings in general. But our women do not read your romances. The notion that a man or woman should ever conceive the idea of marrying a person other than the one whose husband or wife he or she is destined to be is profoundly shocking to our habits of thought. No doubt you will say that such instances are rare among you, but if your novels are faithful pictures of your life, they are at least not unknown. That these situations are inevitable under the conditions of earthly life we are well aware, and judge you accordingly. But it is needless that the minds of our maidens should be pained by the knowledge that there anywhere exists a world where such travesties upon the sacredness of marriage are possible. There is, however, another reason why we discourage the use of your books by our young people, and that is the profound effect of sadness to a race accustomed to view all things in the morning glow of the future, of a literature written in the past tense and relating exclusively to things that are ended. And how do you write of things that are past except in the past tense? I asked. We write of the past when it is still the future. And, of course, in the future tense, was the reply. If our historians were to wait till after the events to describe them, not alone would nobody care to read about things already done, but the histories themselves would probably be inaccurate. For memory, as I have said, is a very slightly developed faculty with us, and quite too indistinct to be trustworthy. Should the earth ever establish communication with us, you will find our histories of interest. For our planet, being smaller, cooled and was peopled ages before yours, and our astronomical records contain minute accounts of the Earth from the time it was a fluid mass. Your geologists and biologists may yet find a mine of information here. In the course of our further conversation, it came out that as a consequence of foresight, some of the commonest emotions of human nature are unknown on Mars. They for whom the future has no mystery can, of course, know neither hope nor fear. Moreover, every one being assured what he shall attain to, and what not, there can be no such thing as rivalship, or emulation, or any sort of competition in any respect, and therefore all the brood of heart-burnings and hatreds engineered on earth by the strife of man with man is unknown to the people of Mars save from the study of our planet. When I asked if there were not, after all, a lack of spontaneity, of sense of freedom, in leading lives fixed in all details beforehand, 
I was reminded that there was no difference in that respect between the lives of the people of Earth and of Mars, both alike being according to God's will in every particular. We knew that will only after the event, they before, that was all. For the rest God moved them through their wills as he did us, so that they had no more sense of compulsion in what they did than we on earth have in carrying out an anticipated line of action in cases where our anticipations chance to be correct. Of the absorbing interests which the study of the plan of their future life possessed for the people of Mars, my companion spoke eloquently. It was, he said, like the fascination to a mathematician of a most elaborate and exquisite demonstration, a perfect algebraical equation, with the glowing realities of life in place of the figures and symbols. When I asked if it never occurred to them to wish their futures different, he replied that such a question could only have been asked by one from the earth. No one could have foresight or clearly believe God had it, without realizing that the future is as incapable of being changed as the past. And not only this, but to foresee events was to foresee their logical necessity so clearly that to desire them different was as impossible as seriously to wish that two and two made five instead of four. No person could ever thoughtfully wish anything different, for so closely are all things, the small with the great, woven together by God, that to draw out the smallest thread would unravel creation through all eternity. While we had talked, the afternoon had waned, and the sun had sunk below the horizon. The roseate atmosphere of the planet, imparting a splendor to the cloud coloring, and a glory to the land and seascape, never paralleled by an earthly sunset. Already the familiar constellations appearing in the sky reminded me how near, after all, I was to the earth, for with the unassisted eye I could not detect the slightest variation in their position. Nevertheless, there was one wholly novel feature in the heavens, for many of the host of asteroids which circle in the zone between Mars and Jupiter were vividly visible to the naked eye. But the spectacle that chiefly held my gaze was the earth, swimming low on the verge of the horizon, its disk twice as large as that of any star or planet as seen from the earth, flashed with a brilliancy like that of Venus. It is, indeed, a lovely sight, said my companion although to me always a melancholy one, from the contrast suggested between the radiance of the orb and the benighted condition of its inhabitants. We call it the blind man's world. As he spoke he turned toward a curious structure which stood near us, though I had not before particularly observed it. What is that? I asked. It is one of our telescopes, he replied. I'm going to let you take a look, if you choose, at your home, and test for yourself the powers of which I have boasted. And having adjusted the instrument to his satisfaction, he showed me where to apply my eye to what answered to the eyepiece. I could not repress an exclamation of amazement, for truly he had exaggerated nothing. The little college town which was my home lay spread out before me, seemingly almost as near as when I looked down upon it from my observatory windows. It was early morning, and the village was waking up. The milkmen were going their rounds, and workmen with their dinner pails were hurrying along the streets. The early train was just leaving the railroad station. I could see the puffs from the smokestack and the jets from the cylinders. It was strange not to hear the hissing of the steam so near it seemed. There were the college buildings on the hill, the long rows of the windows flashing back the level sunbeams. I could tell the time by the college clock. It struck me that there was an unusual bustle around the buildings, considering the earliness of the hour. A crowd of men stood about the door of the observatory, and many others were hurrying across the campus in that direction. Among them I recognized President Bixby, accompanied by the college janitor. As I gazed they reached the observatory, and passing through the group about the door entered the building. The President was evidently going up to my quarters. At this it flashed over me quite suddenly, that all this bustle was on my account. I recalled how it was that I came to be on Mars, and in what condition I had left affairs in the observatory. It was high time I were back there to look after myself. Here abruptly ended the extraordinary document which I found that morning on my desk, 
that it is the authentic record of the conditions of life in another world which it purports to be, I do not expect the reader to believe. He will, no doubt, explain it as another of the curious freaks of somnambulism set down in the books. Probably it was merely that. Possibly it was something more. I do not pretend to decide the question. I have told all the facts of the case and have no better means of forming an opinion than the reader. Nor do I know even if I fully believed it the true account that it seems to be, that it would have affected my imagination much more strongly than it has. That story of another world has, in a word, put me out of joint with ours. The readiness with which my mind has adapted itself to the martial point of view concerning the earth has been a singular experience. The lack of foresight among the human faculties, a lack I had scarcely thought of before, now impresses me ever more deeply, as a fact out of harmony with the rest of our nature. Belying its promise, a moral mutilation, a deprivation, arbitrary and unaccountable. The spectacle of a race doomed to walk backward, beholding only what has gone by, assured only of what is past and dead comes over me from time to time with a sadly fantastical effect which I cannot describe. I dream of a world where love always wears a smile, where the partings are as tearless as our meetings, and death is king no more. I have a fancy which I like to cherish, that the people of that happy sphere, fancied though it may be, represents the ideal and normal type of our race, as perhaps it once was as perhaps it may yet be again. End of The Blind Man's World by Edward Bellamy Recording by Andy Sames Cum Grano Salis by David Gordon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Sames. Cum Grano Salis by David Gordon. Just because a man can do something others can't, does not unfortunately mean he knows how to do it. One man could eat the native fruit and live. But how? And that, said Colonel Fenister glumly, appears to be that. The pile of glowing coals that had been storage shed number one was still sending up tongues of flame, but they were nothing compared with what they'd been half an hour before. The smoke smells good anyway, said Major Grodsky, sniffing appreciatively. The Colonel turned his head and glowered at his adjutant. There are times, Grodsky when your sense of humour is out of place. Yes, sir, said the Major, still sniffing. Funny thing for lightning to do, though. Sort of a dirty trick, you might say. You might, growled the Colonel. He was a short, rather roundish man who was forever thankful that the twentieth-century predictions of skin-tight uniforms for the space service had never come true. He had round, pleasant blue eyes, a rather largish nose, and a rumbling basso voice that was a little surprising the first time you heard it, but which seemed to fit perfectly after you knew him better. Right at the moment he was filing data and recommendations in his memory, where they would be instantly available for use when he needed them, not in a physical file, but in his own mind. All right, Colonel Fenister, he thought to himself. Just what does this mean to me, and to the rest? The space service was not old. Unlike the air service, the land service, or the sea service, it did not have centuries or tradition behind it. But it had something else. It had something that none of the other services had. Potential. In his own mind, Colonel Fenister spelled the word with an uppercase P and put the word in italics. It was, to him, a more potent word than any other in the universe. Potential. Potential because the space service of the United Earth had more potential than any other service on Earth. How many seas were there for the sea service to sail? 
How much land could the land service march over? How many atmospheres were there for the air service to conquer? Not for any of those questions was there an accurate answer, but for each of those questions the answer had a limit. But how much space was there for the space service to conquer? Colonel Fenister was not a proud man. He was not an arrogant man. But he did have a sense of destiny. He did have a feeling that the human race was going somewhere, and he did not intend that that feeling should become totally lost to humanity. Potential. Definition. Potential. That which has a possibility of coming into existence. No. More than that, that which has a... He jerked his mind away suddenly from the thoughts which had crowded into his forebrain. What were the chances that the first expedition to Alphaga IV would succeed? What were the chances that it would fail? And, Fenister grinned grimly to himself, what good did it do to calculate chances after the event had happened? Surrounding the compound had been a double-ply, heavy-gauge woven fence. It was guaranteed to be able to stop a Diplodocus in full charge. The electric potential, potential, that word again, great enough to carbonize anything smaller than a blue whale. No animal on Alphaga IV could possibly get through it, and none had. Trouble was, no one had thought of being attacked by something immensely greater than a blue whale, especially since there was no animal larger than a small rhino on the whole planet. Who, after all, could have expected an attack by a blind, uncaring colossus, a monster that had already been dying before it made its attack? Because no one had thought of the forest. The fact that the atmospheric potential, the voltage, and even the amperage difference between the low-hanging clouds and the ground below was immensely greater than that of Earth, that had already been determined. But the compound and the defences surrounding it had already been compensated for that factor. Who could have thought that a single lightning stroke through one of the tremendous twelve-hundred-foot trees that surrounded the compound could have felled it? Who could have predicted that it would topple toward the compound itself? That it would have been burning, that was something that could have been guaranteed, had the idea of the original toppling been considered. Especially after the gigantic wooden life thing had smashed across the double-ply fence, thereby adding man-made energy to its already powerful bulk and blazing surface. But that it would have fallen across storage shed number one, was that predictable? Fenister shook his head slowly. No, it wasn't. The accident was simply that, an accident. No one was to blame, no one was responsible. Except Fenister. He was responsible, not for the accident, but for the personnel of the expedition. He was the military officer, he was the man in charge of fending off attack, and he had failed because that huge, blazing, stricken tree had toppled majestically down from the sky, crashing through its smaller brethren, to come to rest on storage shed number one, thereby totally destroying the majority of the food supply. There were eighty-five men on Alphaga IV, and they would have to wait another six months before the relief ship came, and they didn't have food enough to make it, now that their reserve had been destroyed. Fenister growled something under his breath. What? asked Major Godsky, rather surprised at his superior's tone. I said, water, water, everywhere, that's what I said. Major Godsky looked around him at the lush forest which surrounded the double-ply fence of the compound. Yeah, he said, nor any drop to drink. But I wish one of those boards had shrunk, say, maybe a couple hundred feet. I'm going back to my quarters, Fenister said. I'll be checking with the civilian personnel. Let me know the total damage, will you? The Major nodded. I'll let you know, sir. Don't expect good news. I won't, said Colonel Fenister, as he turned. The Colonel let his plump bulk sag forward into his chair, and he covered his eyes with his hands. I can imagine all kinds of catastrophes, he said, with a kind of hysterical glumness. But this has them all beat. 
Dr. Pilar stroked his short, grey, carefully cultivated beard. I'm afraid I don't understand. We could all have been killed. The colonel peeked one eye out from between the first and second fingers of his right hand. You think starving to death is cleaner than fire? Pilar shook his head slowly. Of course not. I'm just not certain that we'll all die, that's all. Colonel Fenister dropped his hands to the surface of his metal desk. I see, he said dryly. Where there's life, there's hope, right? All right, I agree with you. He waved his hand around in an all-encompassing gesture. Somewhere out there we may find food. But don't you see that this puts us in the siege position? Dr. Francis Pilar frowned. His thick, salt-and-pepper brows rumpled in a look of puzzlement. Siege position? I'm afraid... Fenister gestured with one hand and leaned back in his chair, looking at the scientist across from him. I'm sorry, he said. I've let my humiliation get the better of me. He clipped his upper lip between his teeth until his lower incisors were brushed by his crisp military moustache and held it there for a moment before he spoke. The siege position is one that no military commander of any cerebral magnitude whatever allows himself to get into. It is as old as mankind and a great deal stupider. It is the position of a beleaguered group which lacks one simple essential to keep them alive until help comes. A fighting outfit, suppose, has enough ammunition to stand off two more attacks. But they know that there will be reinforcements within four days. Unfortunately, the enemy can attack more than twice before help comes. Help will come too late. Or it could be that they have enough water to last a week, but help won't come for a month. You follow me, I'm sure. The point, in so far as it concerns us, is that we have food for about a month, but we won't get help before six months have passed. We know help is coming, but we won't be alive to see it. Then his eyes lit up in a kind of half-hope. Unless the native flora... But even before he finished, he could see the look in Dr. Pilar's eyes. Roderick McNeil was a sick man. The medical officers of the Space Service did not agree with him in toto, but McNeil was in a position to know more about his own state of health than the doctors, because it was, after all, he himself who was sick. Rarely, of course, did he draw the attention of the medical officers to his ever-fluctuating assortment of aches, pains, signs, symptoms, malaises, and malfunctions. After all, it wouldn't do for him to be released from the service on a medical discharge. No, he would suffer in silence for the sake of his chosen career, which apparently was to be a permanent spaceman second class. Roderick McNeil had never seen his medical record, and therefore did not know that, aside from mention of the normal slight defects which every human body possesses, the only note on the records was one which said, Slight tendency towards hypochondria, compensated for by tendency to immerse self in job at hand. According to psych tests, he can competently handle positions up to enlisted space officer third class, but positions of ESO2 and above should be carefully considered. See Psych Report, Intelligence Section. But if McNeil did not know what the medics thought of him, neither did the medics know what he thought of them. Nor did they know that McNeil carried a secret supply of his own personal palliatives, purgatives, and polypurpose pills. He kept them carefully concealed in a small section of his space locker, and had labelled them all as various vitamin mixtures, which made them seem perfectly legal, and which was not too dishonest since many of them were vitamins. On the morning after the fire, he heaved his well-muscled bulk out of bed and scratched his scalp through the close-cropped brown hair that covered his squarish skull. He did not feel well, and that was a fact. Of course, he had been up half the night fighting the blaze, and that hadn't helped any. He fancied he had a bit of a headache, and his nerves seemed a little jangled. His insides were probably in their usual balky state. He sighed, wished he were in better health, and glanced around at the other members of the company as they rose grumpily from their beds. 
He sighed again, opened his locker, took out his depilator, and ran it quickly over his face. Then, from his assortment of bottles, he began picking over his morning dosage. Vitamins, of course. Got to keep plenty of vitamins in the system, or it goes all to pot on you. A, B1, B2, B12, C, and on down the alphabet, and past it to A.G. All purpose mineral capsules, presumably containing every element useful to the human body, and possibly a couple that weren't. Two APC capsules, aspirin, phenacetine, caffeine. He liked the way those words sounded. Very medicinal. A milk of magnesia tablet, just in case. A couple of patent mixture pills that were supposed to increase the bile flow. McNeil wasn't quite sure what bile was, but he was quite sure that its increased flow would work wonders within. A largish tablet of sodium bicarbonate to combat excess gastric acidity. Obviously a horrible condition, whatever it was. He topped it all off with a football-shaped capsule containing liquid glandoline. Guards the system against glandular imbalance. And felt himself ready to face the day at least until breakfast. He slipped several bottles into his belt pack after he had put on his field uniform, so that he could get at them at meal times, and trudged out towards the mess hall to the meagre breakfast that awaited him. Specifically, said Colonel Fenister, what we want to know is what are our chances of staying alive until the relief ship comes. He and most of the other officers were still groggy-eyed, having had too much to do to even get an hour's sleep the night before. Only the phlegmatic Major Godsky looked normal. His eyes were always about half-closed. Captain Jones and Bellwether, in charge of A and B companies respectively, and their lieutenants, Morky and Yutang, all looked grim and irritable. The civilian components of the policy group looked not one whit better, Dr. Pilar had been worriedly rubbing at his face so that his normally neat beard had begun to take on the appearance of a ruptured mohair sofa. Dr. Petrelli, the lean, waspish chemist, was nervously trimming his fingernails with his teeth, and the M.D., Dr. Smathers, had a hangdog expression on his pudgy face and had begun drumming his fingers in a staccato tattoo on his round belly. Dr. Pilar tapped a stack of papers that lay before him on the long table at which they were all seated. I have Major Godsky's report on the remaining food. There is not enough for all of us to live, even on the most extended rations. Only the strongest will survive. Colonel Fenister scowled. You mean to imply that we'll be fighting over the food like animals before this is over? The discipline of the space service? His voice was angry, but Dr. Pilar cut him off. It may come to fighting, Colonel. But even if perfect discipline is maintained, what I say will still be true. Some will die early, leaving more food for the remaining men. It has been a long time since anything like this has happened on Earth, but it is not unknown in the space service annals. The colonel pursed his lips and kept his silence. He knew that what the biologist said was true. The trouble is, said Petrelli snappishly, that we are starving in the midst of plenty. We're like men marooned in the middle of an ocean with no water. The water is there, but it's undrinkable. That's what I wanted to get at, said Colonel Fenister. Is there any chance at all that we'll find an edible plant or animal on this planet? The three scientists said nothing, as if each were waiting for one of the others to speak. All life thus far found in the galaxy had had a carbon-hydrogen-oxygen base. Nobody had yet found any silicon-based life, although a good many organisms used the element. No one yet had found a planet with a halogen atmosphere, and, although there might be weird forms of life at the bottom of the soupy atmospheres of the methane ammonia giants, no brave soul had ever gone down to see, at least not on purpose, and no information had ever come back. But such esoteric combinations were not at all necessary for the postulation of wildly variant life forms. Earth itself was prolific in its variations. Earth like planets were equally inventive. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, plus varying proportions of phosphorus, potassium, iodine, nitrogen, sulphur, calcium, iron, magnesium, manganese, and strontium, 
plus a smattering of trace elements, seem to be able to cook up all kinds of life under the strangest imaginable conditions. Alphaga 4 was no different than any other Earth-type planet in that respect. It had a plant-dominated ecology. The land areas were covered with gigantic trees that could be best described as crosses between a California sequoia and a cycad, although such a description would have made a botanist sneer and throw up his hands. There were enough smaller animals to keep the oxygen-carbon dioxide cycle nicely balanced, but the animals had not evolved anything larger than a rat for some reason. Of course the sea had evolved some pretty huge monsters, but the camp of the expedition was located a long way from the sea, so there was no worry from that quarter. At the time, however, the members of the expedition didn't know any of that information for sure. The probe teams had made spot checks and taken random samples, but it was up to the first analytical expedition to make sure of everything. And this much they had discovered. The plants of Alphaga 4 had a nasty habit of killing test animals. Of course, said Dr. Pilar, we haven't tested every plant yet. We may come across something. What is it that kills the animals? asked young Captain Bellwether. Poison, said Major Grodsky. Pilar ignored him. Different things. Most of them we haven't been able to check thoroughly. We found some vines that were heavily laced with cyanide, and there were recognizable alkaloids in several of the shrubs. But most of them are not that direct. Like earth plants, they vary from family to family. The deadly nightshade is related to both the tobacco plant and the tomato. He paused a moment, scratching thoughtfully at his beard. Tell you what, let's go over to the lab and I'll show you what we've found so far. Colonel Fenister nodded. He was a military man, and he wasn't too sure that the scientist's explanations would be very clear. But if there was information to be had, he might as well make the most of it. SM2 Broderick McNeil kept a firm grip on his blast rifle and looked around at the surrounding jungle. Meanwhile, thanking whatever gods there were that he hadn't been put on the fence-mending detail. Not that he objected violently to work, but he preferred to be out here in the forest just now. Breakfast hadn't been exactly filling, and he was hungry. Besides, this was his pet detail, and he liked it. He had been going out with the technicians ever since the base had been finished a couple of weeks before, and he was used to the work. The biotechnicians came out to gather specimens, and it was his job, along with four others, to guard them, make sure that no wild animals got them while they were going about their duties. It was a simple job, and one well suited to McNeil's capacities. He kept an eye on the technicians. They were working on a bush of some kind that had little thorny-looking nuts on it, clipping bits off here and there. He wasn't at all sure what they did with all those little pieces and bits, but that was none of his business anyway. Let the brains take care of that stuff. His job was to make sure they weren't interrupted in whatever it was they were doing. After watching the three technicians in total incomprehension for a minute or so, he turned his attention to the surrounding forest. But he was looking for a plant, not an animal, and he finally saw what he was looking for. The technicians paid him no attention, they rarely did. They had their job, and he had his. Of course, he didn't want to be caught breaking regulations, but he knew how to avoid that catastrophe. He walked casually toward the tree, as though he were only slightly interested in it. He didn't know what the name of the tree was. He'd asked a technician once, and the tech had said that the tree didn't have any name yet. Personally, McNeil thought it was silly for a thing not to have a name. Hell, everything had a name. But if they didn't want to tell him what it was, that was all right with him, too. He called it a banana pear tree, because that's what the fruit reminded him of. The fruit that hung from the tree were six or eight inches long, fat in the middle and tapering at both ends. The skin was a pale chartreuse in colour, with heliotrope spots. McNeil remembered the first time he'd seen one, the time he'd asked the tech what its name was. The tech had been picking some of them and putting them into plastic bags, and the faint spark of McNeil's dim curiosity had been brought to feebly flickering life. "'Hey, Doc,' he said. "'What you gonna do with them things?' 
Take him to the lab, said the technician, engrossed in his work. MacNeil had digested that carefully. Yeah, he said at last. What for? The technician had sighed and popped another fruit into a bag. He had attempted to explain things to Broderick MacNeil before, and given it up as a bad job. We just feed em to the monkeys, Mac, that's all. Oh, said Broderick MacNeil. Well, that made sense, anyhow. Monkeys got to eat something, don't they? Sure. And he had gazed at the fruit in interest. Fresh fruit was something MacNeil missed. He'd heard that fresh fruit was necessary for health, and on earth he'd always made sure that he'd had plenty of it. He didn't want to get sick, but they didn't ship fresh fruit on an interstellar expedition, and MacNeil had felt vaguely apprehensive about the lack. Now, however, his problems were solved. He knew that it was strictly against regulations to eat native fruit until the brass said so, but that didn't worry him too much. He'd heard somewhere that a man can eat anything a monkey can, so he wasn't worried about it. So he tried one. It tasted fine. Something like a pear and something like a banana, and different from either. It was just fine. Since then he'd managed to eat a couple every day, so as to get his fresh fruit. It kept him healthy. Today, though, he needed more than just health. He was hungry, and the banana pears looked singularly tempting. When he reached the tree, he turned casually around to see if any of the others were watching. They weren't, but he kept his eye on them while he picked several of the fruit. Then he turned carefully around, and with his back to the others, masking his movements with his own body, he began to munch contentedly on the crisp flesh of the banana pears. Now, take this one, for instance, said Dr. Pilar. He was holding up a native fruit. It bulged in the middle, and had a chartreuse rind with heliotrope spots on it. It's a very good example of exactly what we're up against. Ever since we discovered this particular fruit, we've been interested in it because the analyses show that it should be an excellent source of basic food elements. Presumably it even tastes good. Our monkeys seem to like it. What's the matter with it, then? asked Major Grodsky, eyeing the fruit with sleepy curiosity. Dr. Pilar gave the thing a wry look and put it back in the specimen bag. Except for the fact that it has killed every one of our test specimens, we don't know what's wrong with it. Colonel Fenister looked around the laboratory at the cages full of chittering animals, monkeys, white mice, rats, guinea pigs, hamsters, and the others. Then he looked back at the scientists. Don't you know what killed them? Pilar didn't answer. Instead, he glanced at Dr. Smathers, the physician. Smathers steepled his fingers over his abdomen, and then rubbed his fingers together. We're not sure thus far. It looks as though death was caused by oxygen starvation in the tissues. Some kind of anemia, hazarded the colonel. Smathers frowned. The end results are similar, but there is no drop in the haemoglobin. In fact, it seems to rise a little. We're still investigating that. We haven't got all the answers yet by any means, but since we don't quite know what to look for, we're rather hampered. The colonel nodded slowly. Lack of equipment. Pretty much so, admitted Dr. Smathers. Remember, we're just here for preliminary investigation. When the ship brings in more men and equipment... His voice trailed off. Very likely, when the ship returned, it would find an empty base. The first string team simply wasn't set up for exhaustive work. Its job was to survey the field in general and mark out the problems for the complete team to solve. Establishing the base had been of primary importance, and that was the sort of equipment that had been carried on the ship, that and food. The scientists had only the barest essentials to work with. They had no electron microscopes or any of the other complex instruments necessary for exhaustive biochemical work. Now that they were engaged in a fight for survival, they felt like a gang of midgets attacking a herd of water buffalo with penknives. Even if they won the battle, the mortality rate would be high and their chances of winning were pretty small. The space service officers and the scientists discussed the problem for over an hour, but they came to no promising conclusion. 
At last Colonel Fenister said, Very well, Dr. Pilar. We'll have to leave the food supply problem in your hands. Meanwhile, I'll try to keep order here in the camp. SM2 Broderick McNeil may not have had a top-level grade of intelligence, but by the end of the second week his conscience was nagging him, and he was beginning to wonder who was goofing and why. After much thinking, if we may so refer to McNeil's painful cerebral processes, he decided to ask a few cautious questions. Going without food tends to make for mental fogginess, snarling tempers, and general physical lassitude in any group of men and, while quarter rations were not quite starvation meals, they closely approached it. It was fortunate, therefore, that MacNeil decided to approach Dr. Pilar. Dr. Petrelli's temper, waspish by nature, had become positively virulent in the two weeks that had passed since the destruction of the major food cache. Dr. Smathers was losing weight from his excess, but his heretofore pampered stomach was voicelessly screaming along his nerve passages and his fingers had become shaky, which is unnerving in a surgeon, so his temper was no better than Petrelli's. Pilar, of course, was no better fed, but he was calmer than either of the others by disposition, and his lean frame didn't need as much energy. So when the big hulking spaceman appeared at the door of his office, with his cap in his hands, he was inclined to be less brusque than he might have been. Yes, what is it? he asked. He had been correlating notes in his journal, with the thought in the back of his mind that he would never finish it, but he felt that a small respite might be relaxing. McNeil came in and looked nervously around at the plain walls of the prefab plastic dome hut, as though seeking consolation from them. Then he straightened himself in the approved military manner, and looked at the doctor. "'You, Dr. Pillar, sir?' "'Pilar,' said the scientist in correction. If you're looking for the medic, you'll want Dr. Smathers over in G-section. Oh, yes, sir, said McNeil quickly. I know that, but I ain't sick. He didn't feel that sick, anyway. I'm Spaceman Second McNeil, sir, from B Company. Could I ask you something, sir? Pilar sighed a little, then smiled. Go ahead, Spaceman. McNeil wondered if maybe he'd ought to ask the doctor about his sacroiliac pains then decided against it. This wasn't the time for it. Well, about the food. Uh, Doc, can men eat monkey food all right? Pilar smiled. Yes, what food there is left for the monkeys has already been sent to the men's mess hall. He didn't add that the lab animals would be next to go. Quick frozen, they might help eke out the dwindling food supply but it would be better not to let the men know what they were eating for a while. When they got hungry enough, they wouldn't care. But McNeil was plainly puzzled by Pilar's answer. He decided to approach the stuff as obliquely as he knew how. Doc, sir, if I, uh, I, well... He took the bit in his teeth and plunged ahead. If I'd done something against the regulations, would you have to report me to Captain Bellwether? Dr. Pilar leaned back in his chair and looked at the big man with interest. Well, he said carefully, that would all depend on what it was. If it was something really, uh, dangerous to the welfare of the expedition, I'd have to say something about it, I suppose. But I'm not a military officer, and minor infractions don't concern me. McNeil absorbed that. Well, sir, this ain't much really. I ate something I shouldn't have. Pilar drew down his brows. Stealing food, I'm afraid, would be a major offence under the circumstances. McNeil looked both startled and insulted. Oh, no, sir. I never swiped no food. In fact, I've been giving my chow to my buddies. Pilar's brows lifted. He suddenly realized that the man before him looked in exceptionally good health for one who had been on a marginal diet for two weeks. Then what have you been living on? The monkey food, sir. Monkey food? Yes, sir. Them greenish things with the purple spots. You know, them fruits you feed the monkeys on. Pilar looked at McNeil goggle-eyed for a full thirty seconds before he burst into action. No. Of course I won't punish him, said Colonel Fenister. 
Something will have to go on the record, naturally, but I'll just restrict him to barracks for thirty days and then recommend him for light duty. But are you sure? I'm sure, said Pilar, half in wonder. Fenister glanced over at Dr. Smathers, now noticeably thinner in the face. The medic was looking over MacNeil's record. But if that fruit kills monkeys and rats and guinea pigs, how can a man eat it? Animals differ, said Smathers, without taking his eyes off the record sheets. He didn't amplify the statement. The colonel looked back at Pilar. That's the trouble with test animals, Dr. Pilar said ruffling his grey beard with a fingertip. You take a rat, for instance. A rat can live on a diet that would kill a monkey. If there's no vitamin A in the diet, the monkey dies, but the rat makes his own vitamin A. He doesn't need to import it, you might say, since he can synthesize it in his own body. But a monkey can't. That's just one example. There are hundreds that we know of, and God alone knows how many that we haven't found yet. Benister settled his own body more comfortably in the chair, and scratched his head thoughtfully. Then even after a piece of alien vegetation has passed all the animal tests, you still couldn't be sure it wouldn't kill a human. That's right. That's why we ask for volunteers. But we haven't lost a man so far. Sometimes a volunteer will get pretty sick, but if a food passes all the other tests, you can usually depend on its not killing a human being. I gather that this is a pretty unusual case, then. Pilar frowned. As far as I know, yes. But if something kills all the test animals, we don't ask for humans to try it out. We assume the worst and forget it. He looked musingly at the wall. I wonder how many edible plants we bypass that way, he asked softly, half to himself. What are you going to do next? the colonel asked. My men are getting hungry. Smathers looked up from the report in alarm, and Pilar had a similar expression on his face. "'For Pete's sake,' said Smathers, "'don't tell anyone, not anyone, about this. Not just yet. We don't want all your men rushing out in the forest to gobble down those things until we're more sure of them. Give us a few more days at least.' The colonel patted the air with a hand. "'Don't worry. I'll wait until you give me the go-ahead. But I'll want to know your plans.' Pilar pursed his lips for a moment before he spoke. "'We'll check up on McNeil for another forty-eight hours. We'd like to have him transferred over here, so that we can keep him in isolation. We'll feed him more of the, uh, what did he call them, Smothers? Banana pears. We'll feed him more banana pears and keep checking. If he is still in good shape, we'll ask for volunteers.' "'Good enough,' said the Colonel. "'I'll keep in touch.' On the morning of the third day in isolation, McNeil rose early, as usual, gulped down his normal assortment of vitamins, added a couple of aspirin tablets, and took a dose of Epsom salts for good measure. Then he yawned and leaned back to wait for breakfast. He was certainly getting enough fresh fruit, that was certain. He'd begun to worry about whether he was getting a balanced diet. He'd heard that a balanced diet was very important, but he figured that the doctors knew what they were doing. Leave it up to them. He'd been probed and needled and tested plenty in the last couple of days, but he didn't mind it. It gave him a feeling of confidence to know that the doctors were taking care of him. Maybe he ought to tell them about his various troubles. They all seemed like nice guys. On the other hand, it wouldn't do to get booted out of the service. He'd think it over for a while. He settled back to doze a little while he waited for his breakfast to be served. Sure was nice to be taken care of. Later on that same day, Dr. Pilar put out a call for volunteers. He still said nothing about McNeil. He simply asked the colonel to say that it had been eaten successfully by a test animal. The volunteers ate their banana pears for lunch, approaching them warily at first, but soon polishing them off with gusto, proclaiming them to have a fine taste. The next morning they felt weak and listless, Thirty-six hours later, they were dead. "'Oxygen starvation!' said Smathers angrily, when he had completed the autopsies. Roderick McNeil munched pleasantly on a banana pear that evening, happily unaware that three of his buddies had died of eating that self-same fruit. 
The chemist, Dr. Petrelli, looked at the fruit in his hand, snarled suddenly, and smashed it to the floor. Its skin burst splattering pulp all over the grey plastic. It looks, he said in a high savage voice, as if that hulking idiot will be the only one left alive when the ship returns. He turned to look at Smathers, who was peering through a binocular microscope. Smathers, what makes him different? How do I know? growled Smathers, still peering. There's something different about him, that's all. Petrelli forcibly restrained his temper. Very funny, he snapped. Not funny at all, Smathers snapped back. No two human beings are identical, you know that. He lifted his gaze from the eyepiece of the instrument, and settled it on the chemist. He's got AB blood type, for one thing, which none of the volunteers had. Is that what makes him immune to whatever poison is in those things? I don't know. Were the other three allergic to some protein substance in the fruit, while McNeil isn't? I don't know. Do his digestive processes destroy the poison? I don't know. It's got something to do with his blood, I think, but I can't even be sure of that. The leukocytes are a little high. The red cell count is a little low. The hemoglobin shows a little high on the colorimeter, but none of them seems enough to do any harm. It might be an enzyme that destroys the ability of the cells to utilize oxygen. It might be anything. His eyes narrowed then, as he looked at the chemist. After all, why haven't you isolated the stuff from the fruit? There's no clue as to what to look for, said Petrelli, somewhat less bitingly. The poison might be present in microscopic amounts. Do you know how much botulin toxin it takes to kill a man? A fraction of a milligram. Smathers looked as though he were about to quote the minimum dosage, so Petrelli charged on. If you think anyone could isolate an unknown organic compound out of a... Gentlemen, please, said Dr. Pilar sharply. I realize that this is a strain, but bickering won't help. What about your latest tests on McNeil, Dr. Smathers? As far as I can tell, he's in fine health, and I can't understand why, said the physician in a restrained voice. Pilar tapped one of the report sheets. You mean the vitamins? I mean the vitamins, said Smathers. According to Dr. Petrelli, the fruits contain neither A nor B1. After living solely on them for four weeks now, he should be beginning to show some deficiencies, but he's not. No signs? queried Dr. Pilar. No symptoms? No signs, at least no abnormal ones. He's not getting enough protein, but then none of us is. He made a bitter face. But he has plenty of symptoms. Dr. Petrelli raised a thin eyebrow. What's the difference between a sign and a symptom? A sign? said Smathers testily, is something that can be objectively checked by another person than the patient. Lesions, swellings, inflammation, erratic heartbeat, and so on. A symptom is a subjective feeling of the patient, like aches, pains, nausea, dizziness, or spots before the eyes. And McNeil is beginning to get all kinds of symptoms. Trouble is, he's got a record of hypochondria, and I can't tell which of the symptoms are psychosomatic, and which, if any, might be caused by the fruit. The trouble is, said Dr. Petrelli, that we have an unidentifiable disease caused by an unidentifiable agent, which is checked by an unidentifiable something in McNeil, and we have neither the time nor the equipment to find out. This is a job that a fully equipped research lab might take a couple of years to solve. We can keep trying, said Pilar, and hope we stumble across it by accident. Petrelli nodded and picked up the beaker he'd been heating over an electric plate. He added a collating agent, which, if there were any nickel present, would sequester the nickel ions and bring them out of solution as a brick-red precipitate. Smathers scowled and bent over his microscope to count more leukocytes. Pilar pushed his notes aside and went over to check his agar plates in the constant temperature box. The technicians, who had been listening to the conversation with ears wide open, went back to their various duties, and all of them tried in vain to fight down the hunger pangs that were corroding at their insides. Roderick McNeil lay in his bed and felt pleasantly ill. He treasured each one of his various symptoms. Each pain and ache was just right. He hadn't been so comfortable in years. 
It really felt fine to have all these doctors fussing over him. They got snappy and irritable once in a while, but then all them brainy people had a tendency to do that. He wondered how the rest of the boys were doing on their diet of banana pears. Too bad they weren't getting any special treatment. MacNeil had decided just that morning that he'd leave the whole state of his health in the hands of the doctors. No need for a fellow to dose himself when there were three medics on the job, was there? If he needed anything, they'd give it to him, so he decided to take no medicine. A delightful dulling lassitude was creeping over him. MacNeil! MacNeil! Wake up! MacNeil! The spaceman vaguely heard the voice and tried to respond, but a sudden dizziness overtook him. His stomach felt as though it were going to come loose from his interior. I'm sick, he said weakly, and then with a terrible realization, I'm really awful sick. He saw Dr. Smathers' face swimming above him and tried to lift himself from the bed. Should have taken pills, he said, through the haze that was beginning to fold over him again. Locker box, and then he was unconscious again. Dr. Smathers looked at him bleakly. The same thing was killing MacNeil as had killed the others. It had taken longer, much longer, but it had come. And then the meaning of the spaceman's mumbled words came to him. Pills? Locker box? He grabbed the unconscious man's right hand and shoved his right thumb against the sensor plate in the front of the metal box next to the bed. He could have gotten the master key from Colonel Fenister, but he hadn't the time. The box door dilated open and Dr. Smathers looked inside. When he came across the bottles, he swore under his breath, then flung the spaceman's arm down and ran from the room. That's where he was getting his vitamins, then, said Dr. Pilar, as he looked over the assortment of bottles that he and Smathers had taken from the locker box. Look at him. He's got almost as many pills as you have. He looked up at the physician. Do you suppose it was just vitamins that kept him going? I don't know, said Smathers. I've given him massive doses of every one of the vitamins from my own supplies, naturally. He may rally round, if that's what it was. But why would he suddenly be affected by the stuff now? Maybe he quit taking them. Pilar made it half a question. It's possible, agreed Smathers. A hypochondriac will sometimes leave off dosing himself if there's a doctor around to do it for him. As long as the subconscious need is filled, he's happy. But he was shaking his head. What's the matter? Pilar asked. Smathers pointed at the bottles. Some of those are mislabeled. They all say vitamins of one kind or another on the label, but the tablets inside aren't all vitamins. MacNeil's been giving himself all kinds of things. Pilar's eyes widened a trifle. Do you suppose that one of them is an antidote? Smathers snorted. Hell, anything's possible at this stage of the game. The best thing we can do, I think, is to give him a dose of everything there and see what happens. Yeah, Doc, yeah, said MacNeil, smiling weakly. I feel a little better. Not real good, you understand, but better. Under iron control, Dr. Smathers put on his best bedside manner, while Pilar and Petrelli hovered in the background. Now look, son, said Smathers in a kindly voice. We found the medicines in your locker box. MacNeil's face fell, making him look worse. He dropped down close to death before the conglomerate mixtures which had been pumped into his stomach had taken effect, and Smathers had no desire to put too much pressure on the man. Now don't worry about it, son, he said hurriedly. We'll see to it that you aren't punished for it. It's all right. We just want to ask you a few questions. Sure, Doc. Anything said MacNeil, but he still looked apprehensive. Have you been dosing yourself pretty regularly with these things? Well, uh, well, yeah, sometimes, he smiled feebly. Sometimes I don't feel so good, and I didn't want to bother the medics. You know how it is. Very considerate, I'm sure, said Smathers, with just the barest trace of sarcasm, which fortunately fell unheeded on MacNeil's ears. But which ones did you take every day? Just the vitamins, he paused. And, er, uh, maybe an aspirin. The only things I took real regular were the vitamins, though. 
That's all right, ain't it? Ain't vitamins food? Sure, son, sure. What did you take yesterday morning, before you got so sick? Just the vitamins, McNeil said stoutly. I figured that since you docs was taking care of me, I didn't need no medicine. Dr. Smathers glanced up hopelessly at the other two men. That eliminates the vitamins, he said, sotto voce. He looked back at the patient. No aspirin, no APCs, you didn't have a headache at all? McNeil shook his head firmly. I don't get headaches much. Again he essayed a feeble smile. I ain't like you guys. I don't overwork my brains. I'm sure you don't, said Smathers. Then his eyes gleamed. You have quite a bit of stomach trouble, eh? Your digestion bad? Yeah, you know, I told you about it. I get heartburn and acid stomach pretty often, and constipation. What do you take for that? Oh, different things. Sometimes a soda pill, sometimes milk of magnesia. It's different things. Smathers looked disappointed. But before he could say anything, Dr. Petrelli's awed but excited voice came from behind him. Do you take Epsom salts? Yeah. I wonder, said Petrelli softly, and then he left for the lab at a dead run. Colonel Fenister and Major Grodsky sat at the table in the lab, munching on banana pears, blissfully enjoying the sweet flavour and feeling of fullness they were imparting to their stomachs. McNeil can't stay in the service, of course, said Fenister. That is, not in any space-going outfit. We'll find an Earthside job for him, though. Maybe even give him a medal. You sure these things won't hurt us? Dr. Pilar started to speak, but Petrelli cut him off. Positive, said the chemist. After we worked it out, it was pretty simple. The poison was a collating agent, that's all. You saw the test run I did for you? The colonel nodded. He'd watched the little chemist add an iron salt to some of the fruit juice and seen it turn red. Then he'd seen it turn pale yellow when a magnesium salt was added. But what's a collating agent? he asked. There are certain organic compounds, Dr. Petrelli explained that are, well, to put it simply, they're attracted by certain ions. Some are attracted by one ion, some by another. The collating molecules cluster around the ion and take it out of circulation, so to speak. They neutralize it in a way. Look, suppose you had a dangerous criminal on the loose and didn't have any way to kill him. If you kept him surrounded by policemen all the time, he couldn't do anything. See? The Space Service officers nodded their understanding. We call that sequestering the ion, the chemist continued. It's used quite frequently in medicine, as Dr. Smathers will tell you. For instance, beryllium ions in the body can be deadly. Beryllium poison is nasty stuff. But if the patient is treated with a proper collating agent, the ions are surrounded and don't do any more damage. They're still there, but now they're harmless, you see. Well then, said the colonel. Just what did this stuff in the fruit do? It sequestered the iron ions in the body. They couldn't do their job. The body had to quit making hemoglobin because hemoglobin needs iron. So, since there was no hemoglobin in the bloodstream, the patient developed sudden pernicious anemia and died of oxygen starvation. Colonel Fenister looked suddenly at Dr. Smathers. I thought you said the blood looked normal. It did said the physician. The colorimeter showed extra hemoglobin, in fact, but the collating agent in the fruit turns red when it's connected up with iron. In fact, it's even redder than blood hemoglobin, and the molecules containing the sequestered iron tend to stick to the outside of the red blood cells, which threw the whole test off. As I understand it, then, said Major Grodsky, the antidote for the, uh, collating agent is magnesium? That's right, said Dr. Petrelli, nodding. The stuff prefers magnesium ions to ferrous ions. They fit better within the collating ring. Any source of magnesium will do, so long as there's plenty of it. McNeil was using milk of magnesia, which is the hydroxide for gastric acidity. It's changed to chloride in the stomach. 
and he was using Epsom salts, the sulphate, and magnesium citrate as laxatives. He was well protected with magnesium ions. We tried it ourselves first, naturally, said Dr. Pilar. We haven't had any ill effects for two days, so I think we'll be able to make it until the ship comes. Major Grodsky sighed. Well, if not, at least I'll die with a full stomach. He reached for another banana pear, then looked over at Petrelli. Pass the salt, please. Silently and solemnly, the chemist handed him the Epsom salts. The End End of Come Grano Salis by David Gordon Recording by Andy Sames Bearing Gifts by Frederick Brown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Costello. Earthmen Bearing Gifts by Frederick Brown. Darai sat alone in his room, meditating. From outside the door, he caught a thought wave equivalent to a knock, and, glancing at the door, he willed it to slide open. It opened. Enter, my friend, he said. He could have projected the idea telepathically, but with only two persons present, speech was more polite. Ijean Key entered. You are up late tonight, my leader, he said. Yes, Key. Within an hour the Earth rocket is due to land, and I wish to see it. Yes, I know it will land a thousand miles away, if their calculations are correct beyond the horizon. But if it lands even twice that far, the flash of the atomic explosion should be visible, and I have waited long for first contact. For even though no Earthman will be on that rocket, it will still be first contact for them. Of course, our telepath teams have been recording their thoughts for many centuries, but this will be the first physical contact between Mars and Earth. Key made himself comfortable on one of the low chairs. True, he said. I have not followed recent reports too closely, though. Why are they using an atomic warhead? I know they suppose our planet is uninhabited, but still. They will watch the flash through their lunar telescopes and get a what do they call it? A spectroscopic analysis. That will tell them more than they know now, or think they know, much of it is erroneous, about the atmosphere of our planet and the composition of its surface. It is, call it a sighting shot, Key. They'll be here in person within a few oppositions, and then Mars was holding out waiting for Earth to come. What was left of Mars, that is, this one small city of about 900 beings. The civilization of Mars was older than that of Earth, but it was a dying one. This was what remained of it, one city, 900 people. They were waiting for Earth to make contact, for a selfish reason and for an unselfish one. Martian civilization had developed in a quite different direction from that of Earth. It had developed no important knowledge of the physical sciences, no technology, but it had developed social sciences to the point where there had not been a single crime, let alone a war, on Mars for 50,000 years. And it had developed fully the parapsychological sciences of the mind, which Earth was just beginning to discover. Mars could teach Earth much. How to avoid crime and war to begin with. Beyond those simple things lay telepathy, telekinesis, empathy, and Earth would, Mars hoped, teach them something even more valuable to Mars. How, by science and technology, which it was too late for Mars to develop now, 
even if they had the type of minds which would enable them to develop these things, to restore and rehabilitate a dying planet so that an otherwise dying race might live and multiply again. Each planet would gain greatly and neither would lose. And tonight was the night when Earth would make its first sighting shot. Its next shot, a rocket containing Earthmen, or at least an Earthman, would be at the next opposition. Two Earth years are roughly four Martian years hence. The Martians knew this because their teams of telepaths were able to catch at least some of the thoughts of Earthmen, enough to know their plans. Unfortunately, at that distance, the connection was one way. Mars could not ask Earth to hurry its program or tell Earth scientists the facts about Mars composition and atmosphere, which would have made this preliminary shot unnecessary. Tonight, Rai, the leader, as nearly as the Martian word can be translated, and Key, his administrative assistant and closest friend, sat and meditated together until the time was near. Then they drank a toast to the future in a beverage based on menthol, which had the same effect on Martians as alcohol on Earthmen, and climbed to the roof of the building in which they had been sitting. They watched toward the north, where the rocket should land. The stars shone brilliantly and unweakingly through the atmosphere. In observatory number one on Earth's moon, Rog Everett, his eye at the eyepiece of the spotter scope, said triumphantly, Are she blue, Willie? And now, as soon as the films are developed, we'll know the score on that old planet Mars. He straightened up. There'd be no more to see now. And he and Willie Sanger shook hands solemnly. It was an historical occasion. Hope it didn't kill anybody. Any Martians, that is. Raj, did it hit dead center? And Syrtis Major? Near as it matters. I'd say it was maybe a thousand miles off to the south. And that's damn close on a 50 million mile shot. Willie, do you really think there are any Martians? Willie thought a second and then said, no. He was right. End of Earthmen Bearing Gifts by Frederick Brown. Orbit by John Corey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Egocentric Orbit by John Corey. It took a long time for human beings to accept that our little piece of meteoric rubble wasn't the exact and absolute center of the universe. It does appear that way, doesn't it? It may not take so long for a spaceman to learn. Near the end of his fifteenth orbit, as Greenland slipped by noiselessly below, he made the routine measurements that tested the operation of his space capsule and checked the automatic instruments which would transmit their stored data to Earth on his next pass over control. Everything normal, all mechanical devices were operating perfectly. This information didn't surprise him. In fact, he really didn't even think about it. The previous orbits and the long simulated flights on Earth during training had made such checks routine and perfect results expected. The capsules were developed by exhaustive testing both on the ground and as empty satellites before entrusting them to carry animals and then the first human. He returned to contemplation of the panorama passing below and above, although, as he noted idly, above and below had lost some of their usual meaning. Since his capsule, like all heavenly bodies, was stable in position with respect to the entire universe, and thanks to Sir Isaac Newton and his laws never changed, the earth and the stars alternated over his head during each orbit. Up now meant whatever was in the direction of his head, 
he remembered that even during his initial orbit when the earth first appeared overhead he accepted the fact as normal he wondered if the other two had accepted it as easily for there had been two men hurled into orbit before he ventured into space two others who had also passed the rigorous three-year training period and were selected on the basis of overall performance to precede him he had known them both well and wondered again what had happened on their flights of course they had both returned depending upon what your definition of return was the capsules in which they had ventured beyond earth had returned them living but this was to be expected for even the considerable hazards of descent through the atmosphere and the terrible heating which occurred were successfully surmounted by the capsule naturally it had not been expected that the satellites would have to be brought down by command from the ground but this too was part of the careful planning radio control of the retro rockets that moved the satellite out of orbit by reducing its velocity of course ground control was to be used only if the astronaut failed to ignite the retro rockets himself he remembered every one surprise and relief when the first capsule was recovered and its occupant found to be alive they had assumed that in spite of all precautions he was dead because he had not fired the rockets on the fiftieth orbit and it was necessary to bring him down on the sixty-fifth recovery alive only partially solved the mystery for the rescuers and all others were met by a haughty stony silence from the occupant batteries of tests confirmed an early diagnosis complete and utter withdrawal absolute refusal to communicate therapy was unsuccessful the second attempt was similar in most respects except that command return was made on the thirty-first orbit after the astronaut's failure to deorbit at the end of the thirtieth his incoherent babble of moons stars and worlds was no more helpful than the first test after test confirmed that no obvious organic damage had been incurred by exposure outside of the earth's protective atmosphere biopsy of even selected brain tissues seemed to show that microscopic cellular changes due to prolonged weightlessness or primary cosmic ray bombardment which had been suggested by some authorities were unimportant somewhat reluctantly it was decided to repeat the experiment a third time the launching was uneventful he was sent into space with the precision he expected the experience was exhilarating and although he had anticipated each event in advance he could not possibly have foreseen the overpowering feeling that came over him weightlessness he had experienced for brief periods during training but nothing could match the heady impression of continuous freedom from gravity earth passing overhead was also to be expected from the simple laws of celestial mechanics but his feeling as he watched it now was inexpressible it occurred to him that perhaps this was indeed why he was here because he could appreciate such experiences best he had been told the stars would be bright unblinking and an infinitude in extent but could mere descriptions or photographs convey the true seeing on his twenty-first orbit he completed his overseeing the entire surface of the planet in daylight he had seen more of earth than anyone able to tell about it but only he had the true feeling of it the continents were clearly visible as were the oceans in both polar ice caps the shapes were familiar but in only a remote way a vague indistinctness born of distance served to modify the outlines and he alone was seeing and understanding on the dark side of the planet large cities were marked by indistinct light areas which paled to insignificance compared to the stars and his sun he speculated about the others who had only briefly experienced these sights Undoubtedly, they weren't as capable of fully grasping or appreciating any of these things as he was. It was quite clear that no one else but he could encompass the towering feeling of power and importance generated by being alone in the universe. 
at the end of the twenty-fifth orbit he disabled the radio control of the retro rockets and sat back with satisfaction to await the next circuit of his earth around him the end end of egocentric orbit by john corey recording by pamela krantz The Eyes Have It by Philip Kindred Dick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Gordon. The Eyes Have It by Philip Kindred Dick. It was quite by accident I discovered this incredible invasion of Earth by life forms from another planet. As yet, I haven't done anything about it. I can't think of anything to do. I wrote to the government, and they sent back a pamphlet on the repair and maintenance of frame houses. Anyhow, the whole thing is known. I'm not the first to discover it. Maybe. It's even under control. I was sitting in my easy chair, idly turning the pages of a paper-backed book someone had left on the bus, when I came across the reference that first put me on the trail. For a moment I didn't respond. It took some time for the full import to sink in. After I'd comprehended, it seemed odd I hadn't noticed it right away. The reference was clearly to a non-human species of incredible properties, not indigenous to Earth. A species, I hasten to point out, customarily masquerading as ordinary human beings. Their disguise, however, became transparent in the face of the following observations by the author. It was at once obvious. The author knew everything. Knew everything and was taking it in his stride. The line, and I tremble remembering it even now, read, His eyes slowly roved about the room. Vague chills assailed me. I tried to picture the eyes. Did they roll like dimes? The passage indicated not. They seemed to move through the air, not over the surface rather rapidly, apparently. No one in the story was surprised. That's what tipped me off. No sign of amazement at such an outrageous thing. Later, the matter was amplified. His eyes moved from person to person. There it was, in a nutshell. The eyes had clearly come apart from the rest of him and were on their own. My heart pounded and my breath choked in my windpipe. I had stumbled on an accidental mention of a totally unfamiliar race. Obviously non-terrestrial. Yet, to the characters in the book, it was perfectly natural, which suggested... They belong to the same species. And the author? A slow suspicion burned in my mind. The author was taking it rather too easily in his stride. Evidently, he felt this was quite a usual thing. He made absolutely no attempt to conceal this knowledge. The story continued. Presently, his eyes fastened on Julia. Julia, being a lady, had at least the breeding to feel indignant. She is described as blushing and knitting her brows angrily. At this, I sighed with relief. They weren't all non-terrestrials. The narrative continues. Slowly, calmly, his eyes examined every inch of her. Great Scott! 
But here the girl turned and stomped off, and the matter ended. I lay back in my chair, gasping with horror. My wife and family regarded me in wonder. What's wrong, dear? my wife asked. I couldn't tell her. Knowledge like this was too much for the ordinary run-of-the-mill person. I had to keep it to myself. Nothing, I gasped. I leaped up, snatched the book, and hurried out of the room. In the garage, I continued reading. There was more. Trembling, I read the next revealing passage. He put his arm around Julia. Presently, she asked him if he would remove his arm. He immediately did so, with a smile. It's not said what was done with the arm after the fellow had removed it. Maybe it was left standing upright in the corner. Maybe it was thrown away. I don't care. In any case, the full meaning was there, staring me right in the face. Here was a race of creatures capable of removing portions of their anatomy at will. Eyes, arms, and maybe more. Without batting an eyelash. My knowledge of biology came in handy at this point. Obviously, they were simple beings. Unicellular. Some sort of primitive, single-celled things. Beings no more developed than starfish. Starfish can do the same thing, you know. I read on, and came to this incredible revelation, tossed off coolly by the author, without the faintest tremor. Outside the movie theater, we split up. Part of us went inside, part over to the cafe for dinner. Binary fission, obviously. Splitting in half and forming two entities. Probably... Each lower half went to the cafe, it being farther, and the upper halves to the movies. I read on, hands shaking. I had really stumbled onto something here. My mind reeled as I made out this passage. I'm afraid there's no doubt about it. Poor Bibney has lost his head again. Which was followed by, and Bob says he has utterly no guts. Yet, Bibney got around as well as the next person. The next person, however, was just as strange. He was soon described as totally lacking in brains. There was no doubt of the thing in the next passage. Julia, whom I had thought to be the one normal person, reveals herself as also being an alien life form, similar to the rest. Quite deliberately, Julia had given her heart to the young man. It didn't relate what the final disposition of the organ was, but I didn't really care. It was evident Julia had gone right on living in her usual manner, like all the others in the book. Without heart, arms, eyes, brains, viscera, dividing up in two when the occasion demanded, without a qualm. Thereupon she gave him her hand. I sickened. The rascal now had her hand as well as her heart. I shudder to think what he's done with them by this time. He took her arm. Not content to wait, he had to start dismantling her on his own. Flushing crimson, I slammed the book shut and leaped to my feet. But not in time to escape one last reference to those carefree bits of anatomy whose travels had originally thrown me on the track. Her eyes followed him, all the way down the road and across the meadow. 
I rushed from the garage and back inside the warm house, as if the accursed things were following me. My wife and children were playing Monopoly in the kitchen. I joined them and played with frantic fervor, brow feverish, teeth chattering. I had had enough of the thing. I want to hear no more about it. Let them come on. Let them invade Earth. I don't want to get mixed up in it. I have absolutely no stomach for it. End of The Eyes Have It by Philip Kindred Dick Recording by Joe Gordon Keep Out by Frederick Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Costello. Keep Out by Frederick Brown. With no more room left on Earth and with Mars hanging up there empty of life, Somebody hit on the plan of starting a colony on the Red Planet. It meant changing the habits and physical structure of the immigrants, but that worked out fine. In fact, every possible factor was covered, except one of the flaws of human nature. Taptine is the secret of it. Adaptine, they called it first. Then it got shortened to Daptine. It let us adapt. They explained it all to us when we were 10 years old. I guess they thought we were too young to understand before then, although we knew a lot of it already. They told us just after we landed on Mars. You're home, children, the head teacher told us after we had gone into the glassite dome they'd built for us there. And he told us there'd be a special lecture for us that evening, an important one that we must all attend. And that evening he told us the whole story and the whys and wherefores. He stood up before us. He had to wear a heated spacesuit and helmet, of course, because the temperature in the dome was comfortable for us, but already freezing cold for him, and the air was already too thin for him to breathe. His voice came to us by radio from inside his helmet. Children, he said, you are home. This is Mars, the planet on which you will spend the rest of your lives. You are Martians, the first Martians. You have lived five years on Earth and another five in space. Now you will spend 10 years until you are adults in this dome. Although toward the end of that time, you'll be allowed to spend increasingly long periods outdoors. Then you'll go forth and make your own homes, live your own lives as Martians. You'll intermarry and your children will breed true. They too will be Martians. It is time you were told the history of this great experiment of which each of you is a part. Then he told us, man, he said, had first reached Mars in 1985. It had been uninhabited by intelligent life. There's plenty of plant life and a few varieties of non-flying insects. And he had found it by terrestrial standards uninhabitable. Man could survive on Mars only by living inside glassite domes and wearing space suits when he went outside of them. Except by day and the warmer seasons, it was too cold for him. The air was too thin for him to breathe and long exposure to sunlight, less filtered of rays harmful to him than on earth because of a lesser atmosphere could kill him. The plants were chemically alien to him and he could not eat them. He had to bring all his food from earth or grow it in hydroponic tanks. For 50 years, he had tried to colonize Mars and all his efforts had failed. Besides this dome, which had been built for us, there was only one other outpost, another glassite dome, much smaller and less than a mile away. 
It looked as though mankind could never spread to the other planets of the solar system beside Earth. For all of them, Mars was the least inhospitable. If he couldn't live here, there was no use even trying to colonize others. And then, in 2034, 30 years ago, a brilliant biochemist named Weymouth had discovered daptine a miracle drug that worked not on the animal or person to whom it was given, but on the progeny he conceived during a limited period of time after inoculation. He gave his progeny almost limitless adaptability to changing conditions, provided the changes were made gradually. Dr. Weymouth had inoculated and then mated a pair of guinea pigs. They had borne a litter of five, and by placing each member of the litter under different and gradually changing conditions, he had obtained amazing results. When they attained maturity, one of those guinea pigs was living comfortably at a temperature of 40 below zero Fahrenheit. Another was quite happy at 150 above. A third was thriving on a diet that would have been deadly poison for an ordinary animal and a fourth was contented under a constant x-ray bombardment that would have killed one of its parents within minutes. Subsequent experiments with many litters showed that animals who had been adapted to similar conditions bred true and their progeny was conditioned from birth to live under those conditions. Ten years later, ten years ago, the head teacher told us, you children were born. Born of parents carefully selected from those who volunteered for the experiment. And from birth, you have been brought up under carefully controlled and gradually changing conditions. From the time you were born, the air you have breathed has been very gradually thinned and its oxygen content reduced. Your lungs have compensated by becoming much greater in capacity, which is why your chests are so much larger than those of your teachers and attendants. When you are fully mature and are breathing air like that of Mars, the difference will be even greater. Your bodies are growing fur to enable you to stand the increasing cold. You are comfortable now under conditions which would kill ordinary people quickly. Since you were four years old, your nurses and teachers have had to wear special protection to survive conditions that would seem normal to you. In another 10 years at maturity, you will be completely acclimated to Mars. Its air will be your air. Its food plants, your food. Its extremes of temperature will be easy for you to endure and its median temperatures pleasant to you. Already, because of the five years we spent in space under gradually decreased gravitational pull, the gravity of Mars seems normal to you. It will be your planet to live on and to populate. You are the children of Earth but you are the first Martians. Of course, we had known a lot of those things already. The last year was the best. By then the air inside the dome, except for the pressurized parts where our teachers and attendants live, was almost like that outside. And we were allowed out for increasingly long periods. It is good to be in the open. The last few months, they relaxed segregation of the sexes so we could begin choosing mates. Although they told us there is to be no marriage until after the final day, after our full clearance. Choosing was not difficult in my case. I had made my choice long since, and I'd felt sure that she felt the same way. I was right. Tomorrow is the day of our freedom. Tomorrow we will be Martians, the Martians. Tomorrow we shall take over the planet. 
Some among us are impatient, have been impatient for weeks now, but wiser counsel prevailed and we are waiting. We have waited 20 years and we can wait until the final day. And tomorrow is the final day. Tomorrow, at a signal, we will kill the teachers and the other earthmen among us before we go forth. They do not suspect, so it will be easy. We have dissimulated for years now, and they do not know how we hate them. They do not know how disgusting and hideous we find them with their ugly misshapen bodies, so narrow-shouldered and tiny-chested, their weak, sibilant voices that need amplification to carry in our Martian air, and above all their white, pasty, hairless skins. We shall kill them, and then we shall go and smash the other dome so all the Earthmen there will die too. If more Earthmen ever come to punish us, we can live and hide in the hills where they'll never find us. And if they try to build more domes here, we'll smash them. We want no more to do with Earth. This is our planet, and we want no aliens. Keep off. End of Keep Out by Frederick Brown. I'll Kill You Tomorrow by Helen Huber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carmen Stewart. I'll Kill You Tomorrow by Helen Huber. It was not a sinister silence. No silence is sinister until it acquires a background of understandable menace. Here there was only the night quiet of maternity, the silence of noiseless rubber heels on the hospital corridor floor the faint brush of starched white skirts brushing through doorways into darkened and semi-darkened rooms. But there was something wrong with the silence in the basket room of maternity, the glass-walled room containing row on row the tiny hopes of tomorrow. The curtain was drawn across the window through which, during visiting hours, peered the proud fathers who did the hoping. The night light was dim. The silence should not have been there. Lori Kane, standing in the doorway, looked out over the rows of silent baskets and felt her blonde hair tighten at the roots. The tightening came from instinct, even before her brain had a chance to function, from the instincts and training of a registered nurse. Thirty-odd babies grouped in one room, and complete silence. Not a single whimper, not one tiny cry of protest against the annoying phenomenon of birth. Thirty babies, dead? That was the thought that flashed unbidden into Lori's pretty head. The absurdity of it followed swiftly, and Lori moved on rubber heels between a line of baskets. She bent down and explored with practiced fingers. A warm living bundle in a white basket. The feeling of relief was genuine. Relief, even from an absurdity, is a welcome thing. Lori smiled and bent closer. Staring up at Lori from the basket were two clear blue eyes. Two eyes, steady and fixed in a round baby face. An immobile pink baby face housing two blue eyes that stared up into Lori's with a quiet concentration that was chilling. Lori said, What's the matter with you? She spoke in a whisper and was addressing herself. She'd gone short on sleep lately, the only way really to get a few hours with Pete. Pete was an intern at General Hospital and the kind of a homely grinning carrot top a girl like Lori could put into dreams as the center of a satisfactory future. But all this didn't justify a case of the jitters in the basket room. Lori said, Hi, short stuff, and lifted baby Newcomb out of his crib for a cuddling. Baby Newcomb didn't object. The blue eyes came closer, the weak old eyes with the hundred-year-old look. Lori laid the bundle over her shoulder and smiled into the dimness. You want to be president, Shorty. Lori felt the warmth of a new life, felt the body wriggling in snug contentment. I wouldn't advise it. Tough job. Baby Newcomb twisted in his blanket. Lori stiffened. Snug contentment? Lori felt two tiny hands clutch and dig into her throat, not just pawing baby hands little fingers that reached and explored for her windpipe. She uncuddled the soft bundle, held it out. There were the eyes. She chilled. No imagination here, no specter from lack of sleep. An ancient murder hatred glowing in newborn eyes. Careful, you fool. You'll drop this body. A thin piping voice, a shrill symphony in malevolence. Fear weakened Lori. She found a chair and sat down, 
She held the baby boy in her hands. Training would not allow her to drop baby Newcomb. Even if she had fainted, she would not have let go. The shrill voice. It was stupid of me, very stupid. Lori was cold, sick, mute. Very stupid. These hands are too fragile. There are no muscles in the arms. I couldn't have killed you. Please, I... Dreaming? No. I'm surprised. At well, your surprise. You have a trained mind. You should have learned long ago to trust your senses. I don't understand. Don't look at the doorway. Nobody's coming in. Look at me. Give me a little attention, and I'll explain. Explain? Lori pulled her eyes down to the cherubic little face as she parroted dully. I'll begin by reminding you that there are more things in existence than your obscene medical books tell you about. Who are you? What are you? One of those things. You're not a baby. Of course not, I'm. The beastly brittle voice drifted into silence as though halted by an intruding thought. Then the thought voiced, voiced with a yearning at once pathetic and terrible. It would be nice to kill you. Someday I will. Someday I'll kill you if I can find you. Why? Why? Insane words in an insane world, but life had not stopped, even though madness had taken over. Why? The voice was matter-of-fact again. No more time for pleasant daydreams. I'm something your books didn't tell you about. Naturally, you're bewildered. Did you ever hear of a bodiless entity? Lori shuddered in silence. You've heard of bodiless entities? You've heard of bodiless entities, of course, but you denied their existence in your smug world of precise, tidy detail. I'm a bodiless entity. I'm one of a swarm. We come from a dimension your mind wouldn't accept, even if I explained it. So I'll save words. We of the swarm seek unfoldment, fulfillment, even as you in your stupid, blind world. Do you want to hear more? I, you're a fool, but I enjoy practicing with these new vocal cords just as I enjoyed flexing the fingers and muscles. That's why I revealed myself. We are, basically, of course, parasites. In the dimension where we exist in profusion, evolution has provided for us. There, we seek out and move into a dimensional entity far more intelligent than yourself. We destroy it in a way you wouldn't understand. And it is not important that you should. In fact, I can't see what importance there is in your existing at all. You plan to kill all these babies? Let me congratulate you. You finally managed to voice an intelligent question. The answer is, no. We aren't strong enough to kill them. We dwelt in a far more delicate dimension than this one, and all was in proportion. That was our difficulty when we came here. We could find no entities weak enough to take possession of until we came upon this room full of infants. Then, if you're helpless, what do we plan to do? That's quite simple. These material entities will grow. We will remain attached ingrained, so to speak, when the bodies enlarge sufficiently. Thirty potential assassins. Lori spoke again to herself, then hurled the words back into her own mind as her sickness deepened. The shrill chirping. What do you mean, potential? The word expresses a doubt. Here there is none. The entity's chuckle sounded like a baby content over a full bottle. Thirty certain assassins. But why must you kill? Lori was sure the tiny shoulders shrugged. Why? I don't know. I never thought to wonder. Why must you join with a man and propagate some day? Why do you feel sorry for what you term as an unfortunate? Explain your instincts, and I'll explain mine. Lori felt herself rising. As she did so, a ripple of shrill, jerky laughter crackled through the room. Lori put her hands to her ears. You know I can't say anything. You'd keep quiet. They'd call me mad. Precisely. Malicious laughter like driven sleep cut into her ears as she fled from the room. Peter Larchmont, M.D., was smoking a quick cigarette by an open fire escape door on the third floor. He turned as Lori came down the corridor, flipping his cigarette down into the alley and grinned. Women shouldn't float on rubber heels, he said. A man should have warning. Lori came close. Kiss me. Kiss me hard. Peter kissed her, then held her away. You're trembling. Anticipation, pet? He looked into her face and the grin faded. Lori, what is it? Pete, Pete, I'm crazy. I've gone mad. Hold me. He could have laughed, but he looked closely into her eyes, and he was a doctor. He didn't laugh. Tell me. Just stand here. I'll hang on to you, and you tell me. The babies. They've gone mad. She clung to him. Not exactly that. 
Something's taken them over. Something terrible. Oh, Pete, nobody would believe me. I believe the end result, he said quietly. That's what I'm for, Angel. When you shake like this, I'll always believe. But I'll have to know more, and I'll hunt for an answer. There isn't any answer, Pete, I know. We'll still look. Tell me more first. There isn't any more. Her eyes widened as she stared into his with the shock of a new thought. Oh, Lord, one of them talked to me. But maybe he, or it, won't talk to you. Then you'll never know for sure. You'll think I'm... Stop it. Quit predicting what I'll do. Let's go to the nursery. They went to the nursery and stayed there for three quarters of an hour. They left with the tiny laughter filling their minds and the last words of the monstrous entity. We'll say no more, of course. Perhaps even this incident has been indiscreet. But it's in the form of a celebration. Never before has a whole swarm gotten through. Only a single entity on rare occasions. Pete leaned against the corridor wall and wiped his face with the sleeve of his jacket. We're the only ones who know, he said. Or ever will know. Lori pushed back a lock of his curly hair. She wanted to kiss him, but this didn't seem to be the place or the time. We can never tell anyone. We'd look foolish. We've got a horror on our hands, and we can't pass it on. What are we going to do? Lori asked. I don't know. Let's recap a little. Got a cigarette? They went to the fire door and dragged long and deep on two from Lori's pack. They'll be quiet from now on. No more talking, just baby squalls. And thirty little assassins will go into thirty homes, Lori said. All dressed in soft pink and blue, all filled with hatred, waiting, biding their time, growing more clever. She shuddered. The electric chair will get them all eventually. But how many will they get in the meantime? Pete put his arms around her and drew her close and whispered into her ear, There's nothing we can do. Nothing. We've got to do something. Lori heard the thin, brittle laughter following her, taunting her. It was a bad dream. It didn't happen. We'll just have to sleep it off. She put her cheek against his. The rising stubble of his beard scratched her face. She was grateful for the rough touch of solid reality. Pete said, the shock will wear out of our minds. Time will pass. After a while, we won't believe it ourselves. That's what I'm afraid of. It's got to be that way. We've got to do something. Peter lowered his arm wearily. Yeah, we've got to do something, where there's nothing that can be done. What are we, miracle workers? We've got to do something. Sure, finish out the watch and then get some sleep. Lori awoke with the lowering sun in her window. It was a blood-red sun. She picked up the phone by her bedside. Room 307, residence extension. Peter answered drowsily. Lori said, Tell me, did I dream, or did it really happen? I was going to ask you the same thing. I guess it happened. What are you doing? Lying in bed. So am I. But two different beds? Things are done all wrong. Want to take a chance and sneak over? I've got an illegal coffee pot. Leave the door unlocked. Lori put on the coffee. She showered and got into her slip. She was brushing her hair when Pete came in. He looked at her and extended, beckoning, clutching fingers. The hell with phantoms. Come here. After a couple of minutes, Lori pulled away and poured the coffee. She reached for her uniform. Pete said, Don't put it on yet. Too dangerous. Leaving it off. He eyed her dreamily. I'll dredge up willpower. I'll also get scads of fat, rich clients. Then we'll get married so I can assault you legally. Lori studied him. You're not even listening to yourself. What is it, Pete? What have you dreamed up? Okay, I've got an idea. You said something would have to be done. What? A drastic cure for a drastic case, with maybe disaster as the end product. Tell me. I'll tell you a little, but not too much. Why not all? Because if we ever land in court, I want you to be able to say under oath, he didn't tell me what he planned to do. I don't like that. I don't care if you like it or not. Tell me, what's the one basic thing that stands out in your mind about these entities? That they're... Fragile? Yes, fragile. Give me some more coffee. Lori demanded to know what was in Pete's mind. All she got was kissed, and she did not see Pete again until 11 o'clock that night. He found her in the corridor in maternity and motioned her toward the nursery. He carried a tray under a white towel. He said, 
You watch the door. I'm going inside. I'll be about half an hour. What are you going to do? You stay out here and mind your business. Your business will be to steer any noisy party away. If you can't, make noise coming in. Doc Pete turned away and entered the nursery. Lori stood at the doorway, in the silence, under the brooding nightlight, and prayed. Twenty-five minutes later, Pete came out. His face was white and drawn. He looked like a man who had lately had a preview of Hell's inverted pleasures. His hands trembled. The towel still covered the tray. He said, Watch them close. Don't move ten steps from here. He started away. Turn back. All hell is scheduled to break loose in this hospital shortly. Let's hope God remains in charge. Lori saw the sick dread of his heart underneath his words. It could have been a major scandal. An epidemic of measles on the maternity floor of a modern hospital indicates the unforgivable medical sin, carelessness. It was hushed up as much as possible, pending the time when the top people could shake off the shock and recover their wits. The ultimate recovery of 30 babies was a tribute to everyone concerned. Juan, done in, Doc Pete drank coffee in Lori's room. Lori gave him three lumps of sugar and said, But are you sure the sickness killed the entities? Quite sure. Somehow they knew when I made the injections. They screamed. They knew they were done for. It took courage. Tell me, why are you so strong, so brave? Why are you so wonderful? Cut it out. I was scared stiff. If one baby had died, I'd have gone through life weighing the cure against the end. It isn't easy to risk doing murder, however urgent the need. She leaned across and kissed him. And you were all alone. You wouldn't let me help. Was that fair? He grinned, then sobered. But I can't help remembering what that, that invisible monster said. Never before has a whole swarm gotten through only a single entity on rare occasions. I can't help wondering what happens to those single entities. I think of the newspaper headlines I've seen. Child kills parent in sleep. Youth slays father. I'll probably always wonder. And I'll always remember. Lori got up and crossed to him and put her arms around him. Not always, she whispered. There will be times when I'll make you forget. For a little while, anyhow. End of I'll Kill You Tomorrow, recorded by Carmen Stewart. Longevity by Therese Windsor This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz Longevity by Therese Windsor a morality tale 1960 style legend had it that many thousands of years ago right after the great horror the whole continent of the west had slowly sunk beneath the west water and that once every century it arose during a full moon still captain henrik clung to the hope that the legend would not be borne out by truth perhaps the west continent still existed perhaps dare he hope with civilization the crew of the semilunis thought him quite mad after all hadn't the east and south continents been completely annihilated from the great sky fires and wasn't it said that they had suffered but a fraction of what the west continent had endured the semilunis anchored at the mouth of a great river the months of fear and doubt were at end here at last was the west continent a small party of scouts was sent ashore with many cautions to be alert for luminescent areas which meant certain death for those who remained too long in its vicinity armed with bow and arrow the party made its way slowly up the great river nowhere was to be seen the color green only dull browns and grays and no sign of life save for an occasional patch of lichen on a rock after several days of rowing the food and water supply was almost half depleted and still no evidence of either past or present habitation it was time to turn back to travel all the weary months across the west water the journey all in vain what a small reward for such an arduous trip just proof of the existence of a barren landmass ugly and useless on the second day of the return to the semilunis the scouting party decided to stop and investigate a huge opening in the rocky mountainside 
how suspiciously regular and even it looked particularly in comparison to the rest of the countryside which was jagged and chaotic they entered the cave apprehensively torches aflare and weapons in hand but all was darkness and quiet still the regularity of the cave walls led them on some creature man or otherwise must have planned and built this but to what end now the cave divided into three forks the torches gave only a hint of the immensity of the chambers that lay at the end of each they selected the center chamber approaching cautiously breath caught in awe and excitement the torches reflected on a dull black surface which was divided into many many little squares the sameness of them stretched for uncountable yards in all directions what were these ungodly looking edifices the black surface was cold and smooth to the touch and quite regular except for a strange little hole at the bottom of each square and a curious row of pictures along the top they would copy these strange pictures perhaps back home there would be a scholar who would understand the meaning behind these last remains of the people of the west continent the leader took out his slate and painstakingly copied safe guard your valuables at allegheny mountain vaults box number four five four four three five six seven eight two the end end of longevity recording by pamela krantz Missing Link by Frank Herbert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Green, Lancashire, UK. Missing Link by Frank Herbert. "'We ought to scrape this planet clean of every living thing on it,' muttered Umbo Stetson, section chief of investigation and adjustment. Stetson paced the landing control bridge of his scout cruiser. His footsteps grated on a floor that was the rear wall of the bridge during flight, but now the ship rested on its tail fins, all four hundred glistening red and black meters of it. The open ports of the bridge looked out on the jungle roof of Gina Three, some one hundred fifty meters below. A butter-yellow sun hung above the horizon, perhaps an hour from setting. "'Clean as an egg!' he barked. He paused in his round of the bridge, glared out of the starboard port, spat into the fire-blackened circle that the cruiser's jets had burned from the jungle. The I.A. section chief was dark-haired, gangling, with large head and big features. He stood in his customary slouch, a stance not improved by sack-like patched blue fatigues. Although on this present operation he rated the flag of a division admiral, his fatigues carried no insignia. There was a general unkempt, straggling look about him. Lewis Orne, junior I.A. fieldman, with a maiden diploma, stood at the opposite port, studying the jungle horizon. Now and then he glanced at the bridge control console, the chronometer above it, the big translite map of their position tilted from the opposite bulkhead. A heavy planet native, he felt vaguely uneasy on this Gina Three, with its gravity of only seven-eighths Terran standard. The surgical scars on his neck, where the micro-communications equipment had been inserted, itched maddeningly. He scratched. Ha! said Stetson. Politicians! A thin black insect with shell-like wings flew in Orne's port, settled in his close-cropped red hair. Orne pulled the insect gently from his hair and released it. Again it tried to land in his hair. He ducked. It flew across the bridge, out the port beside Stetson. There was a thick-muscled, no-fat look to Orne, but something about his blocky, off-center features suggested a clown. 
I'm getting tired of waiting, he said. You're tired, ha! A breeze rippled the tops of the green ocean below them. Here and there red and purple flowers jutted from the verdure, bending and nodding like an attentive audience. "'Just look at that blasted jungle!' barked Stetson. "'Them and their stupid orders!' A call-bell tinkled on the bridge control console. The red light above the speaker grid began blinking. Stetson shot an angry glance at it. "'Yeah, Hal?' "'Okay, Stet. Orders just came through. We use Plan C. Comgo says to brief the field man and jet out of here. Did you ask them about using another field man? Orne looked up attentively. The speaker said, Yes. They said we have to use Orne because of the records on the Delphinus. Well then, will they give us more time to brief him? Negative. It's crash priority. Comgo expects to blast the planet anyway. Stetson glared at the grid. Those fat-headed, lard-bottomed, pig-brained politicians! He took two deep breaths, subsided. OK, tell them we'll comply. One more thing, Stet. What now? I've got a confirmed contact. Instantly Stetson was poised on the balls of his feet, alert. Where? About ten kilometers out, section AAB6. How many? A mob. You want I should count them? No. What they're doing? Making a bee line for us. You better get a move on. Okay. Keep us posted. Right. Stetson looked across at his junior fieldman. Orn, if you decide you want out of this assignment, you just say the word. I'll back you to the hilt. Why should I want out of my first field assignment? Listen and find out. Stetson crossed to a tilt locker behind the big translite map, hauled out a white coverall uniform with gold insignia, tossed it to Orne. Get into these while I brief you on the map. But this is an R&R &R unit, began Orne. Get that uniform on your ugly frame. Yes, sir, Admiral Stetson, sir. Right away, sir. But I thought I was through with old rediscovery and re-education when you drafted me off Hamal into the IA. Sir, he began changing from the IA blue to the R&R &R white. Almost as an afterthought, he said, Sir. A wolfish grin cracked Stetson's big features. I'm so happy you have the proper attitude of subservience toward authority. Orne zipped up the coverall uniform. Oh, yes, sir. Sir. OK, Orne. Pay attention. Stetson gestured at the map with its green superimposed grid squares. Here we are. Here's that city we flew over on our way down. You'll head for it as soon as we drop you. The place is big enough that if you hold a course roughly northeast, you can't miss it. We're... Again, the call bell rang. What is it this time, Hal? barked Stetson. They've changed to Plan H, Stet. New orders cut. Five days? That's all they can give us. Gomgo says he can't keep the information out of High Commissioner Ballone's hands any longer than that. Oh, it's five days for sure, then. Is this the usual R&R &R foul-up? asked Orne. Stetson nodded. Thanks to Ballone and company. We're just one jump ahead of catastrophe. But they still pump the bushwah into the R&R &R boys back at dear old Uni Galacta. You're making light of my revered alma mater, said Orne. He struck a pose. We must reunite the lost planets with our centers of culture and industry, and take up the glorious onward march of mankind that was so brutally can it, snapped Stetson. We both know we're going to rediscover one planet too many some day. Rim war all over again. But this is a different breed of fish. It's not, repeat, not a re-discovery. Born sobered. Alien? Yes, A-L-I-E-N, a never-before-contacted culture. 
That language you were force-fed on the way over, that's an alien language. It's not complete. All we have off the minis, and we excluded data on the natives because we've been hoping to dump this project and nobody the wiser. Holy mazoo! Twenty-six days ago, an IA search ship came through here, had a routine mini-sneaker look at the place. When he combed in his net of sneakers to check the tapes and films, lo and behold, he had a little stranger. One of theirs? No, it was a mini of the Delphinus rediscovery. The Delphinus has been unreported for eighteen standard months. Did it crack up here? We don't know. If it did, we haven't been able to spot it. She was supposed to be way off in the Ballandine system by now, but with something else on her minds. It's the one item that makes me want to blot out this place and run home with my tail between my legs. We've a... Again the call bell chimed. Now what? roared Stetson into the speaker. I've got a mini over that mob, Stet. They're talking about us. It's a definite raiding party. What armament? Too gloomy in that jungle, to be sure. The infrabeam's out on this mini. Looks like hard pellet rifles of some kind. Might even be off the Delphinus. Can't you get closer? Wouldn't do any good. No light down there. And they're moving up fast. Keep an eye on them. But don't ignore the other sectors, said Stetson. You think I was born yesterday? barked the voice from the grid. The contact broke off with an angry sound. "'One thing I like about the I.A.' said Stetson. "'It collects such even-tempered types.' He looked at the white uniform on Orne, wiped a hand across his mouth as though he'd tasted something dirty. "'Why am I wearing this thing?' asked Orne. "'Disguise. But there's no moustache. Stetson smiled without humour. That's one of A.A.'s answers to those fat-cased politicians. We're setting up our own search system to find the planets before they do. We managed to put spies in key places at R&R. &R. Any touchy planets, our spies report, we divert the files. Then what? Then we'll look into them with bright boys like you, disguised as R&R &R field men. Goody, goody, and what happens if r, r stumbles onto me while I'm down there playing patty cake? We disown you. But you said an IA ship found this joint. It did. And then one of our spies in R&R &R intercepted a routine request for an agent instructor to be assigned here with full equipment. A request signed by a first contact officer name of Diston, of the Delphinus. But the Delt, yeah, missing. The request was a forgery. Now you see why I'm mostly for rubbing out this place. Who dare forge such a thing unless he knew for sure that the original FC officer was missing, or dead? What the jumped-up masseau are we doing here, Stet? asked Orne. Alien calls for a full contact team with all of the... It calls for one planet buster bomb buster in five days. Unless you give them a white bill in the meantime. High Commissioner Boulogne will have a word of this planet by then. If Gina Three still exists in five days, can't you imagine the fun the politicians will have with it? Mamma mia. You want this planet cleared up for contact, or dead before then? I don't like this, Stet. You don't like it! Look, said Orne. There must be another way. Why, when we teamed up with the Alarinoids, we gained five hundred years in the physical sciences alone. Not to mention it, the Alarinoids didn't knock over one of our survey ships first. What if the Delphinus just crashed here and the locals picked up the pieces? That's what you're going in to find out, Orne. But answer me this. If they do have the Delphinus, how long before a tool-using race could be a threat to the galaxy? I saw that city they built, Stet. They could be dug in within six months, and there'd be no— Yeah. 
Orne shook his head. "But think of it! Two civilizations that matured along different lines! Think of all the different ways we'd approach the same problems! The lever that'd give us for—" "You sound like a uni galacta lecture! Are you through marching arm in arm into the misty future?" Orne took a deep breath. "Why's a freshman like me being tossed into this dish?" "You'd still be on the Delphinus Master Lists as an R&R field man. That's important if you're masquerading." "Am I the only one? I know I'm a recent convert, but—" "You want out?" "I didn't say that. I just want to know why I'm—" "Because the Big Dorms fed a set of requirements into one of their iron monsters. Your card popped out. They were looking for somebody capable, dependable, and expendable. Hey! That's why I'm down here briefing you, instead of sitting back on a flagship. I got you into the IA. Now, you listen carefully. If you push the panic button on this one without cause, I will personally fly you alive. We both know the advantages of an alien contact. But if you get into a hot spot and call for help, I'll dive this cruiser into that city to get you out." Orne swallowed. Thanks, stair time. We're going to take up a tight orbit. Out beyond us will be five transports full of IA Marines and a Class Nine Monitor with one Planet Buster. You're calling the shots, God help you. First, we want to know if they have the Delphinus. And if so, where it is? Next, we want to know just how warlike these goons are. Can we control them if they're bloodthirsty? What's their potential? In five days? Not a second more. What do we know about them? Not much. They look something like ancient Terran chimpanzee, only with blue fur. Face is hairless, pink-skinned. Stetson snapped a switch. The translite map became a screen with a figure frozen on it. Like that. This is life-size. Looks like the missing link they're always hunting for, said Orne. Yeah, but you got a different kind of a missing link. Vertical slit pupils in their eyes, said Orne. He studied the figure. It had been caught from the front by a mini-sneaker camera. About five feet tall, the stance was slightly bent forward, long arms, two vertical nose slits, a flat, lipless mouth, receding chin, four-fingered hands. It wore a wide belt from which dangled neat pouches and what looked like tools, although their use was obscure. There appeared to be the tip of a tail protruding from behind one of the squat legs. Behind the creature towered the fairy spires of the city they'd observed from the air. "'Tails?' asked Orne. "'Yeah. They're arboreal. Not a road on the whole planet that we can find. There are lots of vine lanes through the jungles.' Stetson's face hardened. "'Match that with a city as advanced as that one.' "'Slave culture?' "'Probably. How many cities have they?' "'We've found two. This one and another on the other side of the planet. But the other one's a ruin. A ruin? Why? You tell us. Lots of mysteries here. What's the planet like? Mostly jungle. There are polar oceans, lakes and rivers. One low mountain chain follows the equatorial belt about two-thirds round the planet. But only two cities, are you sure? Reasonably so. It'd be pretty hard to miss something the size of that thing we flew over. Must be fifty kilometers long, at least ten wide. Swarming with these creatures, too. We've got a zone count estimate that places the city's population at over thirty million. Phew! Those are tall buildings, too. We don't know much about this place, Orne. And unless you bring them into the fold, There'll be nothing but ashes for our archaeologists to pick over. Seems a dirty shame. I agree, but... The call bell jangled. Stetson's voice sounded tired. Yeah, Hal. That mob's only about five kilometers out, Stet. We've got Orne's gear outside in the disguised air sled. 
We'll be right down. Why a disguised sled? asked Orne. If they think it's a ground buggy, they might get careless when you most need an advantage. We could always scoop you out of the air, you know. What are my chances on this one, Stet? Stetson shrugged. I'm afraid they're slim. These goons probably have the Delphinus, and they want you just long enough to get your equipment and everything you know. Rough as that, eh? According to our best guess, if you're not out in five days, we blast. Lorne cleared his throat. Want out? asked Stetson. No. Use the back door rule, son. Always leave yourself a way out. No. Let's check that equipment the surgeon's put in your neck. Stetson put a hand to his throat. His mouth remained closed. There was a surf hissing noise in Orne's ears. You read me? Sure, I can. No, hissed the voice. Touch the mic contact. Keep your mouth closed. Just use your speaking muscles without speaking. Orne obeyed. Okay, said Stetson. You come in loud and clear. I ought to. I'm right on top of you. There'll be a relay ship over you all the time, said Stetson. No, when you're not touching that mic contact, this rig will still feed us what you see, and everything that goes on around you too. We'll monitor everything. Got that? Yes. Stetson held out his right hand. Good luck. I meant that about diving in for you. Just say the word. I know the word, too, said Orne. Help! Grey mud floor and gloomy aisles between monstrous bluish tree trunks. That was the jungle. Only the barest weak glimmering of sunlight penetrated to the mud. The disguised sled, its paragrav units turned off, lurched and skidded around the buttress roots. Its headlights swung in wild arcs across the trunks and down to the mud. Aerial creepers, great looping vines of them, swung down from the towering forest ceiling. A steady drip of condensation spattered the windshield, forcing Orne to use the wipers. In the bucket seat of the sled's cab, Orne fought the controls. He was plagued by the vague, slow-motion floating sensation that a heavy planet native always feels in lighter gravity. It gave him an unhappy stomach. Things skipped through the air around the lurching vehicle, flitting and darting things. Insects came in twin cones, siphoned towards the headlights. There was an endless chittering whistling, tock, tock, tocking in the gloom beyond the lights. Stetson's voice hissed suddenly through the surgically implanted speaker. How's it, Luke? Alien. Any sign of that mob? Negative. Okay, we're taking off. Behind Orne there came a deep rumbling roar that receded as the scout cruiser climbed its jets. All other sounds hung suspended in after silence, then resumed. The strongest first, and then the weakest. A heavy object suddenly arced through the headlights, swinging on a vine. It disappeared behind a tree. Another. Another. Ghostly shadows with vine pendulums on both sides. Something banged down heavily on the hood of the sled. Orne braked to a creaking stop that shifted the load behind him, found himself staring through the windshield at a native of Gina Three. The native crouched on the hood, a Mark XX exploding pellet rifle in his right hand directed at Orne's head. In the abrupt shock of meeting, Orne recognized the weapon, standard issue to the marine guards of on all R&R &R survey ships. The native appeared the twin of the one Orne had seen on the translite screen. The four-fingered hand looked extremely capable around the stock of the Mark XX. Slowly, Orne put a hand to his throat, pressed the contact button. He moved his speaking muscles. Just made contact with the mob. One on the hood now has one of our Mark XX rifles aimed at my head. The surf hissing of Stetson's voice came through the hidden speaker. Want us to come back? Negative. Stand by. He looks cautious rather than hostile. Orne held up his right hand, palm out. He had a second thought. 
held up his left hand too, universal symbol of peaceful intentions, empty hands. The gun muzzle lowered slightly. Orne called into his mind the language that had been hypnoforced into him. Ochiro? No, that means the people. Ah! And he had the heavy, fricative greeting sounds. Frye Grazi, he said. The native shifted to the left, answered in pure, unaccented high galactese. Who are you? Orne fought down a sudden panic. The lipless mouth had looked so odd forming the familiar words. Stetson's voice hissed. Is that the native speaking Galactese? Orne touched his throat. You heard him. He dropped his hand, said, I am Lewis Orne of Rediscovery and Re-Education. I was sent here at the request of the first contact officer on the Delphinus Rediscovery. Where is your ship? demanded the Guinean. It put me down and left. Why? It was behind schedule for another appointment. Out of the corners of his eyes, Orne saw more shadows dropping into the mud behind him. The sled shifted as someone climbed onto the load behind the cab. The someone scuttled agilely for a moment. The native climbed down to the cab's sidestep, opened the door. The rifle was held at the ready. Again the lipless mouth formed Galactese words, "'What do you carry in this... vehicle?' "'The equipment every R&R &R field man uses to help the people of a rediscovered planet improve themselves.' Or nodded at the rifle. "'Would you mind pointing that weapon some other direction? It makes me nervous.' The gun muzzle remained unwaveringly on Orne's middle. The native's mouth opened, revealing long canines. "'Do we not look strange to you?' I take it there's been a heavy mutational variation in the humanoid norm on this planet, said Orne. What is it, hard radiation? No answer. It doesn't really make any difference, of course, said Orne. I'm here to help you. I am Tanub, High Path Chief of the Grazi, said the native. I decide who is to help. Orne swallowed. Where do you go? demanded Tanub. I was hoping to go to your city. Is it permitted?" A long pause, while the vertical slit pupils of Tanub's eyes expanded and contracted. "'It is permitted,' Stetson's voice came through the hidden speaker. "'All bets off. We're coming in after you. That Mark Twenty is the final straw. It means they have the Delphinus for sure!' Orne touched his throat. "'No. Give me a little more time. Why?' I have a hunch about these creatures. What is it? No time now, trust me. Another long pause in which Orne and Tanub continued to study each other. Presently Stetson said, OK, go ahead as planned, but find out where the Delphinus is. If we get that back, we pull their teeth. Why do you keep touching your throat? demanded Tanub. I'm nervous, said Orne. Guns always make me nervous. The muzzle lowered slightly. Shall we continue on to your city? asked Orne. He wet his lip with his tongue. The cab light on Tanub's face was giving the Guinean an eerie, sinister look. We can go soon, said Tanub. Will you join me inside here? asked Orne. There's a passenger seat right behind me. Tanub's eyes moved cat-like, right, left. Yes, he turned, barked an order into the jungle gloom, then climbed in behind Orne. When do we go? asked Orne. The great sun will be down soon, said Tanub. We can continue as soon as Chiran Churoso rises. Chiran Churoso? Our satellite, our moon, said Tanub. It's a beautiful word, said Orne. Chiran Charuso. In our tongue it means the limb of victory, said Tanub. By its light we will continue. Orne turned, looked back at Tanub. Do you mean to tell me that you can see by what light gets down here through those trees? 
"Can you not see?" asked Tanub. "Not without the headlights." "Our eyes differ," said Tanub. He bent toward Orne, peered. The vertical slit pupils of his eyes expanded, contracted. "You are the same as ... the ... others." "Oh. On the _Delphinus_?" Pause. "Yes." Presently a greater gloom came over the jungle, bringing a sudden stillness to the wild life. There was a chittering commotion from the natives in the trees around the sled. Tanub shifted behind Orne. "We may go now," he said. "Slowly. To stay behind my ... scouts." "Right." Orne eased the sled forward around an obstructing root. Silence while they crawled ahead. Around them, shapes flung themselves from vine to vine. "'I admired your city from the air,' said Orne. "'It is very beautiful.' "'Yes,' said Tanub. "'Why did you land so far from it?' "'We didn't want to come down where we might destroy anything.' "'There is nothing to destroy in the jungle.' said Tanub. "'Why do you have such a big city?' asked Orne. Silence. "'I said, why do you—' "'You are ignorant of our ways,' said Tanub. "'Therefore I forgive you. The city is for our race. We must breed and be born in sunlight. Once, long ago, we used crude platforms on the tops of the trees. Now only—' The wild ones do this." Stetson's voice hissed in Orne's ears. "'Easy on the sex line, boy. That's always touchy. These creatures are oviparous. Sex glands are apparently hidden in that long fur behind where their chins ought to be.' "'Who controls the breeding site controls our world,' said Tanub. "'Once there was another city. We destroyed it. "'Are there many wild ones?' asked Orne. "'Fewer each year,' said Tanub. "'That's how they get their slaves,' hissed Stetson. "'You speak excellent Galactese,' said Orne. "'The High Path Chief commanded the best teacher,' said Tanub. "'Do you two know many things, Orne?' "'That's why I was sent here,' said Orne. "'Are there many planets to teach?' asked Tanub. "'Very many,' said Orne. "'Your city. I saw very tall buildings. Of what do you build them?' "'In your tongue, glass,' said Tanub. "'The engineers of the Delphinus said it was impossible. As you saw, they are wrong.' "'A glass-blowing culture,' hissed Stetson. "'That would explain a lot of things.' Slowly the disguised sled crept through the jungle. Once a scout swooped down into the headlights and waved. Orne stopped on Tanub's order, and they waited almost ten minutes before proceeding. "'Wild ones?' asked Orne. "'Perhaps,' said Tanub. A glowing of many lights grew visible through the giant tree trunks. It grew brighter as the sled crept through the last of the jungle, emerged in cleared land at the edge of the city. Orne stared upward in awe. The city fluted and spiralled into the moonlit sky. It was a fragile appearing lacery of bridges, winking dots of light. The bridges wove back and forth from building to building, until the entire visible network appeared to be one gigantic dew-glittering web. "'All that with glass?' muttered Orne. "'What's happening?' hissed Stetson. Orne touched his throat contact. "'We're just into the city clearing, proceeding towards the nearest building.' "'This is far enough,' said Tanub. Orne stopped the sled. In the moonlight he could see armed Guineans all around. The buttressed pedestal of one of the buildings loomed directly ahead. It looked taller than had the scout cruiser in its jungle landing circle. Tanub leaned close to Orne's shoulder. "'We have not deceived you, have we, Orne?' "'Eh? What do you mean?' 
you have recognized that we are not mutated members of your race? Horn swallowed into his ears came Stetson's voice. Better admit it. That's true, said Orn. I like you, Orn, said Tanub. You shall be one of my slaves. You will teach me many things. How did you capture the Delphinus? asked Orn. You know that, too? You have one of their rifles, said Orn. Your race is no match for us, Orn. In cunning, in strength, in the prowess of the mind, your ship landed to repair its tubes, very inferior ceramics in those tubes. Orn turned, looked at Tanub in the dim glow of the cab light. Have you heard about the I.A., Tanub? I.A.? What is that? There was a wary tenseness in the Guinean's figure. His mouth opened to reveal the long canines. "'You took the Delphinus by treachery?' asked Orne. "'They were simple fools,' said Tanub. "'We are smaller. Thus they thought us weaker.' The Mark Twenty's muzzle came around to center on Orne's stomach. "'You have not answered my question. What is the I.A.?' I am of the I.A., said Orne. Where have you hidden the Delphinus? In the place that suits us best, said Tanub. In all our history there has never been a better place. What do you plan to do with it? asked Orne. Within a year we will have a copy, with our own improvements. After that— You intend to start a war? asked Orne. In the jungle the strong slay the weak, until only the strong remain, said Tanub. And then the strong prey upon each other, asked Orne. That is a quibble for women, said Tanub. It's too bad you feel that way, said Orne. When two cultures meet like this, they tend to help each other. What have you done with the crew of the Delphinus? They are slaves, said Tanub, those who still live. Some resisted. Others objected to teaching us what we want to know. He waved the gun muzzle. You will not be that foolish, will you, Orne? No need to be, said Orne. I've another little lesson to teach you. I already know where you've hidden the Delphinus. Go, boy, hissed Stetson. Where is it? Impossible, barked Tanner. It's on your moon, said Orne. Dark side. It's on a mountain on the dark side of your moon. Tanub's eyes dilated, contracted. You read minds? The I.A. has no need to read minds, said Orne. We rely on superior mental prowess. The marines are on their way, hissed Stetson. We're coming in to get you. I'm going to want to know how you guessed that one. You are a weak fool like the others, gritted Tanub. It's too bad you formed your opinion of us by observing only the low grades of the R&R, &R, said Orne. Easy boy, hissed Stetson. Don't pick a fight with him now. Remember, his race is arboreal. He's probably as strong as an ape. I could kill you where you sit, grated Tanub. You write finish for your entire planet if you do, said Orne. I'm not alone. There are others listening to every word we say. There's a ship overhead that could split open your planet with one bomb. Wash it with molten rock. It'd run like the glass you use for your buildings. You are lying! We'll make you an offer, said Orne. We don't really want to exterminate you. We'll give you limited membership in the Galactic Federation until you prove you're no menace to us. Keep talking, hissed Stetson. Keep him interested. "'You dare insult me?' growled Tanub. "'You'd better believe me,' said Orne. "'We—' Stetson's voice interrupted it. "'Got it, Orne. They caught the Delphinus on the ground right where you said it would be. Blew the tubes off it. Marines now mopping up.' "'It's like this,' said Orne. "'We already have recaptured the Delphinus.' Tanub's eyes went instinctively skyward. "'Except for the captured armament you still hold, you obviously don't have the weapons to meet us.' continued Orne. Otherwise, you wouldn't be carrying that rifle off the Delphinus. "'If you speak the truth, then we shall die bravely,' said Tanub. 
No need for you to die, said Orne. Better to die than be slaves, said Tanub. We don't need slaves, said Orne. We... I cannot take the chance that you are lying, said Tanub. I must kill you now. Orne's foot rested on the air sled control pedal. Instantly the sled shot skyward, heavy G's pressing them down into the seats. The gun in Tanub's hands was slammed into his lap. He struggled to raise it. To Orne, the weight was still only about twice that of his home planet of Shargon. He reached over, took the rifle, found safety belts, bound Tanub with them. Then he eased off the acceleration. "'We don't need slaves,' said Orne. "'We have machines to do our work. We send experts in here. Teach you people how to exploit your planet, how to build good transportation facilities, show you how to mine your minerals, how to—' "'And what do we do in return?' whispered Tanub. "'You could start by teaching us how you make superior glass,' said Orne. "'I certainly hope you see things our way. We really don't want to have to come down here and clean you out. It'd be a shame to have to blast that city into little pieces.' Tanub wilted. Presently he said, "'Send me back. I will discuss this with our council,' he stared at Orne. "'You IAs are too strong. We did not know. In the wardroom of Stetson's scout cruiser, the lights were low, the leather chairs comfortable, the green beige table set with a decanter of Hocar brandy and two glasses. Orne lifted his glass, sipped the liquor, smacked his lips. For a while there I thought I'd never be tasting anything like this again. Stetson took his own glass. Congo heard the whole thing over the general monitor net, he said. Do you know you've been breveted to senior field man? Ah, they've already recognized my sterling worth, said Orne. The wolfish grin took over Stetson's big features. Senior field men last about half as long as the juniors, he said. Mortality's terrific. I might have known, said Orne. He took another sip of the brandy. Stetson flicked on the switch of a recorder beside him. OK, you can go ahead any time. Where do you want me to start? First, how do you spot right away where they'd hidden the Delphinus? Easy. Tanub's word for his people was Grazi. Most races call themselves something meaning the people. But in his tongue, that's Ochiro. Grazi wasn't on the translated list. I started working on it. The most likely answer was that it had been adopted from another language and meant enemy. And that told you where the Delphinus was? No, but it fitted my hunch about these Guineans. I'd kind of felt from the first minute of meeting them that they had a culture like the Indians of ancient terror. Why? They came in like a primitive raiding party. The leader dropped right onto the hood of my sled. An act of bravery, no less. Counting coup, you see. I guess so. Then he said he was the High Path Chief. That wasn't on the language list either, but it was easy. Raider Chief. There's a word in almost every language in history that means raider, and derives from the word for road, path or highway. Highwaymen, said Stetson. Raid itself, said Orne. An ancient Terran language corruption of road. Yeah, yeah, but where's all this translation griff? But... Don't be impatient. Glass-blowing culture meant they were just out of the primitive stage. That we could control. Next he said their moon was Chiranchurasa, translated as the limb of victory. After that it just fell into place. How? The vertical slit pupils of their eyes. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Maybe. What's it mean to you? night-hunting predator, accustomed to dropping upon its victims from above. No other type of creature ever has the vertical slit. And Tanub said himself that the Delphinus was hidden in the best place in all of their history. History? That'd be a high place, dark. Likewise, ergo, a high place on the dark side of their moon. I'm a pie-eyed Grepus, whispered Stetson. Orne grinned, said, you probably are, sir. End of Missing Link by Frank Herbert
written by T. D. Ham. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Native Son by T. D. Ham. Tommy hated Earth, knowing his mother might go home to Mars without him. Worse, would a robot secretly take her place? Tommy Benton, on his first visit to Earth, found the long-anticipated wonders of 21st century New York thrilling the first week, boring and unhappy the second week, and at the end of the third, he was definitely ready to go home. The never-ending racket of traffic was tortured to his abnormally acute ears, increased atmospheric pressure did funny things to his chest and stomach, and quick and sure-footed on Mars, he struggled constantly against the heavy gravity that made all his movements clumsy and uncoordinated. The endless canyons of towering buildings, with their connecting skywalks, oppressed and smothered him. Remembering the endless vistas of Rabara fields beside a canal that was like an inland sea, homesickness flooded over him. He hated the people who stared at him with either open or hidden amusement. His Aunt B, for instance, who looked him up and down with frank disapproval and said loudly, For heaven's sake, Helen, take him to a good tailor and get those bones covered up. Was it his fault he was six inches taller than Terran boys his age, and had long thin arms and legs, or that his chest was abnormally developed to compensate for an oxygen-thin atmosphere? I would like to see her, he thought fiercely, out on the flatlands. She would be gasping like a cannel fish out of water. Even his parents, happily riding the social merry-go-round of Terra, after eleven years in the Martian flatlands, didn't seem to understand how he felt. Don't you like Earth, Tommy? queried his mother anxiously. Oh, it's all right, I guess. A nice place to visit, said the father sardonically. But I wouldn't live here if they gave me the place, said his mother, and they both burst out laughing for no reason that Tommy could see. Of course, they did that lots of time at home, and Tommy laughed with them, just for the warm, secure feeling of belonging. This time, he didn't feel like laughing. When are we going home? He repeated stubbornly. His father pulled Tommy over in the crook of his arm and said gently, Well, not right away, son. As a matter of fact, how would you like to stay here and go to school? Tommy pulled away and looked at him incredulously. I have been to school. Well, yes, admitted his father, but only to the colony schools. You don't want to grow up and be an ignorant Martian Sandford all your life, do you? Yes, I do. I want to be a Martian Sandford, and I want to go home where people don't look at me and say, So this is your little Martian. Benton Sr., put his arm around Tommy's stiffly resistant shoulders. Look here, old man, he said persuasively. I thought you wanted to be a space engineer. You can't do that without an education, you know. And your Aunt B will take good care of you. Tommy faced him stubbornly. I don't want to be any old spaceman. I want to be a sandfoot like old Pete, and I want to go home. Helen bit back a smile at the two earnest, stubborn faces so ridiculously alike and hastened to avert the gathering storm. Now look, fellows, Tommy's career doesn't have to be decided in the next few minutes. After all, he's only ten. He can make up his mind later on if he wants to be an engineer or a rabbara farmer. Right now, he's going to stay here and go to school and I am staying with him. Resolutely avoiding both crestfallen faces, Helen, having shepherded Tommy to bed, returned to the living room acutely conscious of Big Tom's bleak, hurt gaze at her back. Helen, you're going to make a sissy out of the boy, he said at last. There isn't any reason why he can't stay here at home with B. Helen turned to face him. 
Earth isn't home to Tommy, and your sister B told him he ought to be out playing football with the boys instead of hanging around the house. But she knows the doctor said he would have to take it easy for a year till he was accustomed to the change in gravity and air pressure, he answered incredulously. Exactly, she also asked me. Helen went on grimly. If I thought he would be less of a freak as he got older, Tom Benton sore. B always did have less sense than the average hen. He gritted, My son a freak? Hell's bells. Tommy, arriving at the hall door, in time to hear the tail end of the sentence, crept back to bed feeling numb and dazed. So even his father thought he was a freak. The last few days before parting was one of strain for all of them. If Tommy was unnaturally subdued, no one noticed it. His parents were not feeling any great impulse towards Katie either. They all went dutifully sightseeing as before. They saw the zoo and went shopping on the skywalks and on the last day wound up at the great showrooms of Androids Inc. Tommy had hated them on sight. They were at once too human and too inhuman for comfort. The hotel was full of them and most private homes had at least one. Now they saw the great incubating vats and the processing and finally the showroom where one of the finished products was on display as a maid, sweeping and dusting. There's one that's a dead ringer for you, Helen. If you were a little better looking, that is. Tommy's dad pretended to compare them judicially. Helen laughed. But Tommy looked at him with a resentfulness, comparing his mother to an android. They say for a little extra you can get an exact resemblance. Maybe I would better have one fixed up like you to take back with me, Big Tom added teasingly. Then as Helen's face clouded over, Oh Horn, you know I was only kidding. Let's get out of here. This place gives me the collie wobbles. Besides, I have got to pick up my watch. But his mother's face was still unhappy and Tommy glowered sullenly at his father's back all the way to the watch shop. It was a small shop with an inconspicuous sign down in one corner of the window that said only Crumbian watches and was probably the most famous shop of its kind in the world. Every spaceman landing on Terra left his watch to be checked by the dusty little old man who was the genius of the place. Tommy ranged wide-eyed about the clock and chronometer crammed interior. He stopped fascinated before the last case. In it was a watch. But what a watch! Besides a regulation Terran dial, it had a second smaller dial which registered the corresponding time on Mars. Tommy's whole heart went out to it in an ecstasy of longing. He thought wistfully that if you could know what time it was there, you could imagine what everyone was doing and it wouldn't seem so far away. Haltingly, he tried to explain. Look, Mom, he said breathlessly. It's almost five o'clock at home. Dovai will be coming up to the barn to be fed. Gosh, do you suppose old Pete will remember about her? His mother smiled at him reassuringly. Of course he will, silly. Don't forget he was the one who caught and tamed her for you. Tommy gulped as he thought of Dovey, scarcely as tall as himself, the big rounded mouse-like ears and the flat cloven pads that could carry her so swiftly over the sandy Martian flatlands, one of the last dwindling herds of native Martian Dovies burden carriers of a vanished race, she had been Tommy's particular pride and joy for the last three years. Behind him, Tommy heard his mother murmur under her breath, Tom, the watch, could we? And his dad regretfully, it's a pretty expensive toy for a youngster, Helen, and even a Rabara Razor's bank account has limits. Of course, dear, it was silly of me. Helen smiled a little ruefully. And if Mr. Crumbian has your watch ready, we must go. B and some of her friends are coming over. And it's only a few hours till you... 
leave? Big Tom squeezed her elbow gently, understandingly, as she blinked back quick tears. Trailing after them, Tommy saw the little by play and his heart ached. The guilt complex building up in him grew and deepened. He knew he had only to say, Look, I don't mind staying. Aunt B and I will get along well, and everything would be all right again. Then the terror of this new and complex world, as it would be without a familiar face, swept over him and kept him silent. His overwrought feelings expressed themselves in a nervously rebelling stomach culminating in a disgraceful moment over the nearest gutter. The rest of the afternoon he spent in bed recuperating. In the living room, Aunt B spoke her mind in her usual high-pitched voice. It's disgraceful, Helen. A boy his age? None of the Bentons ever had nerves. His mother's reply was inaudible. But on the heels of his father's deeper tones, Aunt B's voice rose in rasping indignation. Well, I never. And from my own brother too. From now on, don't come to me for help with your spoiled brat. Goodbye. The door slammed indignantly. His mother chuckled, and there was a spontaneous burst of laughter. Tommy relaxed and lay back happily. Anyway, that was the last of Aunt B. The next hour or two passed in a flurry of ringing phones, people coming and going, and last-minute words and reminders. Then suddenly it was time to leave. Dad burst in for a last quick hug and a promise to send him pictures of Dewey and her foal due next month. Mother dropped a hasty kiss on his hair and promised to hurry back from the spaceport. Then Tommy was alone with a large painful lump where his heart ought to be. The only activity was the almost noiseless buzzing as the hotel android ran the cleaner over the living room. Presently even that ceased and Tommy lay relaxed and inert, sleepily watching the curtains blow in and out at the open window. Thirty stories above the street, the noises were pleasantly muffled and remote, and his senses drifted aimlessly to and fro on the tides of half-sleep. Drowsily his mind wandered from the hotel's android servants to the strictly utilitarian mechanical monstrosity at home, known affectionately as Old John, to the android showroom where they had seen the one the dad said looked like mother. He jolted suddenly sickeningly awake. Suppose his mind whispered treacherously. Suppose that dad had ordered one to take mom's place, not on Mars, but here, while she returned to Mars with him. Suppose that instead of mom, he discovered one of those things. Or even worse, suppose he went on from day to day, not even knowing. It was a bad five minutes. He was wet with perspiration when he lay back on the pillows a shaky smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. He had a secret defense against the terror. He giggled a little at the thought of what Aunt B would say if she knew. And what had brought him back from the edge of hysteria was the triumphant knowledge that with the abnormally acute hearing bred in the thin atmosphere of Mars, no robot ever created could hide from him the infinite simul ticking of electronic relays that gave it life. Secure at last, his overstung nerves relaxed and he strayed gratefully over the edge of sleep. He woke abruptly, groping after some vaguely remembered sound, a soft clicking of heels down the hall. Of course, his mother back from the spaceport. Now she would be stopping at his door to see if he were asleep. He lay silently. Through his eyelashes, he could see her outlined in the soft light from the hall. She was coming in to see if he was tucked in. In a moment, he would jump up and startle her with a hug as she leaned over him. In a moment. Screaming desperately, he was out of bed, backing heedlessly across the room. He was still screaming as the low sill of the open window caught him behind the knees and toppled him thirty stories to the street. Alone in the silent room, Helen Benton stood dazed, staring blindly at the empty window. Tommy's parting gift from his father slid from her hand and lay on the carpet, still ticking gently. It was 9.23 on Mars. End of Native Son by T.D. Ham 
Recording by Ratan Deep Satwan Singh, Jamshedpur, India. Helped by M. A. Cummings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aurora Seymour. No Pets A Lot by M.A. Cummings. I can't tell anyone about it. In the first place, they'd never believe me, and if they did, I'd probably be punished for having her because we aren't allowed to have pets of any kind. It wouldn't have happened if they hadn't sent me way out there to work. But you see, there are so many things I can't do. I remember the day the chief of vocation took me before the council. I've tried him on a dozen things, he reported. People always talk about me as if I can't understand what they mean, but I'm really not that dumb. There doesn't seem to be a thing he can do, the chief went on. Actually, his intelligence seemed to be no greater than that which we believe our ancestors had back in the 20th century. As bad as that, observed one of the council members. You do have a problem. But we must find something for him to do, said another. We can't have an idle person in the state. It's unthinkable. But what? asked the chief. He's utterly incapable of running any of the machines. I try to teach him. The only things he can do are already being done much better by robots. There was a long silence, broken at last by one little old council member. I have it, he cried. The very thing will make him guard of the treasure. But there is no need of a guard. No one will touch the treasure without permission. We haven't had a dishonest person in the state for more than three thousand years. That's it, exactly. There aren't any dishonest people, so there won't be anything for him to do. But we will have solved the problem of his idleness. It might be a solution, said the chief. At last, a temporary one. I suppose we will have to find something else later on, but this will give us a time to look for something. So I became guard of the treasure, with a badge, and nothing to do unless you count watching the key. The gates were kept locked, just as they were in the old days, but the large key hung beside them. Of course, no one wanted to bother carrying it around. It was too heavy. The only ones who ever used it, anyway, were members of the council. As the man said, we haven't had a dishonest person in the state for thousands of years. Even I know that much. Of course, this left me lots of time on my hands. That's how I happened to get her in the first place. I'd always wanted one, but pets were forbidden. Busy people didn't have time for them. So I knew I was breaking the law, but I figured that no one would ever find out. First, I fixed a place for her and made a brush screen so that she couldn't be seen by anyone coming to the gates. Then. One night, I sneaked into the forest and got her. It wasn't so lonely after that. Now, I had something to talk to. She was small when I got her. It would be too dangerous to go a near full-grown one, but she grew rapidly. That was because I caught small animals and brought them to her. 
not having to depend on what she could catch, she grew almost twice as fast as usual and was so sleek and pretty. Really, she was a pet to be proud of. I don't know how I could have stood the four months there alone if I hadn't her to talk to. I don't think she really understood me, but I pretended she did, and that helped. Every three or four weeks, three of the council members came to take a part of the treasure or to add to it. Always three of them. That's why I was so surprised one day to see one man coming by himself. It was a gram, the little old member who had recommended that I be given this job. I was happy to see him and we talked for a while mostly about my work and how I liked it. I almost told him about my pet, but I didn't because he might be angry at me for breaking the law. Finally, he asked me to give him the key. I've been sent to get something from the treasure, he explained. I was unhappy to displease him, but I said, I can't let you have it. There must be three members you know that. Of course I knew it, but something came up suddenly, so they sent me alone. Now, let me have it. I shook my head. That was the one order they had given me. Never to give the key to any one person who came alone. Graham became quite angry. You idiot! He shouted. Why do you think I had you? put out here. It was so I could get in there and help myself to the treasure. But that would be dishonest, and there are no dishonest people in the state. For three thousand years, I know. His usually kind face had an ugly look I had never seen before. But I'm going to get a part of that treasure. And it would do you any good to report it, because no one is going to take the word of a fool like you against the respected council member. They'll think you are the dishonest one. Now, give me that key. It's a terrible thing to disobey a council member, but if I obeyed him, I would be disobeying all the others, and that would be worse. No. I shouted. He threw himself upon me. For his size and age he was very strong, stronger even than I. I fight as hard as I could, but I knew I wouldn't be able to keep him away from the key for very long. And if he took the treasure, I would be blamed. The council would have to think a new punishment for dishonesty. Whatever it was, it would be terrible indeed. He drew back and rushed at me. Just as he hit me, my foot caught upon the root and I fell. His rush carried him past me and he crushed through the brush screen beside the pot. I hear him scream twice and then there was a silence. I was bruised all over, but I managed to pull myself up and take away what was left of the screen. There was no sign of Graham, but my beautiful pet was waving her pilgrim feelers as she always did in thanks for a good meal. That's why I can't tell anyone what happened. No one would believe that Graham would be dishonest. And I can't prove it because she ate the proof. Even if I did tell them, no one is going to believe that a fly catcher plant, even a big one like mine, would actually be able to eat a man. So they think that Graham disappeared. And I'm still out here with her. She's grown so much larger now and more beautiful than ever. But 
I hope she hasn't developed a taste for a human flesh. Lately, when she stretches out her feelers, it seems that she is trying to reach me. End of No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings Recording by Aurora Seymour, Sarajevo Milton Lesser. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Bradley. The One in Many by Milton Lesser. There are some who tell me this is a foolish war we fight. My brother told me that, for one, back in the Sunset Country. But then my brother is lame and good for nothing but drawing pictures of the stars. He connects them with lines like a child's puzzle, and so makes star pictures. He has fish stars, archer stars, hunter stars. That, I would say, is what is foolish. Perhaps that is what started it all. I was looking at the stars, trying to see the pictures, when I should have been minding my sentry post. They took me like a baby, like a tot, not yet given to the wearing of clothing. The hand came out of the darkness and clamped over my mouth, and I ceased my struggling when I felt a sharp blade pricking the small of my back. At first I feared they would slay the entire camp as it slept. I cursed my brother for his star pictures, cursed our leader who had sent us here, twenty archers against the onest outpost on our country's border. But the onists had other ideas. They took me away. I had to admire their vitality, because all night we ran through the silent woodlands, and they seemed tireless. I could maintain their pace, of course, but I'm a pluralist. I could see their village from a long way off, its night's fires glowing in the dark. It was only then that we slowed our pace. Soon we entered the place, a roughly circular area within a stockade, and my captors thrust me within a hut. I couldn't do much worrying about tomorrow, not when I was so tired. I slept. I dreamed a stupid dream about the oneest beliefs, the beliefs of an unimaginative people, who could picture one maker and one maker only. I must have chuckled in my sleep. You're awake. A brilliant statement, that, because I had sat up, squinted into the bright sunlight streaming in through the doorway, yawned and stretched. The oneists, I tell you, lack imagination. The girl who spoke was pretty enough for a oneist. She smiled, showing even white teeth. Do you pluralists eat? I nodded and rubbed my belly. I was to have had dinner after my turn as sentry the night before, and now I felt like I could do justice to my portion, even at one of the orgies for which the oneists are so famous. Bring on your food and I'll show you, I told her. She turned her back to walk outside. It was early and the village seemed silent. Surely they hadn't intended this one slim maid to guard me, yet she seemed alone. I lifted her, circled her neck with my arm, and prepared to make my exit. They would laugh around our fire when I told them of this fine example of the onest lack of foresight. Except the girl yelped, not loudly, but it was loud enough, and a big muscular onest came striding in with his throwing spear. He backed me off into the corner, prodding my hungry belly with his weapon. Will you behave? I told him I would, and he backed outside but this time I could see a shadow across the doorway. The girl brought me food and partook of it with me. I was surprised, because we pluralists will not eat with a oneist out of choice. Well, I have said they are a strange people. Soon the girl stood up, patting her mouth daintily with a square piece of cloth, and in that, of course, she was trying to mime our graceful pluralist women. I suppose you think we are going to kill you, she said, just like that. To tell you the truth, I haven't given it much thought. There isn't much I can do about it. Well, we're not. We could have done that back at your camp. We could have killed you all. No, we want to show you something. I had a ridiculous thought that they made star pictures too, even those who are not lame like my brother. I said, well, what will happen after you show me? She smiled. You still think we're going to kill you? What's your name? I told her, but I thought, she can't even keep a conversation without changing the subject. Jack, she repeated after me. That's a common enough name. We have Jacks among star oneest people, you know. No, I didn't but you probably copied it. I doubt that. We are here first. Our records say so. Probably you once captured a man with that name, long ago, liked it, and took it for your people. You were here first, I sneered. Maybe that's what your records tell you, but it isn't so. Look, the makers endowed us with life. They went away to the sky. By mistake, they left one idiot maker behind, and he had nothing to do. He made you one us before he perished, and that is why you think there is only one maker. She seemed highly insulted. Idiot maker? Idiot? There was only one maker, ever. But because your minds cannot conceive of all the glory residing in one vigor, you invented a score. 
Now it was my turn to be indignant. A score? Hundreds, you mean? Thousands? More than there are leaves on the trees? Well, I won't argue with you. Our war has been arguing that point well enough. I was sorry she would ar not argue. She looked very pretty when she argued. Her breasts heaved, her eyes sparkling fire. What's your name? I asked. Nari. My name is Nari. And don't tell me you had that name first. I smiled blandly. Of course we did. I have an aunt, my mother's sister, who goes by that name. My brother's wife's cousin, also. But she is very ugly. Am I ugly, Nari wanted to know? I guess in that sense, at least all women are the same everywhere. Pluralist or oneist, it doesn't matter. I looked at her. I looked at her so hard it made her blush. Then she looked even prettier. But I didn't tell her so. You will pass, for a oneist, I admitted. I guess oneists might consider you pretty. The oneist men might stamp their feet and shout if you go by. But then, they are oneists. At that, she seemed on the verge of leaving my prison hut. But something made her change her mind. She stayed all morning and into the afternoon. We argued all the time, except at midday, when she went outside to get our lunch. She stumbled a little and fell against my shoulder. I moved toward her to hold her up. It was the most natural thing in the world to take her in my arms and kiss her. She must have thought so, too. She responded beautifully, for a oneist. After lunch, Nari did not mention the kiss. Nor did I. It now seemed the most natural thing in the world not to talk about it. We argued some more, Nara defending her primitive beliefs, and I trying to show her the light of the truth. But it was of no use. The war had been fought, and the war would continue. Later that day, we set out. That came as a surprise to me, because I had taken it for granted that whatever the Oneists wanted to show me was right here in this little village. A dozen of us went, and when we were on the trail for some little time, Nari joined us. She declared that she wanted to see it again, whatever it was. We went for three days. Although these Oneists turned out to be better woodsmen than I had thought, still they could not match the skill we pluralists have mastered over the generations. I believe I could have escaped had I wanted to, but I hardly seemed a prisoner of war, and besides, once or twice, when we had legged the rear of the column, Nari stumbled against me like the day in the hut. And what could I do but kiss her? It was another village we reached at the end of our march, much bigger than the first. Surprisingly, it looked a lot like a pluralist town, although it may only have seemed so because I had been out in the woods for three days. They took me straight ways to the village square, and it was there that I saw the statue. These statues of the makers are rare, and I was surprised to see one in a oneist village. I got on my knees at once to do it reverence. I realized it was impious to look up, but I did. I had to see if it were the genuine thing. And it was, to the last detail. Constructed of the forbidden substance known as metal, it towered three times a pluralist's height, or three times that of a oneist, for that matter. I had always wondered why the makers did not create our ancestors in their own substance, as they had fashioned us in their image, but it was an impious thought. A stern, grey-haired oneist, who said he was Nari's father, took me aside afterwards. Now, Jack, he asked me, what can you say of what you have seen? I shrugged. I can say that somehow you found one of the Maker's statues. What more? It's one, is it not? Of course it's one. They are rare, but I have seen three, all told, in pluralist villages. And each three, they were separate? You never saw a group? No. No, I didn't. He slapped his hands together triumphantly. Then that proves it. Each one is a copy of the original maker. But there was only one. Otherwise, you would have seen statues in groups. And that is why you are here, Jack. We want you to go back to your people and tell them what you saw. I shook my head. What you say isn't logical. So what if these statues are never in pairs or in groups? We've only seen a few. When once, there must have been many. Also, when your artists do their magic with dyes and create portraits, are they generally done one at a time or in groups? one at a time, so that the artist may capture the personality in each face. Naturally, I have seen group portraits, but I think they are silly things. Exactly. Now I was trying. Exactly as the makers thought, which is why the statues are always single. But it is impious to say there was more than one maker. He had all the knowledge in the world at his fingertips, and so there was no need for more than one. More than this world, even. He went to the stars, or don't you believe that? Of course I believe it. Only, they went to the stars, the thousands of makers. It isn't impious, because if you can think of one as being as great as that, try to picture thousands, yes, thousands. That makes me thousands of times more pious than you oneists. He shook his head warily. What's the use? It is for this we are fighting our war, and we thought that if we took one of you here and showed them the undeniable truth of our statue, well, will you at least return to your people with the tale of what you had seen? I agreed readily enough. Probably the alternative was death. Although pluralists on rare occasions have been known to take oneist women as their wives, a oneist prisoner of war was an unwanted thing. The reverse would also be true. 
They all bid me goodbye, except for Nari. I could not find her anywhere in the village, and a little sadly I set out on my journey back to the Sunset Land. By now our raiding party had finished its work on the small Awanist village on the rim of the country, and I could do nothing but return to my people where we might plan a new strategy against the unbelievers. I had wanted to bid Nari farewell. I met her in the woodlands, a travel bag slung over her shoulder like a male's. I wanted to say goodbye privately, she told me. Good, I said, but I knew she was lying. Else why the travel bag? Goodbye, Nari whispered, but she was not looking at me, looking instead behind her at the land of her people. Nari, I told her, I have to admit it, you are very pretty, even by pluralist standards you are. This time she did not stumble against me. It wasn't necessary. I drew her to me, and I kissed her a long kiss. Then I told her I loved her, and woman, I suppose, will always be woman, because she said she knew it. I will take Nari back to our village in the Sunset Land, where we will be married by the laws of my people, and if ever there is to be peace between the Pluralists and the Onists, it may, after all, come on these grounds. The Onists have their beliefs, and so I hate them for their impious thoughts, but the love of a man for a maid exists apart from that. It won't be easy. Our arguing continued all the way back to the Sunset Land, and Nari is as stubborn as I am firm. There is one maker, she said, and I told her, no, there are many. Or later, as we neared the Sunset Land, we picked up the thread of our thoughts again. Pluralists are oneists. We androids are dogmatic creatures. One robot created us all before we went to the stars, said Nari. Robots, I said. Many robots. But I kissed her. End of The One in Many by Milton Lesser One Man's Poison by Robert Sheckley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Pete Milan. One Man's Poison by Robert Sheckley. Hellman plucked the last radish out of the can with a pair of dividers. He held it up for Kasker to admire, then laid it carefully on the workbench, beside the razor. Hell of a meal for two grown men, Kasker said, flopping down in one of the ship's padded crash chairs. If you'd like to give up your share, Hellman started to suggest. Kasker shook his head quickly. Hellman smiled, picked up the razor, and examined its edge critically. Don't make a production out of it, Kasker said, glancing at the ship's instruments. They were approaching a red dwarf, the only planet-bearing sun in the vicinity. We want to be through with supper before we get much closer. Hellman made a practice incision in the radish squinting along the top of the razor. Kasker bent closer, his mouth open. Hellman poised the razor delicately and cut the radish cleanly in half. Will you say grace? Hellman asked. Kasker growled something and popped a half in his mouth. Hellman chewed more slowly. The sharp taste seemed to explode along his disused taste buds. Not much bulk value, Hellman said. Kasker didn't answer. He was busily studying the red dwarf. As he swallowed the last of his radish, Hellman stifled a sigh. Their last meal had been three days ago if two biscuits and a cup of water could be considered a meal. This radish, now resting in the vast emptiness of their stomachs, was the last gram of food on board ship. Two planets, Kasker said. One's burned to a crisp. Then we'll land on the other. Kasker nodded and punched a deceleration spiral into the ship's tape. Hellman found himself wondering, for the hundredth time, 
where the fault had been. Could he have made out the food requisitions wrong when they took on supplies at Kalau Station? After all, he had been devoting most of his attention to the mining equipment. Or had the ground crew just forgotten to load those last precious cases? He drew his belt into the fourth new notch he had punched. Speculation was useless. Whatever the reason, they were in a jam. Ironically enough, they had more than enough fuel to take them back to Kalau. But they would be a pair of singularly emaciated corpses by the time the ship reached there. We're coming in now, Kasker said. And to make matters worse, this unexplored region of space had few suns and fewer planets. Perhaps there was a slight possibility of replenishing their water supply, but the odds were enormous against finding anything they could eat. Look at that place, Kasker growled. Hellman shook himself out of his reverie. The planet was like a round, gray-brown porcupine, the spines of a million needle-sharp mountains glittered in the red dwarf's feeble light. And as they spiraled lower, circling the planet, the pointed mountains seemed to stretch out to meet them. It can't be all mountains, Hellman said. It's not. Sure enough, there were oceans and lakes, out of which thrust jagged island mountains but no sign of level land, no hint of civilization, or even animal life. At least it's got an oxygen atmosphere, Kasker said. Their deceleration spiral swept them around the planet, cutting lower into the atmosphere, breaking against it. And still there was nothing but mountains and lakes and oceans and more mountains. On the eighth run, Hellman caught sight of a solitary building on a mountaintop. Kasker braked recklessly, and the hull glowed red hot. On the eleventh run, they made a landing approach. Stupid place to build, Kasker muttered. The building was donut-shaped and fitted nicely over the top of the mountain. There was a wide, level lip around it, which Kasker scorched as he landed the ship. From the air, the building had merely seemed big. On the ground, it was enormous. Hellman and Kasker walked up to it slowly. Hellman had his burner ready, but there was no sign of life. This planet must be abandoned, Hellman said, almost in a whisper. Anyone in his right mind would abandon this place, Kasker said. There are enough good planets around without anyone trying to live on a needle point. They reached the door. Hellman tried to open it and found it locked. He looked back at the spectacular display of mountains. You know, he said. When this planet was still in a molten state, it must have been affected by several gigantic moons that are now broken up. The strains, external and internal, wrenched it into its present spined appearance and... Come off it, Kasker said, ungraciously. You were a librarian before you decided to get rich on uranium. Hellman shrugged his shoulders and burned a hole in the door lock. They waited. The only sound on the mountaintop was the growling of their stomachs. They entered. The tremendous wedge-shaped room was evidently a warehouse of sorts. Goods were piled to the ceiling, scattered over the floor, stacked haphazardly against the walls. There were boxes and containers of all sizes and shapes, 
some big enough to hold an elephant, others the size of thimbles. Near the door was a dusty pile of books. Immediately, Hellman bent down to examine them. Must be food somewhere in here, Kasker said, his face lighting up for the first time in a week. He started to open the nearest box. This is interesting, Hellman said, discarding all the books except one. Let's eat first, Kasker said, ripping the top off the box. Inside was a brownish dust. Kasker looked at it, sniffed, and made a face. Very interesting indeed, Hellman said, leafing through the book. Kasker opened a small can, which contained a glittering green slime. He closed it and opened another. It contained a dull orange slime. Hmm, Hellman said, still reading. Hellman, will you kindly drop that book and help me find some food? Food? Hellman repeated, looking up. What makes you think there's anything to eat here? For all you know, this could be a paint factory. It's a warehouse, Kasker shouted. He opened a kidney-shaped can and lifted out a soft purple stick. It hardened quickly and crumpled to dust as he tried to smell it. He scooped up a handful of the dust and brought it to his mouth. That might be extract of strychnine, Hellman said casually. Kasker abruptly dropped the dust and wiped his hands. After all, Hellman pointed out, granted that this is a warehouse, a cache, if you wish, we don't know what the late inhabitants considered good fare. Paris green salad, perhaps, with sulfuric acid as dressing. All right, Kasker said, but we gotta eat. What are you going to do about all this? He gestured at the hundreds of boxes, cans, and bottles. The thing to do, Hellman said briskly, is to make a qualitative analysis on four or five samples. We could start out with a simple titration, sublimate the chief ingredient, see if it forms a precipitate, work out its molecular makeup from... Hellman, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a librarian, remember? And I'm a correspondence school pilot. We don't know anything about titrations and sublimations. I know, Hellman said. But we should. It's the right way to go about it. Sure. In the meantime, though, just until a chemist drops in, what'll we do? This might help us, Hellman said, holding up the book. Do you know what it is? No, Kasker said, keeping a tight grip on his patience. It's a pocket dictionary and guide to the Helg language. Helg? The planet we're on. The symbols match up with those on the boxes. Kasker raised an eyebrow. Never heard of Helg. I don't believe the planet has ever had any contact with Earth, Hellman said. This dictionary isn't Helg English. It's Helg Alumbrigian. Kasker remembered that Alumbrigia was the home planet of a small adventurous reptilian race out near the center of the galaxy. How come you can read Alumbrigian? Kasker asked. Oh, being a librarian isn't a completely useless profession, Hellman said modestly. In my spare time, yeah. Now how about, do you know, Hellman said, the Alumbrigians probably helped the Helgans leave their planet and find another. They sell services like that, in which case this building very likely is a food cache. Suppose you start translating, Kasker suggested wearily, and maybe find us something to eat. They opened boxes until they found a likely-looking substance. Laboriously, Hellman translated the symbols on it. Got it, he said. It reads, Use Sniffners, the better abrasive. Doesn't sound edible, Kasker said. 
I'm afraid not. They found another, which read, Vigroom! Fill all your stomachs, and fill them right! What kind of animals do you suppose these Helgens were? Kasker asked. Hellman shrugged his shoulders. The next label took almost fifteen minutes to translate. It read, Argesel makes your Thudra all tizzy. Contains thirty ops of Ramstadt pulls for shell lubrication. There must be something here we can eat, Kasker said with a note of desperation. I hope so, Hellman replied. At the end of two hours, they were no closer. They had translated dozens of titles and sniffed so many substances that their olfactory senses had given up in disgust. Let's talk this over, Hellman said, sitting on a box marked Vormitash, good as it sounds. Sure, Kasker said, sprawling out on the floor. Talk. If we could deduce what kind of creatures inhabited this planet, we'd know what kind of food they ate, and whether it's likely to be edible for us. All we do know is that they wrote a lot of lousy advertising copy. Hellman ignored that. What kind of intelligent beings would evolve on a planet that is all mountains? Stupid ones, Kasker said. That was no help, but Hellman found that he couldn't draw any inferences from the mountains. It didn't tell him if the late Helgens ate silicates or proteins or iodine-based foods or anything. Now look, Hellman said, we'll have to work this out by pure logic. Are you listening to me? Sure. Kasker said. Okay. There's an old proverb that covers our situation perfectly. One man's meat is another man's poison. Yeah, Kasker said. He was positive his stomach had shrunk to approximately the size of a marble. We can assume, first, that their meat is our meat. Kasker wrenched himself away from a vision of five juicy roast beefs dancing tantalizingly before him. What if their meat is our poison? What then? Then, Hellman said, we will assume that their poison is our meat. And what happens if their meat and their poison are our poison? We starve. All right, Kasker said standing up. Which assumption do we start with? Well, there's no sense in asking for trouble. This is an oxygen planet, if that means anything. Let's assume that we can eat some basic food of theirs. If we can't, we'll start on their poisons. If we live that long, Kasker said. Hellman began to translate labels. They discarded such brands as Androgenite's Delight, and Verbell for longer, curlier, more sensitive antennae. Until they found a small gray box, about six inches by three by three. It was called Valcorin's Universal Taste Treat for all digestive capacities. This looks as good as any, Hellman said. He opened the box. Kasker leaned over and sniffed. No odor. Within the box, they found a rectangular, rubbery red block. It quivered slightly, like jelly. Bite into it, Kasker said. Me? Hellman asked. Why not you? You picked it. I prefer just looking at it, Hellman said, with dignity. I'm not too hungry. I'm not either, Kasker said. They sat on the floor and stared at the jelly-like block. After ten minutes, Hellman yawned, leaned back, and closed his eyes. 
All right, coward, Kasker said bitterly. I'll try it. Just remember, though, if I'm poisoned, you'll never get off this planet. You don't know how to pilot. Just take a little bite, then, Hellman advised. Kasker leaned over and stared at the block. Then he prodded it with his thumb. The rubbery red block giggled. Did you hear that? Kasker yelped, leaping back. I didn't hear anything, Hellman said, his hands shaking. Go ahead. Kasker prodded the block again. It giggled louder, this time with a disgusting little simper. Okay, Kasker said. What do we try next? Next? What's wrong with this? I don't eat anything that giggles, Kasker stated firmly. Now listen to me, Hellman said. The creatures who manufactured this might have been trying to create an aesthetic sound as well as a pleasant shape and color. That giggle is probably only for the amusement of the eater. Then bite into it yourself, Kasker offered. Hellman glared at him, but made no move toward the rubbery block. Finally, he said, let's move it out of the way. They pushed the block over to a corner. It lay there, giggling softly to itself. Now what? Kasker said. Hellman looked around at the jumbled stacks of incomprehensible alien goods. He noticed a door on either side of the room. Let's have a look in the other sections, he suggested. Kasker shrugged his shoulders apathetically. Slowly they trudged to the door in the left wall. It was locked, and Hellman burned it open with the ship's burner. It was a wedge-shaped room, piled with incomprehensible alien goods. The hike back across the room seemed like miles, but they made it only slightly out of wind. Hellman blew out the lock, and they looked in. It was a wedge-shaped room, piled with incomprehensible alien goods. All the same, Kasker said sadly, and closed the door. Evidently, there's a series of these rooms going completely around the building, Hellman said. I wonder if we should explore them. Kasker calculated the distance around the building, compared it with his remaining strength, and sat down heavily on a long, gray object. Why bother? he asked. Hellman tried to collect his thoughts. Certainly he should be able to find a key of some sort, a clue that would tell them what they could eat. But where was it? He examined the object Kasker was sitting on. It was about the size and shape of a large coffin, with a shallow depression on top. It was made of a hard, corrugated substance. What do you suppose this is? Hellman asked. Does it matter? Hellman glanced at the symbol painted on the side of the object, then looked them up in his dictionary. Fascinating, he murmured after a while. Is it something to eat? Kasker asked, with a faint glimmering of hope. No, you are sitting on something called the Morog Custom Super Transport for the Discriminating Helgen, who desires the best in vertical transportation. It's a vehicle. Oh, Kasker said dully. This is important. Look at it. How does it work? Kasker wearily climbed off the Morog Custom Super Transport and looked it over carefully. He traced four almost invisible separations on its four corners. Retractable wheels, probably, but I don't see... Hellman read on. It says to give it three amphus of high-gain Intigor fuel, then a van of Tonder lubrication, and not to run it over 3,000 rolls for the first 50 mungus. Let's find something to eat, Kasker said. 
Don't you see how important this is? Hellman asked. This could solve our problem. If we could deduce the alien logic inherent in constructing this vehicle, we might know the Helgen thought pattern. This, in turn, would give us an insight into their nervous systems, which would imply their biochemical makeup. Kasker stood still, trying to decide whether he had enough strength left to strangle Hellman. For example, Hellman said, what kind of vehicle would be used in a place like this? Not one with wheels, since everything is up and down. Anti-gravity? Perhaps, but what kind of anti-gravity? And why did the inhabitants devise a box-like form instead? Kasker decided, sadly, that he didn't have enough strength to strangle Hillman, no matter how pleasant it might be. Very quietly, he said, Kindly stop making like a scientist. Let's see if there isn't something we can gulp down. All right, Hellman said sulkily. Kasker watched his partner wander off among the cans, bottles, and cases. He wondered vaguely where Hellman got the energy, and decided that he was just too cerebral to know when he was starving. Here's something, Hellman called out, standing in front of a large yellow vat. What does it say? Kasker asked. Little bit hard to translate, but rendered freely it reads, Morishil's Voozy with Lacto-Ecto added for a new taste sensation. Everyone drinks Voozy. Good before and after meals, no unpleasant after effects. Good for children, the drink of the universe. That sounds good, Kasker admitted, thinking that Hellman might not be so stupid after all. This should tell us once and for all if their meat is our meat, Hellman said. This Voozy seems to be the closest thing to a universal drink I've found yet. Maybe, Kasker said hopefully, maybe it's just plain water. We'll see. Hellman pried open the lid with the edge of the burner. Within the vat was a crystal clear liquid. No odor, Kasker said, bending over the vat. The crystal liquid lifted to meet him. Kasker retreated so rapidly that he fell over a box. Hellman helped him to his feet, and they approached the vat again. As they came near, the liquid lifted itself three feet into the air and moved toward them. What have you done now? Kasker asked moving back carefully. The liquid flowed slowly over the side of the vat. It began to flow toward him. Hellman! Kasker shrieked. Hellman was standing to one side, perspiration pouring down his face, reading his dictionary with a preoccupied frown. Guess I bumbled the translation, he said. Do something! Kasker shouted. The liquid was trying to back him into a corner. Nothing I can do, Hellman said, reading on. Ah, here's the error. It doesn't say everyone drinks Voozy. Wrong subject. Voozy drinks everyone. That tells us something. The Helgens must have soaked liquid in through their pores. Naturally, they would prefer to be drunk instead of to drink. Kasker tried to dodge around the liquid, but it cut him off with a merry gurgle. Desperately, he picked up a small bale and threw it at the Voozy. The Voozy caught the bale and drank it. Then it discarded that and turned back to Kasker. Hellman tossed another box. The Voozy drank this one and a third and fourth that Kasker threw in. Then, apparently exhausted, it flowed back into its vat. Kasker clapped down the lid and sat on it, trembling violently. Not so good, Hellman said. We've been taking it for granted that the Helgens had eating habits like us. But of course it doesn't necessarily... No, it doesn't. No, sir, it certainly doesn't. I guess we can see that it doesn't. Anyone can see that it doesn't. Stop that, 
Hellman ordered sternly. We've no time for hysteria. Sorry. Kasker slowly moved away from the Voozy vat. I guess we'll have to assume that their meat is our poison, Hellman said thoughtfully. So now we'll see if their poison is our meat. Kasker didn't say anything. He was wondering what would have happened if the Voozy had drunk him. In the corner, the rubbery block was still giggling to itself. Now here's a likely-looking poison, Hellman said, half an hour later. Kasker had recovered completely, except for an occasional twitch of the lips. What does it say? he asked. Hellman rolled a tiny tube in the palm of his hand. It's called Pavastkin's Plugger. The label reads, Warning! Highly Dangerous! Pavastkin's Plugger is designed to fill holes or cracks of not more than two cubic vims. However, the plugger is not to be eaten under any circumstances. The active ingredient, Ramatol, which makes Pavaskin so excellent a plugger, renders it highly dangerous when taken internally. Sounds great, Kasker said. It'll probably blow us sky high. Do you have any other suggestions? Hellman asked. Kasker thought for a moment. The food of Helg was obviously unpalatable for humans. So perhaps was their poison... But wasn't starvation better than this sort of thing? After a moment's communion with his stomach, he decided that starvation was not better. Go ahead, he said. Hellman slipped the burner under his arm and unscrewed the top of the little bottle. He shook it. Nothing happened. It's got a seal, Kasker pointed out. Hellman punctured the seal with his fingernail and set the bottle on the floor. An evil-smelling green froth began to bubble out. Hellman looked dubiously at the froth. It was congealing into a glob and spreading over the floor. Yeast, perhaps, he said, gripping the burner tightly. Come, come. Faint heart never filled empty stomach. I'm not holding you back, Hellman said. The glob swelled to the size of a man's head. How long is that supposed to go on? Kasker asked. Well, Hellman said, it's advertised as a plugger. I suppose that's what it does. Expands to plug up holes. Sure. But how much? Unfortunately, I don't know how much two cubic vims are, but it can't go on much. Belatedly, they noticed that the plugger had filled almost a quarter of the room and was showing no signs of stopping. We should have believed the label, Kasker yelled to him across the spreading glob. It is dangerous! As the plugger produced more surface, it began to accelerate in its growth. A sticky edge touched Hellman, and he jumped back. Watch out! He couldn't reach Kasker on the other side of the gigantic sphere of blob. Hellman tried to run around, but the plugger had spread, cutting the room in half. It began to swell toward the walls. Run for it! Hellman yelled and rushed to the door behind him. He flung it open just as the expanding glob reached him. On the other side of the room, he heard a door slam shut. Hellman didn't wait any longer. He sprinted through and slammed the door behind him. He stood for a moment, panting, the burner in his hand. He hadn't realized how weak he was. That sprint had cut his reserves of energy dangerously close to the collapsing point. At least Kasker had made it too, though. But he was still in trouble. The plugger poured merrily through the blasted lock into the room. Hellman tried a practice shot on it, but
but the plugger was evidently impervious, as he realized a good plugger should be. It was showing no signs of fatigue. Hellman hurried to the far wall. The door was locked, as the others had been, so he burned out the lock and went through. How far could the glob expand? How much was two cubic vims? Two cubic miles, perhaps? For all he knew, the plugger was used to repair faults in the crusts of planets. In the next room, Hellman stopped to catch his breath. He remembered that the building was circular. He would burn his way through the remaining doors and join Kasker. They would burn their way outside and... Kasker didn't have a burner. Hellman turned white with shock. Kasker had made it into the room on the right because they had burned it open earlier. The plugger was undoubtedly oozing into that room through the shattered lock. And Kasker couldn't get out. The plugger was on his left, a locked door on his right. Rallying his remaining strength, Hellman began to run. Boxes seemed to get in his way purposefully, tripping him, slowing him down. He blasted the next door and hurried on to the next, and the next, and the next. The plugger couldn't expand completely into Kasker's room. Or could it? The wedge-shaped rooms, each a segment of a circle, seemed to stretch before him forever. A jumbled montage of locked doors, alien goods, more doors, more goods. Hellman fell over a crate, got to his feet, and fell again. He had reached the limit of his strength and passed it. But Kasker was his friend. Besides, without a pilot, he'd never get off the place. Hellman struggled through two more rooms on trembling legs, and then collapsed in front of a third. Is that you, Hellman? He heard Kasker ask, on the other side of the door. You all right? Hellman managed to gasp. Haven't much room in here, Kasker said, but the plugger stopped growing. Hellman, get me out of here. Hellman lay on the floor, panting. Moment, he said. Moment hell, Kasker shouted. Get me out. I found water. What? How? Get me out of here. Hellman tried to stand up, but his legs weren't cooperating. What happened? He asked. When I saw that glob filling the room, I figured I'd try to start up the super custom transport. Thought maybe it could knock down the door and get me out. So I pumped it full of high gain Integor fuel. Yes, Hellman said, still trying to get his legs under control. That super custom transport is an animal, Hellman. And the Integor fuel is water. Now get me out! Hellman lay back with a contented sigh. If he had had a little more time, he would have worked out the whole thing himself by pure logic. But it was all very apparent now. The most efficient machine to go over those vertical, razor-sharp mountains would be an animal, probably with retractable suckers. It was kept in hibernation between trips. And if it drank water, the other products designed for it would be palatable too. Of course, they still didn't know much about the late inhabitants, but undoubtedly... Burn down that door! Kasker shrieked, his voice breaking. Hellman was pondering the irony of it all. If one man's meat, and his poison, are your poison... Then try eating something else. So simple, really. But there was one thing that still bothered him. How did you know it was an Earth-type animal? He asked. It's breath, stupid! It inhales and exhales and smells as if it's eaten onions! There was a sound of cans falling and bottles shattering. Now hurry! What's wrong? finally getting to his feet and poising the burner. The custom super transport, it's got me cornered behind a pile of cases. Hellman, it seems to think that I'm its meat. Broiled with the burner, well done for Hellman, medium rare for Kasker. 
it was their meat, with enough left over for the trip back to Kalau. End of One Man's Poison by Robert Sheckley The Power and the Glory by Charles W. Diffin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Harry Chesley The Power and the Glory by Charles W. Diffin There were papers on the desk, a litter of papers scrawled over, in the careless writing of indifferent students, with the symbols of chemistry and long mathematical computations. The man at the desk pushed them aside to rest his lean-lined face on one thin hand. The other arm, ending at the wrist, was on the desk before him. Students of a great university had long since ceased to speculate about the missing hand, the result of an experiment they knew, a hand that was a mass of lifeless cells amputated quickly that the living arm might be saved. But that was some years ago, ancient history to those who came and went through Professor Edinger's classroom. And now Professor Edinger was weary. Weary and old, he told himself, as he closed his eyes to shut out the sight of the interminable papers and the stubby wrist that had ended forever his experiments and the delicate manipulations which only he could do. He reached slowly for a buzzing phone, but his eyes brightened at the voice that came to him. I've got it, I've got it. The words were almost incoherent. This is Avery, Professor Avery. You must come at once. You will share in it. I owe it all to you. You will be the first to see. I'm sending a taxi for you. Professor Edinger's tired eyes crinkled to a smile. Enthusiasm like this was rare among his youngsters, but Avery, with the face of a poet, a dreamer's eyes, and the mind of a scientist. Good boy, Avery. A long time since he had seen him. Had him in his laboratory for two years. What's this all about, he asked. No, no, said the voice. I can't tell you. It's too big. Greater than the induction motor. Greater than the electric light. It's the greatest thing in the world. The taxi should be there now. You must come. A knock at the office door, where a voice said, Car for Professor Edinger confirmed the excited words. I'll come, said the professor, right away. He pondered, as the car whirled him across the city, on what this greatest thing in the world might be, and he hoped, with gentle skepticism, that the enthusiasm was warranted. A young man opened the car door as they stopped. His face was flushed, Edinger noted, his hair pushed back in disarray, his shirt torn open at the throat. Wait here, he told the driver, and took the professor by the arm to hurry him into a dilapidated building. Not much of a laboratory, he said, but we'll have better, you and I, we'll have better. The room seemed bare with its meager equipment, but it was neat, as became the best student of Professor Edinger. Rows of reagent bottles stood on the shelves, but the tables were littered with misplaced instruments and broken glassware, where trembling hands had fumbled in heedless excitement. Glad to see you again, Avery. The gentle voice of Professor Edinger had lost its tired tone. It's been two years you've been working, I judge. Now what is this greatest discovery, boy? What have you found? The younger man, in whose face the color came and went, and whose eyes were shining from dark hollows that marked long days and sleepless nights, still clung to the other's arm. It's real, he said. It's great. It means fortune and fame. And you're in on that, Professor. The old master, he said, and clamped a hand affectionately upon a thin shoulder. I owe it all to you. And now I have, I have learned. No, you shall see it for yourself. Wait. He crossed quickly to a table. On it was an apparatus. The eyes of the old man widened as he saw it. It was intricate, a maze of tubing. There was a glass bulb above, the generator of a cathode ray, obviously. The electromagnets below and on each side. Beneath was a crude sphere of heavy lead, a retort it might be. And from this, there passed two massive insulated cables. The understanding eyes of the professor followed them, one to a terminal on a great insulating block upon the floor, the other to a similarly protected terminal of carbon some feet above it in the air. 
The trembling fingers of the young man made some few adjustments. Then he left the instrument to take his place by an electric switch. Stand back, he warned, and closed the switch. There was a gentle hissing from within the glass tubes, the faint glow of a blue-green light, and that was all until, with a crash like the ripping crackle of lightning, a white flame arced between the terminals of the heavy cables. It hissed ceaselessly through the air where now the tang of ozone was apparent. The carbon blocks glowed with a brilliant incandescence when the flame ceased with the motion of a hand where Avery pulled a switch. The man's voice was quiet now. You do not know, yet, what you have seen. But there was a tremendous potential there, an amperage I can't measure with my limited facilities. He waved a deprecating hand about the ill-furnished laboratory. But you have seen. His voice trembled and failed at forming the words. The disintegration of the atom, said Professor Edinger quietly, and the release of power unlimited. Did you use thorium? he inquired. The other looked at him in amazement. Then... I should have known you would understand, he said humbly. And you know what it means, again his voice rose, power without end to do the work of the world, great vessels driven a lifetime on a mere ounce of matter, a revolution in transportation, in living, he paused, the liberation of mankind, he added, and his voice was reverent. This will do the work of the world, it will make a new heaven and a new earth, and I have dreamed dreams, he exclaimed, I have seen visions and it has been given to me, me, to liberate man from the curse of Adam, the sweat of his brow. I can't realize it even yet. I, I am not worthy. He raised his eyes slowly in the silence to gaze in wondering astonishment at the older man. There was no answering light, no exultation on the lined face, only sadness in the tired eyes that looked at him, and through him, as if focused on something in a dim future or past. Don't you see? asked the wondering man. The freedom of men, the liberation of a race. No more poverty, no endless grinding labor. His young eyes, too, were looking into the future, a future of blinding light. Culture, he said, instead of heartbreaking toil, a chance to grow mentally, spiritually. It's another world, a new life. And again he asked, surely you see? I see, said the other. I see, plainly. The new world, said Avery. It dazzles me. It rings like music in my ears. I see no new world, was the slow response. The young face was plainly perplexed. Don't you believe, he stammered, after you have seen? I thought you would have the vision, would help me emancipate the world, save it. His voice failed. Men have a way of crucifying their saviors, said the tired voice. The inventor was suddenly indignant. You are blind, he said harshly. It's too big for you. And I would have had you stand beside me in the great work. I shall announce it alone. There will be laboratories, enormous, and factories. My invention will be perfected, simplified, compressed. A generator will be made. Thousands of horsepower to do the work of a city. Free thousands of men. Made so small you can hold it in one hand. The sensitive face was proudly alight. Proud and a trifle arrogant. The exaltation of his coming power was strong upon him. Yes, said Professor Edinger, in one hand, and he raised his right arm that he might see where the end of a sleeve was empty. I am sorry, said the inventor abruptly. I didn't mean... You will excuse me now. There's so much to be done. But the thin figure of Professor Edinger had crossed to the far table to examine the apparatus there. Crude, he said beneath his breath. Crude, but efficient. In the silence, a rat had appeared in the distant corner. The professor nodded as he saw it. The animal stopped as the man's eyes came upon it, then sat squirrel-like on one of the shelves as it ate a crumb of food. Some morsel from a hurried lunch of Avery's, the professor reflected. Poor Avery. Yes, there was much to be done. He spoke as much to himself as to the man who was now beside him. It enters here, he said, and peered down toward the lead bulb. He placed a finger on the side of the metal. About here, I should think. Have you a drill and a bit of quartz? The inventor's eyes were puzzled, but the assurance of his old instructor claimed obedience. He produced a small drill and a fragment like broken glass. 
and he started visibly as the one hand worked awkwardly to make a small hole in the side of the lead. But he withdrew his own restraining hand, and he watched in mystified silence while the quartz was fitted to make a tiny window, and the thin figure stooped to sight as if aiming the opening toward a far corner where a brown rat sat upright in earnest munching on a dry crust. The professor drew Avery with him as he retreated noiselessly from the instrument. Will you close the switch? he whispered. The young man hesitated, bewildered, at this unexpected demonstration, and the professor himself reached with one hand for the black lever. Again the arc crashed into life, to hold for a brief instant until Professor Edinger opened the switch. Well, demanded Avery, what's all the show? Do you think you are teaching me anything about my own instrument? There was a hurt pride and jealous resentment in his voice. See, said Professor Edinger quietly, and his one thin hand pointed to the far shelf, where in the shadow was a huddle of brown fur and a bit of crust. It fell as they watched, and the plop of the soft body upon the floor sounded loud in the silent room. The law of compensation, said Professor Edinger, two sides of the middle, darkness and light, good and evil, life and death. The young man was stammering. What do you mean? A death ray evolved? And what of it? he demanded. What of it? What's that got to do with it? A death ray, the other agreed. You have dreamed, Avery. One must in order to create, but it is only a dream. You dreamed of life, a fuller life, for the world. But you have given them, as you have just seen, death. The face of Avery was white as wax. His eyes glared savagely from dark hollows. A rat, he protested. You've killed a rat, and you say, you say... He raised one trembling hand to his lips to hold them from forming the unspeakable words. A rat, said the professor, or a man, or a million men. We will control it. All men will have it, the best and the worst. There is no defense. It will free the world. It will destroy it. No, and the white-faced man was shouting now. You don't understand. You can't see. The lean figure of the scientist straightened to its full height. His eyes met those of the younger man, silent now before him. But Avery knew the eyes never saw him. They were looking far off, following the wings of thought. In the stillness, the man's words came harsh and commanding. Do you see the cities, he said, crumbling to ruins under the cold stars, the fields? They are rank with wild growth, torn and gullied by the waters, a desolate land where animals prowl. And the people, the people, wandering bands, lower as the years drag on than the beasts themselves, the children dying forgotten in the forgotten lands, the people to whom the progress of our civilization is one with the ages past, for whom there is again the slow, toiling road toward the light. And somewhere, perhaps, a conquering race, the most brutal and callous of mankind, rioting in their sense of power and dragging themselves down to oblivion. His gaze came slowly back to the room, and the figure of the man still fighting for his dream. They would not, said Avery hoarsely. They'd use it for good. Would they? asked Professor Edinger. He spoke simply as one stating simple facts. I love my fellow men, he said, and I killed them in thousands in the last war. I and my science and my poison gas. The figure of Avery slumped suddenly upon a chair. His face was buried in his hands and I would have been, he groaned, the greatest man in the world. You shall be greater, said the professor, though only we shall know it, you and I. You will save the world from itself. The figure, bowed and sunken in the chair, made no move. The man was heedless to the kindly hand upon his shoulder. His voice, when he spoke, was that of one afar off, speaking out of a great loneliness. You don't understand, he said dully. You can't. But Professor Edinger, a cog in the wheels of a great educational machine, glanced at the watch on his wrist. Again, his thin shoulders were stooped, his voice tired. My classes, he said. I must be going. In the gathering dusk, Professor Edinger unlocked carefully the door of his office. He crossed beyond his desk and fumbled with one hand for his keys. There was a cabinet to be opened, and he stared long in the dim light at the object he withdrew. 
He looked approvingly at the exquisite workmanship of an instrument or a generator of the cathode ray and an intricate maze of tubing surmounted electromagnets and a round lead bulb. There were terminals for attaching heavy cables. It was a beautiful thing. His useless arm moved to bring an imaginary hand before the window of quartz in the lead sphere. Power, he whispered, and repeated Avery's words. Power to build a city or destroy a civilization. And I hold it in one hand. He replaced the apparatus in the safety of its case. The saviors of mankind, he said, and his tone was harsh and bitter. But a smile, whimsical, kindly, crinkled his tired eyes as he turned to his desk and its usual litter of examination papers. It is something, Avery, he whispered to that distant man, to belong to so distinguished a group. End of The Power and the Glory by Charles W. Diffin System by Alan Howard. This is a people's recording. All people's recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It's a small solar system by Alan Howard. Know him? Well, you might say I practically grew up with him. He was my hero in those days. I thought she was the greater man ever lived. In my eyes, he was greater than Babe Ruth, Lindy, or the President. Of course, time and my growing up caused me to bring him into the perspective that I felt to be more concerned with his true position in his field of endeavor. When he died, his friends mourned for fond remembrance of his past, but privately, Many of them felt that he had outlived his best days. Now, with his glorious vindication, I wonder how many of them are still alive to feel the twinge of conscience. Oh, we're delighted, of course, but it seems incredible even today to us elated oldsters. Although we were always his staunchest admirers, in retrospect we can see now that no one believed more than we but he did it strictly for the dollar. It is likely there was always a small core of starry-eyed adolescents who found the whole improbable saga entirely believable, or at least half believed it might be partly true. The attitude of the rest of us ranged from a patronizing disparagement that we thought was expected of us through grudging admiration to out and out enthusiasm. Certainly, if anybody had taken the trouble to consider it, and why should they have? The landing of the first manned ship on our satellite seemed to render him as obsolete as a horde of other lesser and even greater lights. At any rate, it was inevitable that the conquest of the moon would be merely a stepping stone to more distant points. Oh, no, I had nothing to do with the selection of the red planet. Coming in as head of Project P4 in its latter stages, as I did when Dr. Fredo is styled, the selection had already been made. Yes, it's quite likely I may have been plugging for Mars below the country's level. A combination of chance, expediency, and popular demand made Mars the next target, rather than Venus, which was, in some ways, the more logical goal. I would have given anything to have gone, but the metaphorical start heart that one reporter once credited me with is not the same as an old man's actual fatty heart. And there were heartbreak years ahead before the Goddard was finally ready. During this time, he slipped further into obscurity while big, important things were happening all around us. You're right, but one really big creation of this is bigger than ever. It has passed into the language and meant employment for thousands of people. Too few of them have even heard of him. Of course, he was still known and welcomed by a small circle of acquaintances, but to the world at large he was truly a forgotten man. It is worthy of note that one of the oldest of his acquaintances was present at blast of time. 
he happened to be the grandfather of a certain competent young crewman. The old man was a proud figure during the brief ceremonies, and his eyes filled with tears as the mighty rocket climbed straight up on his fiery tail. He remained there gazing up at the sky long after it had vanished. He was heard to murmur, I'm glad the kid could go, but it is just a lark to him. He never had a sense of wonder. How could he? Nobody reads any more. Afterward, his senile emotions betraying him, he broke down completely and had to be led from the field. It is rumored he did not live long after that. The Goddard drove on until Mars filled the V-screen. It was planned to make at least a half dozen breaking passes round the planet for observational purposes before the actual business of bringing the ship in for landfall began. As expected, the atmosphere proved to be thin. The speculated Dead Sea areas, oddly enough, turned out to be just that. To the surprise of some, it was soon evident that Mars possessed, or had possessed, a high civilization. The Canary of Chaparelli were indeed broad waterways stretching from pole to pole, too regular to be anything but the work of intelligence. But most wonderful of all was the scattered, but fairly numerous large walled cities that dotted the world. Everybody was excited, eager to land and start exercising their specialities. One of the largest of these cities was selected, more or less at random. It was decided to set down just outside, yet far enough from the walls to avoid any possibility of damage from the landing jets in the event the city was inhabited. Even if deserted, the entire scientific personnel would have raised a howl that would have been heard back on Earth if just a section of wall was scorched. When planet fall was completed, and observers had time to scan the surroundings, it was seen that the city was very much alive. What keeps them up? marveled Komchensky, the aeronautics and rocketry authority. The sky swarmed with ships of strange design. The walls were crowded with inhabitants, too far away for detailed observation. Even as they looked, an enormous gate opened, and a procession of mounted figures emerged. In the event the place were deserted, the captain would have had the honor of being the first to touch Martian soil. While atmospheric and other checks were being run, he gave orders for the previously decided alternative. Captain, semanticist, and anthropologist would make the first contact. With all checks agreeing that it was safe to open rocks, soon the three representatives of Earth were walking shoulder to shoulder down the ramp. It was apparent that the two scientists purposely missed stride inches from the end, so that it was the captain's foot that actually touched ground first. The cavalcade, though these beasties were certainly not horses, was now near enough to the ship for details to be seen. Surprise and wonderment filled the crew, for while the multi-legged steeds were as alien as anyone might expect to find on an alien world, the riders were very definitely humanoid. Briefly, brightly, and barbarically trapped as they were by earthly standards, they seemed to be little distinguishable from homegrown homo saps. The approaching company appeared to be armed mainly with swords and lances, but also in evidence were some tubular affairs that could very well be some sort of projectile discharging device. The captain suddenly felt unaccountably warm. It was a heavy responsibility. He hoped these Martians wouldn't be the type of madmen who believed in the shoot first, inquire later theory. Even as he stood there, outwardly calm but tittering internally, the Martian riders pulled up ten feet from the Earthmen. Their leader, tall, dark haired, and slightly lighter in hue than his companions, dismounted and approached the captain. With outstretched hand, he took the captain's in a firm grip. Let it be recorded here, to the shame of a nerf where reading for pleasure is virtually lost pastime, that not one man of the Goddard realized 
the significance of what followed. "'How do you do?' he said in perfect English, with an unmistakable trace of southern accent. "'I'm going to Barsroom. My name is John Carter.' End of It's a Small Solar System by Alan Howard Read by Britannia Texas by William F. Nolan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Spiral of Hope. Of Time and Texas by William F. Nolan. In one fell swoop, declared Professor C. Sidwick Holmes, releasing a thin blue ribbon of pipe smoke and rocking back on his heels. I intend to solve the greatest problem facing mankind today. Colonizing the polar wastes was a messy and fruitless business, and the enforced birth control program couldn't be enforced. Overpopulation still remains the thorn in our side. Gentlemen, he paused to look each of the assembled reporters in the eye, there is but one answer. Mass annihilation, quavered a cub reporter. Posh, boy. Certainly not, the professor bristled. The answer is time. Time? Exactly, nodded Ohms. With a dramatic flourish, he swept aside a red velvet drape to reveal a tall structure of gleaming metal. As witness! Golly, what is that thing? queried the cub. This thing, replied the professor acidly, is the C. Sidwick Ohms time door. Willikers, a time machine! Not so, not so, please, boy! A time machine, in the popular sense, is impossible. Wild fancy! However, the professor tapped the dottle from his pipe, by a mathematically precise series of infinite calculations, I have developed the remarkable C. Sidwick Ohm's time door. Open it, take but a single step, and presto! The past! But where in the past, Prof? Ohms smiled easily down at the tense ring of faces. Gentlemen, beyond this door lies the sprawling giant of the southwest. Enough land to absorb Earth's overflow like that, he snapped his fingers. I speak, gentlemen, of Texas, 1957. What if the Texans object? They have no choice. The time door is strictly a one-way passage. I saw to that. It will be utterly impossible for anyone in 1957 to re-enter our world of 2057. And now, the past awaits. He tossed aside his professorial robes. Under them, Sidwick Ohms wore an ancient and bizarre costume. Black riding boots, highly polished and trimmed in silver. Wool chaps, a wide, jewel-studded belt with an immense buckle, a brightly checkered shirt topped by a blazing red bandana. Briskly, he snapped a tall, ten-gallon hat on his head and stepped to the time door. Gripping an ebony handle, he tugged upward. The huge metal door oiled slowly back. Time, said Sidwick Ohms simply, gesturing toward the gray nothingness beyond the door. The reporters and photographers surged forward, notebooks and cameras at the ready. What if the door swings shut after you're gone? One of them asked. A groundless fear, boy, assured Ohms. I have seen to it that the time door can never be closed. And now, goodbye, gentlemen, or, to use the proper colloquialism, so long, hombres. Ohms bowed from the waist, gave his ten-gallon hat a final tug, and took a single step forward, and did not disappear. He stood, blinking, then he swore, beat upon the unyielding wall of grayness with clenched fists, and fell back, panting, to his desk. I've failed, he moaned in a lost voice. The C. Sidwick Ohm's time door is a botch. He buried his head in trembling hands. The reporters and photographers began to file out. Suddenly, the professor raised his head. Listen, he warned. A slow rumbling, muted with distance, emanated from the dense grayness of the time door. Faint yips and whoopings were distant above the rumble. The sounds grew steadily to a thousand beating drums, to a rolling sea of thunder. Shrieking, the reporters and photographers scattered for the stairs. Ah, another knotty problem to be solved, mused Professor Sidwick Holmes, swinging 
with some difficulty onto one of 3,000 Texas steers stampeding into the laboratory. End of Of Time and Texas by William F. Nolan Recording by Spiral of Hope SpiralofHope.com Two Timer by Frederick Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Costello. Two Timer by Frederick Brown. Experiment. The first time machine, gentlemen, Professor Johnson proudly informed his two colleagues. True, it is a small scale experimental model. It will operate only on objects weighing less than three pounds, five ounces, and for distances into the past and future of 12 minutes or less. But it works. The small scale model looked like a small scale, a postage scale except for two dials in the part under the platform. Professor Johnson held up a small metal cube. Our experimental object, he said, is a brass cube weighing one pound, 2.3 ounces. First, I shall send it five minutes into the future. He leaned forward and set one of the dials in the time machine. Look at your watches, he said. They looked at their watches. Professor Johnson placed the cube gently on the machine's platform. It vanished. Five minutes later, to the second, it reappeared. Professor Johnson picked it up. Now five minutes into the past, he said. He set the other dial. Holding the cube in his hand, he looked at his watch. It is six minutes before three o'clock. I shall now activate the mechanism by placing the cube on the platform at exactly three o'clock. Therefore, the cube should at five minutes before three vanish from my hand and appear on the platform five minutes before I place it there. How can you place it there then? Asked one of his colleagues. It will, as my hand approaches, vanish from the platform and appear in my hand to be placed there, three o'clock. Notice, please. The cube vanished from his hand. It appeared on the platform of the time machine. See? Five minutes before I shall place it there, it is there. His other colleague frowned at the cube. But, he said, what if, now that it has already appeared five minutes before you place it there, you should change your mind about doing so and not place it there at three o'clock? Wouldn't there be a paradox of some sort involved? An interesting idea, Professor Johnson said. I had not thought of it, and it will be interesting to try. Very well, I shall not. There was no paradox at all. The cube remained. But the entire rest of the universe, professors and all, vanished. Sentry. He was wet and muddy and hungry and cold, and he was 50,000 light years from home. A strange blue sun gave light and the gravity twice what he was used to made every movement difficult. But in tens of thousands of years, this part of war hadn't changed. The flyboys were fine with their sleek spaceships and their fancy weapons. When the chips are down, though, it was still a foot soldier, the infantry, that had to take the ground and hold it, foot by bloody foot. Like this damned planet of a star he'd never heard of until they'd landed him there. And now it was sacred ground because the aliens were there too. The aliens, the only other intelligent race in the galaxy, cruel, hideous, and repulsive monsters. Contact had been made with them near the center of the galaxy after the slow, difficult colonization of a dozen thousand planets. And it had been war at sight. They'd shot 
without even trying to negotiate or to make peace. Now, planet by bitter planet, it was being fought out. He was wet and muddy and hungry and cold, and the day was raw with a high wind that hurt his eyes. But the aliens were trying to infiltrate and every sentry post was vital. He stayed alert, gun ready. 50,000 light years from home, fighting on a strange world and wondering if he'd ever live to see home again. And then he saw one of them crawling toward him. He drew a bead and fired. The alien made that strange, horrible sound they all make, then lay still. He shuddered at the sound and sight of the alien laying there. One ought to be able to get used to them after a while, but he'd never been able to. Such repulsive creatures they were, with only two arms and two legs, ghastly white skins and no scales. End of Two Timer by Frederick Brown By Robert Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To learn more or volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Aggravation of Elmer by Robert Arthur. The world would beat a path to Elmer's door, but he had to go carry the door along with him. It was the darndest traffic jam I'd ever seen in White Plains. For two blocks ahead of me, Main Street was gutter to gutter with stalled cars, trucks, and buses. If I hadn't been in such a hurry to get back to the shop, I might have paid more attention. I might have noticed nobody was leaning on his horn, or that at least a quarter of the drivers were leaning out from under their hoods. But at the time, it didn't register. I gave the tie-up a passing glance and was turning up the side street toward Bill Tom Electronics. Bill Tom? Get it? When I saw Marge threading her way to the curb. She was leading a small blonde girl of about eight, and clutched a child-sized hat box in her hand. Marge was hot and exasperated, but Small Fry was as cool and composed as a vanilla cone. I waited. Even flushed and disheveled, Marge is a treat to look at. She is tall and slender, with brown eyes that match her hair, a smile that first crinkles around her eyes and sneaks down and becomes a full-fledged grin. But I'm getting off subject. Honestly, Bill, Marge said as she saw me. The traffic nowadays. We've been tied up for 15 minutes. I finally decided to get off the bus and walk, even though it's about a hundred in the shade. Come along to the shop, I suggested. The reception room is air-conditioned, and you can watch the world's first baseball game telecast in color. The Giants versus the Dodgers. Carl Erskine pitching. Marge brightened. That'll be more fun than shopping, won't it, Doreen? She asked, looking down at the kid. Bill, this is Doreen. She lives across the street from me. Her mother's at the dentist, and I said I'd look after her for the day. Hello, Doreen, I said. Uh, what have you in the hat box? Doll clothes? Doreen gave me a look of faint disgust. No, she piped in a high treble. An unhappy genie. An unhappy... I did a double take. Oh, an unhappy genie? Maybe he's unhappy because you won't let him out. <laughs> Even to myself, I sounded idiotic. Doreen looked at me pityingly. It's not a he, it's a thing. Elmer made it. I knew when I was losing, so I quit. I hurried Marge and Doreen along toward our little two-story building. Once we got into the air-conditioned reception room, Marge sank down gratefully onto the settee, and I switched on the television set with the big 24-inch tube Tom had built. Bill Tom Electronics makes TV components, computer parts, things like that. Tom Kennedy is the brains. Me, Bill Rollins, I do the legwork and tend to the business details. It's uncanny the way all those cars suddenly stopped when our bus broke down, Marge said as we waited for the picture to come on. Any day now, this civilization of ours will get so complicated, a bus breaking down someplace will bring the whole thing to a halt. Then where will we be? Elmer says civilization is doomed, Doreen put in happily. The way she rolled the word out made me stare at her. Marge only nodded. That's what Elmer says, all right, she agreed, a trifle grim. Why does Elmer say civilization is doomed? I asked Doreen. Because it's getting hotter, the kid gave it to me straight. All the ice at the North Pole is going to melt. 
The ocean is going to rise 200 feet. Then everybody who doesn't live on a hill is going to be drowned. That's what Elmer says, and Elmer isn't ever wrong. Doreen, they called her. Why not Cassandra? The stuff kids spout these days. I gave her a foolish grin. I wanted Marge to get the idea I was really a family man at heart. That's very interesting, Doreen. Now look, there's the baseball game. Let's watch, shall we? We weren't very late after all. It was the top half of the second inning, the score one to one. Erskine in trouble with two men on and only one down. The colors were beautiful. Marge and I were just settling back to watch when Doreen wrinkled her nose. I saw that game yesterday, she announced. You couldn't have, sweetheart, I told her. Because it's only being played today. The world's first ball game ever broadcast in color. There was a game on Elmer's TV, Doreen insisted. The picture was bigger and the colors prettier too. Absolutely impossible. I was a little sore. I hate kids who tell fibs. There never was a game broadcast in color before. And anyway, you won't find a color tube this big any place outside of a laboratory. But it's true, Bill. Marge looked at me, wide-eyed. Elmer only has a little seven-inch black and white set his uncle gave him. But he's rigged up some kind of lens in front of it. And it projects a big color picture on a white screen. I saw that she was serious. My eyes bugged slightly. Listen, I said. Who is this Elmer character? I want to meet him. He's my cousin from South America, Doreen answered. He thinks grown-ups are stupid. She turned to Marge. I have to go to the bathroom, she said primly. Through that door, Marge pointed. Doreen trotted out, clutching her hat box. Elmer thinks grown-ups are stupid, I howled. Listen, how old is this character who says sillization is doomed and can convert a black and white broadcast into color? He's thirteen, Marge told me. I goggled at her. Thirteen, she repeated. His father is some South American scientist. His mother died ten years ago. I sat down beside her. I lit a cigarette. My hands were shaking. Tell me about him. All about him. Why, I don't know very much, Marge said. Last year, Elmer was sick. Some tropic disease. His father sent him up here to recuperate. Now, Alice, that's his aunt, Doreen's mother, is at her wit's end. He makes her so nervous. I lit another cigarette before I realized I already had one. And he invents things? A boy genius? Young Tom Edison and all that? Marge frowned. I suppose you could say that, she conceded. He has the garage full of stuff he's made or bought with the allowance his father sends him, and if you come within ten feet of it without permission, you get an electric shock right out of thin air. But that's the only part of it. It... She gave a helpless gesture. It's Elmer's effect on everybody. Everybody over fifteen, that is. He sits there, a little dark, squinched-up kid, wearing thick glasses and talking about how climatic changes inside fifty years will flood half the world, cause the collapse of civilization. Wait a minute, I cut in. Scientists seem to think that's possible in a few thousand years, not fifty. Elmer says fifty, Marge stated flatly. From the way he talks, I suspect he's figured out a way to speed things up and is going to try it someday just to see if it works. Meanwhile, he fools around out there in the garage, sneering about the billions of dollars spent to develop color TV. He says his lens will turn any ordinary broadcast into color for about $25. He says it's typical of the muddled thinking of our so-called scientists, uh, I'm quoting now, to do everything backward and overlook fundamental principles. Brother, I said. Doreen came trotting back in then with her hat box. I'm tired of that game, she said, giving the TV set a bored glance. And as she said it, the tube went dark. The sound cut off. Damn, I swore. Must be a power failure. I grabbed the phone and jiggled the hook. No dice. The phone was dead too. You're funny, Doreen giggled. It's just the unhappy genie, see? She flicked over the catch on the hat box, and the picture came back on. The sound started up. Swings and misses for strike two. The air conditioner began to hum. Marge and I stared. Mouths open. Wide. You did that, Doreen? I asked it very carefully. You made the television stop and start again? The unhappy genie did, Doreen told me. Like this. She flicked the catch back. The TV picture blacked out. The sound stopped in the middle of a word. The air conditioner whispered in a silence. Then she flipped the catch the other way. Fouls a second ball into the screen, the announcer said. Picture okay? Air conditioner operating? Everything normal except my pulse and respiration. Doreen, sweetheart, I took a step toward her. What's in that box? What is an unhappy genie? Not unhappy. You know how scornful an eight-year-old can be? 
Well, she was. Unhappen. It makes things unhappen. Anything that works by electricity, it stops. Elmer calls it his unhappen genie, just for fun. Oh, now I get it, I said brightly. It makes electricity not work. Unhappen. Like television sets and air conditioners and automobiles and bus engines. Doreen giggled. Marge sat bolt upright. Doreen, you caused that traffic jam? You and that... that gadget of Elmer's? Doreen nodded. It made all the automobile engines stop, just like Elmer said. Elmer's never wrong. Marge looked at me. I looked at Marge. A field of some kind, I said. A field that prevents an electric current from flowing, meaning no combustion motor using electric spark can operate. No electric motors, no telephones, no radio or TV. Is that important? Marge asked. Important? I yelled. Think of the possibilities just as a weapon. You could blank out a whole nation's transportation, its communications, its industry. I got a hold of myself. I smiled my best I love children smile. Doreen, I said. Let me look at Elmer's unhappen genie. The kid clutched the box. Elmer told me not to let anybody look at it. He said he'd statuefy me if I did. He said nobody would understand it anyway. He said he might show it to Mr. Einstein, but not anybody else. That's Elmer, all right, Marge muttered. I found myself breathing hard. I edged toward Doreen and put my hand on the hat box. Just one quick look, Doreen, I said. No one will ever know. She didn't answer, just pulled the box away. I pulled it back. She pulled. I pulled. Bill, Marge called warningly. Too late. The lid of the hat box came off in my hands. There was a bright flash, the smell of insulation burning, and the unhappen genie fell out and scattered all over the floor. Doreen looked smug. Now Elmer will be angry at you. Maybe he'll disintegrate you, or parallelize you and statuefy you. Forever. He might at that, Bill, Marge shuddered. I wouldn't put anything past him. I wasn't listening. I was scrambling after the mess of tubes, condensers, and power packs scattered over the rug. Some of them were still wired together, but most of them had broken loose. Elmer was certainly one heck of a sloppy workman. I hadn't even soldered the connections, just twisted the wires together. I looked at the stuff in my hands. It made as much sense as a radio run over by a truck. We'll take it back to Elmer, I told Doreen, speaking very carefully. I'll give him lots of money to build another. He can come down here and use our shop. We have lots of nice equipment he'd like. Doreen tossed her head. I don't think he'll wanna. He'll be mad at you. Anyway, Elmer's busy working on aggravation now. <laughs> That's for sure, Marge said in heartfelt tones. Aggravation, huh? I grinned like an idiot. Well, well. I'll bet he's good at it, but let's go see him right away. Bill, Marge signaled me to one side. Maybe you'd better not try to see Elmer, she whispered. I mean, if he can build a thing like this in his garage, maybe he can build a disintegrator or a paralysis ray or something. There's no use taking chances. You read too many comics, I laughed it off. He's only a kid, isn't he? What do you think he is, a Superman? Yes, Marge said flatly. <laughs> Look, Marge, I said in a feverish excitement. I've got to talk to Elmer. I've got to get the rights to that TV color lens and this electricity interrupter and anything else he may have developed. Marge kept trying to protest, but I simply grabbed her and Doreen and hustled them out to my car. Doreen lived in a wooded hilly section a little north of White Plains. I made it in ten minutes. Marge had said Elmer worked in the garage. I kept going up the driveway, swung sharp around the big house, and slammed on the brakes. Marge screamed. We skidded to a stop with our front end hanging over what looked like a bomb crater in the middle of the driveway. I swallowed my heart down again while I backed away fast. We had almost plunged into a hole 40 feet across and 20 feet deep in the middle. The hole was perfectly round, like a half section of a grapefruit. What's this? I asked. Where's the garage? That's where the garage should be. Marge looked dazed. But it's gone. I took another look at that hole scooped out with geometrical precision and turned to Doreen. What did you say Elmer was working on? Ag- She sobbed. Ag- Aggravation. She began to bawl in earnest. Now he's gone. He's mad. He won't ever come back, I bet you. That's a fact, I muttered. He may not have been mad, but he certainly was aggravated. Marge, listen, this is a mystery. We've just gotta let it stay a mystery. We don't know anything, understand? The cops will finally decide Elmer blew himself up and we'll leave it at that. One thing I'm pretty sure about, he's not coming back. So that's how it was. Tom Kennedy keeps trying and trying to put Elmer's unhappen genie back together again. And every time he fails, he takes it out on me because I didn't get to Elmer sooner. 
but you can see perfectly well he's way off base. Trying to make out I could have done a thing to prevent what happened. Isn't my fault that the dumb kid didn't know enough to take the proper precautions when he decided to develop anti-gravitation? Got shot off garage and all someplace in outer space? What do they teach kids nowadays anyway? End recording of The Aggravation of Elmer by Robert Arthur. Read by Justin Daniels for LibriVox.org. Thank you. This recording is in the public domain.